think we're going to ask everyone to take their seats and get uh, started. We've got a we've got a very full program for the day, so we're going to we're going to try to be timely. <laughs> Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to the second LAS Faculty Research Symposium, Migration in a World of Walls and Borders. I'm Lisa Freeman, the Interim Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I want to thank all of you for joining us here in Chicago on this spectacularly beautiful spring day. Uh, I, th I think we're headed back to winter next week, so we have to enjoy it. As many of you know, one of my goals as interim dean has been to recognize and celebrate the truly extraordinary work that our faculty are doing on issues that matter to the common good. Once we identified a theme for this second symposium, I asked the head of Latin American and Latino studies, Jonathan Inda, to plan a symposium that would showcase the excellent work that our faculty do around this topic and to bring them into conversation with other experts across the country. Jonathan convened an interdisciplinary committee who came up with the impressive program before us today. And it's, it's a beautiful program and it's a beautiful image uh, illustrating the program. So um, thanks for that. The theme of migration is particularly resonant as UIC serves many students who are immigrants or the children or grandchildren of immigrants. And Chicago itself is of course home to many immigrant communities. But as you'll see in the titles for each session in your program, migration is at once deeper and more complex than society's dominant narratives about it suggest. At our first symposium a couple of months ago, we considered how climate change requires us to recognize our connectedness in the, wor in the world. In the same way, migration, whether voluntary or forced, and the resulting plight of those who undertake it requires us to recognize the many ways in which we erect barriers and block human survival. The College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is honored not only to support this symposium, but to host several distinguished guests today. Our own faculty represent a range of disciplinary backgrounds and practices and come from the departments of Latin American and Latino Studies, History, Anthropology, English, Global Asian Studies, Criminology, Law and Justice, and Gender and Women's Studies. Our guests, I'm going to uh, introduce some of them, they'll, they'll, you'll hear from them later today. Cindy Hahamovich, Professor of History at the University of Georgia, who studies Southern Immigration and Labor History. William Walters, Professor of Politics in the Department of Political Science and Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and FP, FPA Research Excellence Chair at Carleton University. Karma Chavez, Chair and Endowed Professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latino Latina Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. Elvira Arellano, an organizer and human rights activist uh, from Mishawakan. John Lau, Associate Professor in the Department of Comparative Studies at The Ohio State University and Director of Newark Earthworks Center at, at OSU Newark. Ji, Ji Yun Lee, a Chicago-based interdisciplinary artist who has worked for over 30 years in immigrant rights, economic justice, LGBTQ issues, and domestic violence activism, and our keynote speaker, Valeria Luiselli, who is a 2019 MacArthur Fellow and acclaimed writer. And just, just that, that list of uh, folks uh, joining us today, is, it's spectacular. Um, and exactly the kind of event we want to have where we're bringing experts across the country uh, to be in conversation with us at UIC. The Dean's Office at LAS is incredibly proud to host migration in a world of walls and borders and to welcome you to our campus. Thank you to the entire staff of LAS, especially Vicki Bolf, who you will see throughout the day. Uh, Vicki and Kathy keep me sane. Uh, and uh, I do a spectacular job um, in facilitating uh, events like this. Thank you as well to Jonathan Inda and the faculty committee who worked with him to put together such an amazing program. It's been a real joy uh, to work with you on that. And thank you all for being here. I really can't wait to see what we'll learn from today. And I'm going to turn things over now to Jonathan himself, head of our Latin American and Latino Studies program, Professor Jonathan Inda. He'll get the day started. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
So um, first of all, thank you, um, Dean Freeman. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Inda. I am Director and Professor of Latin American Latino Studies here at UIC. Uh, I would like to begin by recognizing and acknowledging that the University of Illinois Chicago resides on the traditional territories of the three fire people, uh, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawatomi. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and, um, and identity. By making a land acknowledgement, we recognize that indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards of the land that we now occupy. Uh, and living here uh, long before Chicago was a city and still thriving here today. Now, as we work, live, and play in these territories, we must ask what we can do to right the historic wrongs of colonization, state violence, forced removal, and support indigenous communities' struggles for self-determination and sovereignty. So this is a, a fairly short land acknowledgement. Actually, uh, John Lowe, who will be a speaker later on this afternoon, will have an extended discussion of uh, land acknowledgements and their significance, particularly in the context of Chicago. So uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank um, Interim Dean Lisa Freeman for the initiative to create forums to highlight the wonderful research of faculty in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And I too would like to thank the entire staff in LAS for all their work, in particular Vicki Wolf, Vicki, again, uh, who has done really much of the work to bring this, cons um, this um, symposium together. I also want to thank the organizing committee for imagining uh, this event and for organizing the panels. Uh, Soledad Alvarez Velasco, uh, Esmeralda Arrizón Palomera, Xochil Bada, John Connolly, Andrea Feldman, Anna Guevara, Patricia Macias Rojas, Yvonne Padilla Rodriguez, Naomi Paik, Gayatri Reddy, and Barbara Sostaita. Thank you all. Uh, now, uh, just a few words to provide uh, a context for the symposium. So let me begin with the following scene. The date is October 1st, 1994. The setting, a 14 mile stretch of the US-Mexico border running from the, the Pacific Ocean to the rugged canyons east of the, of the city of San Ysidro, California. This stretch is the busiest undocumented border crossing zone in the nation. As dust nears, over 150 Border Patrol agents, more than twice the usual number, fan out in an array of vehicles, so from horses, bicycles, sedans, all-terrain vehicles, to military uh, helicopters, and small high-speed boats. They fan out along the fields, canyons, river banks, and beaches of this tract of border. At first signs of movement, the agents give chase to migrants seeking to cross into the United States. Before the night is over, the U.S. Border Patrol will have made over 800 arrests in this area, more than three times the number registered at the same time the previous year. <clears throat> now, this scene depicts day one of Operation Gatekeeper, which was part of a larger program developed by the U.S. Uh, federal government to strengthen control of the southwest border in order to reduce the flow of undocumented migration from Mexico into the United States. Significantly, the goal of curtailing undocumented migration was directly connected to the ways in which undocumented migrants had been problematized in the US. That is, to the manner in which particular knowledges had constructed the undocumented as a problem, as a threat to the well-being of the nation. So for example, the undocumented were, were associated with such cultural, social, and economic maladies as overpopulation, crime, deteriorating schools, urban decay, um, energy shortages, uh, national disunity. Uh, moreover, they were accused of displacing American workers, depressing wages, spreading diseases, and burdening public services. Now, we now think of California as a fairly progressive state when it comes to immigration politics, but in the 1990s, it wasn't the case. Uh, and of course, these are also very familiar themes. These are, these are themes that we continue to hear uh, today. 
Now, I began with Operation Gatekeeper because it was really a key moment in the policing of migration uh, in the United States. It represented a significant intensification of law enforcement at the nation's borders, and in particular, the U.S.-Mexico border. And this is an intensification that very much continues today. The U.S. federal government has essentially determined that the best way to deal with the problem of undocumented immigration is through turning the United States into a fortified enclave of sorts. So since Gatekeeper, the U.S. has continued to amass uh, uh, border patrol agents and technology along the U.S.-Mexico border <clears throat> in order to deter undocumented crossings. So we all know about um, kind of border walls, which were in many ways made famous by Trump, but the building of border walls did not start with Trump. They have a longer history and, uh, and in many ways, the, this kind of this urge to, to cre um, turn the U.S. into a for fortified enclave has, has taken place under various types of administrations, both Democrats and... Um, it's hard to hear? It's hard to hear? Is, this, is this not on? Okay. Okay, um, so I'll project more. Uh, so essentially, it hasn't really mattered what, uh, it won't stay up, uh, what uh, uh, political party has been in, in the White House. Um, still, the, 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 um, the major movement has been to create walls and borders. Now, the other thing that the US um, government has done um, is really place an increasing emphasis on the interior policing of the nation, that is, uh, away from borders. So for example, local and state law enforcement agencies have become progressively more involved in policing immigration matters. So if, if someone's undocumented, they get stopped for having a broken taillight, that could end, end up getting them <laughs> deported. Um, criminal prosecutions of immigration violations have increased. The number of migrants uh, incarcerated in county jails and federal prisons and privately run immigration detention centers has surged. And also states have made it more difficult for unauthorized migrants to obtain driver's licenses and other identity documents. And of course, in, um, in Florida right now, um, there has just been uh, a bill introduced that would um, criminalize anyone who transports someone who's undocumented. And so, um, so, the, so these very kind of uh, repressive policies are very much continuing. So uh, what we have witnessed uh, since Operation Gatekeeper is really the progressive criminalization of migrants and a significant expansion in the space of policing. While the response to migration just discussed is particular to the US, the construction of migration as a problem and its hyper-policing is not. Uh, neoliberal econ global processes, as Joseph Nevins has pointed out, have encouraged economic flows across international borders. So for instance, favoring the accumulation of capital, defense of private rights, free market and free trade, while at the same time maintaining nationalistic political geographic closure across a, the same borders via expanding boundary enforcement and militarization. Now, these contradictory processes of economic openness and territorial closure have led to ever-increasing um, movement of both unauthorized and authorized migrants across national borders. But politicians and national populations alike have generally neglected the global economic and structural roots of international migration and have tended to place the responsibility for migration and its consequences squarely on the shoulders of individual migrants. The upshot, nations all over the world have developed generally exclusionary and punitive measures to deal with what they regard as either the migration or the border crisis. The symposium today is very much concerned with this exclusionary uh, impulse in how migration is problematized and managed. At the same time, however, we note that the world cannot be reduced to a space of mere policing. It is also most certainly a site of political struggle. Uh, migrants have not stood idly by and accepted uh, 
the punitive treatment to which they have been subjected, rather they and their allies have actively sought to challenge the ways in which they have been policed. So the symposium is at once about territorial closure and its impact on migrants and migration, and on the ways migrants and their allies have sought to challenge such closures and worked for migrant justice. So the symposium is divided into four panels, uh, focusing on labor, immobility, sanctuary, and displacement. The first panel on labor is historical in nature. It, it highlights the long history of, of exclusionary migration processes. Specifically, the panel explores the indentured labor migration and dead peonage of migrant workers in the post-slavery uh, Caribbean and the 20th century United States. Um, by focusing on the lives, border crossings, and work of people who have inhabited multiple vulnerabilities, especially South Asian migrants and non-citizen Mexican uh, minors, UIC historians John Conley and Yvonne uh, Padilla Rodriguez reveal the increasingly unfree, coercive, and violent labor arrangements imposed upon these workers, as well as what these histories can tell us about labor migration dilemmas in the current moment. Now, our second panel, Immobilities, focuses on how the experience of waiting and being in transit is an important yet under-theorized part of the complex and ever-changing migration dynamics. Specifically, the panel explores how migrants simultaneously experience mobility and immobilization through waiting and in transit spaces. By tuning into the embodied experiences of migrants in transit across the migratory corridors connecting the Americas, entrapped in border spaces along those routes, immobilized in detention centers across the Mexico-US border in the US or in shield countries before reaching Europe, the panelists, ex panelists examine the dialectical tension between mobility and immobilization. After our two morning panels, we have a lunch roundtable on sanctuary. Now, this roundtable brings together scholars investigating sanctuary as an organizing strategy for migrant justice into conversation with Elvira Arellano, a migrant activist whose case helped launch the new sanctuary movement in the early 2000s. So the roundtable considers sanctuary's ethical and religious roots and its more contemporary iterations for migrant justice, including the 1980s sanctuary movement uh, uh, for Central American migrants, the new sanctuary movement for migrants under threat of deportation, and more recent mobilizations for sanctuary cities, campuses, and congregations. Our final panel focuses on processes of displacement more generally, linking migration to long histories of displacement of racialized communities in the United States and the practices of containment through which they have experienced multiple forms of invis invisibilization and dispossession. So drawing on archival research, oral history interviews, um, and central lived experience, performative public art and dance practice, this panel traces the long histories of displacement and, and the material and immaterial ways in which unbelonging and dispossession are marked on racialized bodies and communities in the United States. And it asks, who belongs in this nation, this state, this neighborhood? What are some of the practices of containment through which racialized communities have experienced multiple forms of invisibilization, displacement, and dispossession, and how do struggles over land, housing, and basic human rights speak back to these ideologies and practices of displacement? Through a range of different media and forms of public engagement, this panel not only serves as a medium for witnessing these struggles, but also visualizes modes of subaltern resistance in response to these sustained efforts at racial segregation, containment, deportation, and state violence. The symposium will conclude with a keynote by acclaimed writer Valeria Luiselli, who's written a number of very powerful books, both fiction and nonfiction, 
uh, focusing on migration and in particularly on child migration. Her keynote will focus on migrant stories. Um, and we will also have a, uh, uh, oops, sorry. Now to conclude, um, I just wanna thank all of you for coming today. Um, I think we have developed a wonderful program that highlights a key research strength of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Uh, we very much hope that you enjoy the symposium, even though I think some of the uh, migration is often um, a very painful process. Um, so at the very least, I hope we hope you learn uh, from those experiences. Um, so again, um, thank you all for coming, um, and I hope you enjoy the program. So. So what I would like to do now is transition to our first panel on labor, and if we can have um, those panelists come up. Uh, the uh, panel will be chaired by Professor Sochil Bada. Oh, oh is that what's ringing? Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Yeah, I figured that out. So is every speaker going to speak from here or from there? From there, yeah, I agree. So then I'll start coming in. On the computer? Yeah, since we are super good time, we're cool. You are first, so sit here, because you will... Okay, good morning, everybody. We should get started. <clears throat> Once again, welcome to UIC. I am Xochitl Bada, an associate professor in the program of Latin American and Latino Studies here also at UIC. <clears throat> I'm also a member of the Global Immigration Cluster Initiative in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. The reason I am chairing this this morning is because I recently published a book in January with Shannon Gleason on transnational immigrant labor rights advocacy. The title is Scaling Migrant Labor Rights, How Advocates Collaborate and Contest State Power, published by the University of California Press. You can check it out for free at migrantworkerrights.com. It was published on open access thanks to the American Sociological Association. Let's begin. I am serving as the chair of the panel. Each speaker has 15 minutes, including the discussant. Our first speaker of the morning is Jonathan Connolly, professor at the Department of History, University of Illinois, Chicago. <clears throat> He's currently finishing a book about indentured labor migration from South Asia to the Caribbean and in and the Indian Ocean and the category of free labor following the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. The book titled Worthy of Freedom will be published by the University of Chicago Press in 2024. This morning he will be presenting for us his paper Indenture 
vagrancy and post-slavery free labor in the era of emancipation. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Jonathan Connolly. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I'm going to give this paper in two parts. I'll start by talking about my historical research, and then I'm just going to try to reflect a bit on possible connections between work about labor migration in the context of empire and, and then work uh, based on 20 and, and 21st century context. All right. Um, is this, is this better if I lean in? Yeah, yeah. okay. I'm a soft speaker. <laughs> um, so let me get started. Following the abolition of slavery in the British Empire, imperial officials created a transcontinental system of indentured labor migration to bring new workers to sugar producing colonies in the Caribbean and Indian Ocean worlds. Over the course of roughly 80 years, this system operated on a, on a very large scale between uh, 1842 in 1917, more than a million um, indentured Indian workers arrived in the British Caribbean, in Mauritius, in the Indian Ocean, uh, as well as in uh, southern Africa, Fiji, and a number of other uh, non-British territories. So to understand indenture, it's important to first step back uh, in time and, and talk about place. Uh, it's easy from our contemporary perspective to, th to see the, the islands of the Caribbean and Indian Ocean as a kind of periphery. Um, but in addition to the fact that that's not correct now, it's certainly not correct historically and in the period that I'm, I'm going to discuss. Um, from the vantage point of the 17th and 18th centuries, they were very much uh, an imperial center and a source of tremendous wealth. That wealth came from sugar, uh, which became incredibly valuable as a commodity and consumer good uh, in Europe. And in sugar colonies uh, like uh, Saint-Domingue, uh, Jamaica, Cuba, um, uh, to name three of the largest, uh, sugar production depended fundamentally on enslavement. Um, and, and sorry, just to explain this, this uh, what this image does is map out uh, routes during the uh, 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. And as you can see, um, the, the uh, routes to the Caribbean are, are very, very significant. Um, so this is the important context uh, for understanding abolition uh, in the British Empire. Abolitionism uh, became a political force in Britain towards the end of the 18th century. The first great abolition in this context was, of course, the Haitian Revolution. Uh, but Britain was the first European power to abolish chattel slavery um, uh, in its sugar colonies. And that took place in uneven phases. First, uh, in 1808, uh, Britain abolished the slave trade. Uh, then in 1833-34, uh, um, uh, slavery itself. As part of abolition, freed people became apprentices, uh, which was a transitional status. Um, but in 1838, apprenticeship was also abolished uh, so that summer, the summer of 1838, uh, saw full emancipation. Um, but immediately after abolition, and in fact before the end of apprenticeship, planters in British colonies began attempting to recruit indentured workers to bolster their plantation workforces. The imperial state intervened in this process, creating a regulated system of labor migration that then lasted until the end of the First World War. Um, and as I said, that system recruited workers from British India on a very large scale. And it's one of the main reasons why there are large populations of South Asian descent um, across these parts of the world in, in places like Guyana, uh, Mauritius, as I mentioned, South Africa. Um, indenture was a contractual arrangement that was in theory voluntary. Um, as a formal matter, an indenture was a, was a contract, an agreement to work for a period of years in exchange for transportation. Um, but in practice, direct and indirect forms of uh, coercion structured that contractual obligation. 
deception played a role in recruitment for many, and most couldn't uh, read the contracts uh, that they signed. Meanwhile, in the colonies, uh, quite elaborate uh, uh, vagrancy and master and servant laws rendered workers who, who breached their contracts liable to imprisonment. Um, so much of this concerns the role of the colonial state. Uh, indenture was a state-run labor system, uh, not an individually mediated um, uh, or spontaneous relationship. It was overseen and facilitated by imperial officials, and its purpose was to sustain plantation production in the aftermath of abolition. So my, my current work as a historian is about the meaning of free labor in this context. Um, and the book that I'm writing began with a fairly simple question. In 1840, the colonial secretary was the head of uh, the, the, the department that no longer exists, um, uh, but responsible for overseeing colonial administration across the empire. Um, the colonial secretary, Lord Russell, uh, refused to allow indentured labor migration to British Guyana. And in so doing, he said, I am not prepared to encounter the responsibility of a measure which may lead to a dreadful loss of life on the one hand, or on the other, to a new system of slavery. 20 years later, Russell's successor as colonial secretary, Edward Bulwer-Lytton, spoke of indenture in very different terms, arguing in Parliament, Bulwer-Lytton portrayed indenture as morally just, rather than a new system of slavery, uh, as uh, Russell had termed it, indenture was, in his view, a means of preserving, and I'm quoting him, the sublime experiment of Negro emancipation. Um, there's also a kind of movement, rhetorical movement, from innocence to experience in, in the quotation, which you might notice, which signals a larger conceptual transformation around the project of emancipation during the 1850s and 60s. Um, so this striking contrast in perspectives uh, raised a series of questions for the book. Why did indenture become less controversial over time? Why did two prominent officials of the same class uh, in the same position, separated only by time, uh, see the issue so differently? Um, uh, in a much broader sense, how did indenture become free labor? Um, in the book, I approach this question from a, uh, several different perspectives as a matter of ideology, but also as a matter of law and economic structure. Um, but for today, as I said, I'd just like to do two things very briefly. First, I'll present one strand of argument about the law of indenture. Um, uh, and then I'd like to uh, zoom out from my work and, and try to share some uh, provisional reflections about the history of migration as a field um, and for this gathering in particular, I'm interested in, in thinking about um, what work based in the 19th century context of empire has to say uh, to work based on, uh, in, a, in a 20th century context uh, uh, of nation states, or as we've termed it in the conference, in a world of walls and, and borders. Oh, sorry, that's the second point. Okay, so the first argument about post-slavery indenture, and, and to put it very directly, what I'd like to suggest is that notions of increasingly fixed racial difference displaced um, an early universalism in imperial accounts of post-slavery free labor, and that this happened around the middle of the 19th century with, with important implications for the legal structure of indenture. And these are just some examples of ordinances, laws of indenture, uh, each of the colonies had its own body of law, um, all of which was overseen uh, by London, by the colonial office. So in the early 1840s, when the state-sponsored indentured system was created, uh, quite serious disagreement arose uh, over the proper scope and substance of colonial labor law in these post-slavery colonies. Um, and in this context, legislative proposals that originated in the colonies frequently met resistance and, and in fact, disapproval uh, at the colonial office in London. Underlying this conflict, um, and I think what's the important point, uh, were distinct views of the meaning of free labor, as well as the inherent rights and capacities of non-European workers. So in 1842, the home government sanctioned Indian labor migration to Mauritius under a set of regulations. Private recruitment was banned, public officials were appointed to enforce uh, transport regulations, uh, 
and labor contracts were limited to one year. Um, by 1845 in the colony, in Mauritius, um, the colony's legislative council uh, had begun to argue very strenuously for longer mandatory contacts, uh, co contracts. Um, and a consistent racial theme underlay these arguments. According to the council, Indian workers were incapable of orderly work without legal compulsion. Uh, they were, as, as the council reported, I'm quoting, by nature averse and by habit unaccustomed to steady labor. They were marked by a, quote, capricious and roving disposition and prone to absent themselves continuously from the estates wandering about in idleness. And idleness and, and industriousness are sort of charged terms in, in this Victorian context. Um, increased coercion was thus perceived as necessary, according uh, to the planters who testified uh, before the council. Um, only a, 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 an increase, uh, a prolongation, as they said, of engagements to five or three years could counteract the Indian workers' supposed predisposition to vagrancy. Um, scholars have sometimes assumed that imperial officials acquiesced to local demands in shaping indenture policy. But interestingly, in this early period, in this early moment, the colonial office quite clearly rejected that racialized logic of labor control. And our most dramatic examples uh, come in this regard come from dispatches written by a colonial secretary, uh, Earl Gray, who, who repeatedly disallowed this kind of proposal for longer mandatory contracts. Um, so while, as we saw, local officials insisted upon inherent Indian difference, Gray asserted a more universalistic theory of free labor efficiency. He wrote, where the motives of self-interest are properly brought to bear upon their conduct, there are few, if any, among the various races of mankind who may not be stimulated to industry. Um, in this sense, the true policy of indenture, in his view, was to promote uh, uh, labor discipline through self-interest rather than direct legal coercion. Um, under this framework, and again, much more could be said about this, um, Gray strictly prohibited contracts lasting longer than one year. Uh, disallowing a law to the contrary in British Guyana, he wrote that uh, three-year contracts plainly amounted to, quote, interference with the freedom of labor. Uh, using a kind of language of industriousness to moralize restrictive labor discipline, uh, the governor of Trinidad argued in 1849 that five-year contracts would make immigrant workers, quote, worthy of freedom, the source of the title of my book. Um, and Gray's response here was that uh, such a law would represent no less than slavery in a mitigated form and for a limited period. Um, and this is just a, they're not all this messy, this, but this is um, a set of notes that he wrote to other officials about, about that law. Um, but despite, um, okay, <laughs> despite these clear lines of disagreement, uh, the laws of indenture changed very substantially over time. Uh, and in so doing, they became increasingly restrictive. Multi-year contracts, which Gray and others had banned, became the norm. The colonial office sanctioned three-year contracts in 1854, <laughs> five-year contracts in 1862, and uh, uh, optional five-year re-indenture extensions in 1860 and 1863. And penalties for unauthorized absence hardened in a very similar pattern. Uh, Trinidad authorized imprisonment with hard labor for up to three months uh, uh, for breaches for unauthorized absence in 1865. Uh, Natal, following Mauritius, imposed wage deductions in excess of wages due uh, in 1859. And all of this was done at this later stage with, with London's approval. Um, these changes followed shifts in the imperial sugar economy, most notably uh, decreases in, in uh, sugar production in the British West Indies. Uh, as well as the repeal of the sugar duties in 1846, which lowered the price of sugar um, on the London market. Both dynamics helped consolidate a new ideological consensus uh, that the sugar colonies were in crisis and that from an economic standpoint, emancipation had failed. Such judgments blended seamlessly into moral condemnation of the formerly enslaved and of the capacities of non-European workers more broadly. So if we flash forward to the 1860s, we see an entirely different approach to the boundaries of free labor uh, in official discussions of uh, indenture. 
In 1867, Mauritius imposed pass laws on all uh, Indian immigrants, including so-called old immigrants who had, who had finished their indentures and were no longer legally bound. Um, um, the governor at the time justified that law in explicitly racialized terms. In his view, uh, special legal restrictions were appropriate, quote, for men in the state of civilization of the low caste natives who emigrate to these colonies. And now the colonial office's response to that argument revealed the extent to which officials in London, by this point, had abandoned that earlier, more universalistic conception of free labor, um, uh, which we saw and, and come to accept the very race-based justification for legal coercion that, that had long been advocated in the colonies. Privately, the colonial uh, office official who reviewed uh, the, this, this law um, uh, wrote that it was, quote, extraordinarily stringent, and that it, quote, introduced a principle unknown to and inconsistent with English law. That's because the past laws were explicitly discriminatory on the basis of race. Still, in spite of acknowledging that, that's not, that's just not, that's not just my sort of projection from the present, that's, that's what he wrote at the time, he still regarded it as being both necessary and legitimate. Uh, the governor's assessment had much prima facie probability, he wrote, since, quoting him again, the Indians who emigrate to the colonies must necessarily be of the lower class in their native country, a class in which habits of truthfulness and honesty are notoriously deficient. And this is just a, this is a photograph of a special vagrancy prison that was built in Mauritius at the time, um, and part of it still exists. It's a photo I took several years ago. Um, so two decades earlier, the colonial office had explicitly rejected local descriptions of inherent Indian vagrancy, as we saw, insist insisting instead on the universal applicability of liberal theories of economic behavior. Now the office evinced a newfound deference towards local expertise, towards those on the spot um, most capable of forming a judgment. So even though <laughs> Uh, the officer explicitly concluded that the law contravened the principles we have been accustomed to. Uh, and, sorry, again, I'm quoting him. The principles we have been accustomed to consider essential to liberty in this country, he approved it nonetheless. Um, and this is an example of a, a ticket, a uh, kind of pass that was required under uh, these fairly elaborate, elaborate pass laws enacted in the 1860s. And you can see it has a photograph. It's a quite early use of photography in, in policing, um, which interesting, interestingly comes from a colonial context, yeah. well before photographs were used in passports um, for international travel. Um, okay, so um, I think I'm, am I essentially out of time? Okay. <laughs> so my, my grand plan for the two parts was over ambitious, but um, <laughs> perhaps in the discussion, I can bring in some of the reflections uh, I had prepared about how we might connect this, this kind of work based in a context of empire in which the state was committed to facilitating migration for the purpose of redistributing labor within an empire um, to a quite different uh, 20th century context, which rightly tends to dominate histories of migration uh, in which uh, uh, we, we live in a world dominated by nation states which tend to restrict immigration in their borders and tend to assume that the power to enforce such restriction is inherent in sovereignty. So um, as a preview, I think one of the big questions and potential contributions some work in this imperial context has to make is to suggest that there's a longer history to that uh, coming together of sovereignty and border restriction um, um, which, has, which is essentially a story about transition from empire uh, to nation. So hopefully more time for that later, but thanks very much for uh, your time. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for inviting us to rethink the meaning of those mandatory contracts with harsh penalties for breaches that include imprisonment. So it's, it's a good way of understanding who or how like empires planted the seed for contemporary Bracero programs and guest worker programs, both uh, in Europe 
uh, and also in Latin America. That's, that's a fascinating story that is very worth examining further in the Q&A question. And now we move to our next speaker, Yvonne Padilla Rodriguez. She is a Bridge to Faculty Postdoctoral Research Associate at the University of Illinois, Chicago, in the Department of History. Yvonne is currently working on a book manuscript that historizes child-centered mechanisms and consequences of US immigration exclusion. Her public-facing writing has appeared in the Washington Post, Time, NACLA, and Teen Vogue. Her most recent academic writing includes an article in the Journal of American Ethnic History. And she is also a, an Illinois Public Voices Fellow. She is going to present her paper, Migrant Child Labor and Debt Peonage on Farms in Post 1965 America. Do you have your slides here? I sent them to John. Okay. Yeah, if not, I have uh, are you PPTSAB? Because I don't recall. Is migration board and what's the name in, in the, the file? It should have been pretty clear. It's like child labor. Oh. Migrant, Migrant child labor? In the peonage. But that's not the. It's okay. They are not here. Okay. <gasps> Sorry. Sorry, Bon. <laughs> I was told it's that okay. everything is in there, but it's I not there. Pretty Jonathan's are here, but yours are in there. Unless you can find them here? I don't think I any. don't find them. Yeah. So um. Not to fear, I came prepared. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure this is always a problem. Um, my presentation today will take us to post-1965 United States. In the summer of 1960, David Shackney traveled to Mexico to hire workers for the large chicken farm he owned in Middlefield, Connecticut. After meeting Luis Oros in Mexico City, Shackney negotiated a two-year contract with Mr. Oros, Mrs. Oros, and their eldest daughter, Maria Elena, to work on Shackney's chicken farm beginning on August 15, 1961. Shackney then arranged for the Oros family's transportation and visa processing, including the youngest Oros children whose labor was not included in Shackney's contract. Despite only spending $560 on their bus tickets and immigration expenses, Shackney demanded Mr. Oros sign 18 interest-high promissory notes for $100 each as collateral. After securing these promissory notes, Shackney communicated to Mr. Oros the following warning. You have contract. If you break this contract, I deport you and you never come back to the United States. Not you, not your son, and not your grandsons, because I have a lot of friends in Mexico and the United States, and I have a lot of money. In spite of this preemptive threat of deportation, Mr. Oros still wanted to travel to Connecticut as Shackney's employee. But when the Oros family arrived to Middlefield, they quickly realized Shackney had misrepresented the work and living conditions they would endure. To begin with, the Oros living quarters were unsafe for a family with young children. The family was also not permitted to receive visitors or leave the farm's premises without supervision. And despite the fact that their agreement only provided for the labor of Mr. Oros, Mrs. Oros, and Maria Elena, Shackney coerced all seven members of the family into working on his farm, including the youngest children aged seven and nine, who never attended school while in Connecticut. 
The Oros family only received $10 throughout their two-year stay in Middlefield because Shackney garnished the family's earnings to dissolve the debt owed to him. The exploitation experienced by the Oros family would be considered labor trafficking today. In the 1960s, this kind of labor exploitation, as you can see on the screen, was described within the language of slavery. The labor trafficking of migrants with liminal or no legal status meant that they were recruited and transported to the US through the use of fraud or coercion for the purposes of involuntary servitude and debt bondage or peonage. They were coaxed into taking on debts impossible to pay off and silenced with threats of violence, arrest, or deportation. But when the Oros family challenged their involuntary servitude and debt peonage in court, the Second Circuit ultimately ruled in U.S. v. Shackney that labor trafficking induced by the threat of deportation was not necessarily, quote, equivalent to imprisonment or worse, end quote, since the victims of labor trafficking had to possess an extreme fear of the consequence of formal legal imprisonment to qualify for redress. This reasoning ignored the pleas of the Oros children who testified to a grand jury that the prison-like conditions of their employment made them, quote, think they were in prison, end quote. The Oros children exploitation marked one of the first, if not the first, documented instance of the attempted prosecution of the labor trafficking of youth from Mexico, a practice whose prevalence was exacerbated by the post-1965 changes to immigration law and policy and their attendant explosion of the human smuggling business. My research expands the rich but adult-centric scholarship on immigration by tracing the inception and growth of migrant youth labor trafficking on farms in the wake of the precedent set by U.S. v. Shackney. It also shows how labor trafficking helped fuel the growth of child detention and deportation by exposing trafficked migrant minors to the carceral state when immigration raids in the fields resulted in their arrests and detentions. Finally, I reveal how migrant youth challenged these rights violations, as well as how law enforcement and growers weaponized paternalistic ideas about childhood innocence to extend the reach of the carceral state, ensnaring migrants of all ages into its expanding dragnet. Although single adult males numerically dominated the post-1965 growth of unauthorized migration to the US, rising inequality, inflation, and unemployment in countries like Mexico forced unaccompanied youth to travel to the US unlawfully in search of work opportunity. In addition, the imposition of numerical limits on Latin American immigration and the preference for refugees fleeing communism forced some families' decision to, quote, reunify themselves illegally, end quote, as one Border Patrol agent put it to a Los Angeles Time reporter in 1979. The lack of avenues available for lawful migration to the U.S. also forced Latin American migrants to undertake clandestine routes to enter the U.S. and evade detection and incarceration in Immigration and Naturalization Service Detention Centers, INS. As the southwestern U.S. boundary hardened and the presence of immigration agents at urban points of entry increased, migrants required guidance from smugglers knowledgeable of the terrain in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, leading to the explosion of the human smuggling business. By 1975, over 70% of migrants, and especially undocumented minors, purchased the services of a coyote to transport them across the border, which started to become increasingly militarized in the 1970s, resulting in the infliction of fatal violence upon undocumented youth and women at the border. Herman Baca of the Committee on Chicano Rights claimed that the militarization of the border allowed, quote, an armed force of psychopaths to wage war on innocent children, end quote. Impoverished migrants of all ages, but especially children, who could not afford the services of a coyote, sometimes consented to arrangements in which coyote smugglers transported them directly to work in the US, usually on rural farms where they hoped to earn a living to send money home and pay back the debt owed for their transportation and smuggling. Commercial farms became one of the most common destination sites for youth, in part because the government continued to carve out labor law exemptions for the agricultural industry, and because enforcement of child labor prohibitions was lax, if not entirely non-existent. In 
Most farm work remained excluded from the Fair Labor Standards Act 1938 child labor ban. Additionally, the U.S. didn't invest enough resources into enforcing the 1974 amendments of the ban, making updates to child labor law meaningless. The courts also gave farm owners license to exploit migrant miners' labor. Judges' personal convictions that child labor should be legally permissible because, quote, if you keep a kid occupied, you keep them out of trouble, end quote, were rooted in migrant miners' presumed disposition to criminality and the denial of their childhood. Some growers asserted that they knew what was best for young migrants by maintaining that the kids were, quote, better for it, end quote, since the work kept them occupied and off the streets where they might pose harm to themselves or worse, to white Americans. These personal convictions and judicial philosophies explain why, when the Department of Labor uncovered 13,000 agricultural child labor violations in 1970, the department only managed to obtain 138 court injunctions against the practice. By sanctioning child labor under the guise of a paternalistic concern for minors depicted as dangerous to themselves and society, judges' interviews revealed how the state legally and rhetorically denied migrant minors childhood innocence to facilitate their continued labor exploitation. When judges did prosecute agricultural child labor violations, often it was migrant parents who bore the brunt of court-ordered fines to discourage them from bringing their kids to the fields and subjecting them to constant migration. In states like Ohio, migrant parents were sometimes incarcerated in county jails for being unable to pay agricultural child labor fines or post bail. Migrant parents' criminalization was justified by judges' paradoxical sense of legal paternalism in which punishing parents, quote, protected, end quote, innocent children from exploitation even if the parents' incarceration resulted in family separation. When punishing children for school absenteeism, disciplinary actions were rooted in ideas about neglected minors' immaturity that deemed them dangerous to themselves, necessitating the wisdom of correctional officials. It is against the backdrop of weak anti-child labor law enforcement, an increase in child and family migration, a racist domestic law enforcement apparatus, and the buildup of the deportation regime that local and federal authorities discovered especially egregious instances of undocumented child labor exploitation on farms. Unofficial estimates in the early 1980s suggested that anywhere between 10,000 and 100,000 child and adult migrants were labor trafficked every year. Many of these migrants originated from Mexico and increasingly from Central America in the final years of the 20th century. They were trafficked onto remote <coughs> rural farm fields in the U.S. Southwest, Midwest, and South after traveling along migratory routes inherited from the early and mid 20th century. I argue that farms constituted carceral work sites that extended the reach of the carceral state beyond normative sites of incarceration like prisons and jails. Mid and late 20th century migrant labor camps and farms were prison-like spaces because farm owners like David Shackney denied minors freedom of movement and basic rights to privacy, education, medical attention, and communication with the world outside of the farm's perimeter. I look at how non-traditional sites of imprisonment, in this case labor camps and farms, relied on carceral logics, which I define as the perpetration of surveillance, isolation, curtailed mobility, and punishment, which then brought migrant miners into contact with law enforcement agents. When undocumented workers spoke out against the violence they endured on carceral farm fields or refused to work, growers called local law enforcement. Migrants' advocacy then resulted in state-sponsored retaliation enabled by collaborations between the police and INS who carried out immigration raids that uncovered undocumented youth workers. By demanding better working conditions, withholding their labor, taking their employers to court, and trying to escape confinement on carceral farm fields, migrant youth challenged agricultural capitalist power and the carceral state's unofficial extensions. But in the process of expressing resistance, migrant youth became increasingly exposed to immigrant detention. In fact, undocumented agricultural child laborers were sometimes incarcerated in county jails and detention centers to serve as material witnesses against their traffickers and smugglers. In 
In a bid to try to thwart the post-1965 increase in unauthorized migration from Latin America, the INS started to prosecute coyotes in court in the late 1960s. This decision did very little to hold accountable well-resourced human smugglers who could secure bail within a single day of arrest. Instead, as authorities attempted to gather material witnesses against coyotes, the decision caused the mass imprisonment of thousands of Mexican and Central American miners. In 1979, 340,000 340, immigrants were arrested at the border. Of these, more than 8,000 were children and 600 of them were held as material witnesses to testify in federal court. In the following decade, the INS incarcerated about 5,000 children a year, and an estimated 900 minors were forced to testify against their coyotes each year into the mid-1980s. The detention and eventual deportation of migrant minors in the late 20th century criminalized undocumented youth of all ages and denied them the privilege of childhood innocence, just as labor trafficking had done. In INS jails, undocumented youth received their first criminal records and were incarcerated alongside adults charged with criminal offenses. Their physical proximity to imprisoned adults hardened perceptions of migrant youth as criminal and blurred the lines between adolescence and adulthood. Immigration officials in the US employed paternalistic arguments in which they purported to be protecting children and acting in their, quote, best interests, end quote, by detaining them to prosecute their smugglers and traffickers. Even when the prosecution of coyote smugglers caused a family separation, immigration officials maintained that these efforts were meant to help children and their families. If the INS did acknowledge the cruelty of child incarceration explicitly, they did so to advance another paternalistic argument, that deportation was also an undocumented minor's best interest because removal from the nation allowed for a child's release from prison which allowed, quote, juveniles to return to Mexico with smiles, end quote, as you can see on the screen. Misleading statements like these failed to acknowledge how expulsion created additional precarity for lone child deportees who were forced to join the ranks of informal day laborers in northern Mexico to earn enough to survive until they could cross the border again, or those who endured a double criminalization by being arrested and thrown into overcrowded juvenile detention facilities in northern Mexico after deportation from the United States. Child detention and labor trafficking ended up inspiring an abolitionist critique of the US immigration regime. Migrants' rights advocates called for a series of accountability measures against employers and a moratorium on arrests and deportations by the Border Patrol and INS in farm fields and orchards, which sometimes resulted in the apprehension of migrant child laborers. In the 1980s, Herman Baca explicitly articulated an abolitionist critique of the immigration regime in response to the harm perpetuated against migrant youth. In a 1985 protest involving 30 children, Baca argued that, quote, the only solution to stopping the abuse of children is to abolish the border patrol, end quote. This history shows that rights violations against migrant youth are not new and that migrant child labor in particular does not constitute a new economy of exploitation, as the New York Times recently put it. While it is true that child labor violations have been on the rise since 2015, there is nothing new about the exploitation and educational deprivation, or even the attempted educational deprivation of migrant youth, let alone their detention. Recent violations of migrant children's rights are part of a decades-long history that is about much more than just labor law and its enforcement. It is also the consequence of restrictive immigration law and the militarization of the border. Failing to look beyond labor law enforcement and scrutinize the entire web of practices, both legal and rhetorical, that have allowed migrant child labor and abuse to flourish in the US will only continue to put children in harm's way depriving them of the most fundamental rights of childhood. Thanks so much.
Thank you so much, Yvonne, for, bring, for bringing the record straight that this is not a new phenomenon when we are reading this um, on the New York Times these days on child labor. And very quickly before moving on to our next presenter, I just want to share a story because my students from my labor course are here today that we recently got a visit from the Department of Labor, Deputy Director of Chicago for the, <coughs> the Department of Labor Wage and Art Division to our classroom. And my students were very well prepared and asked him questions about the recent Tyson lawsuit where the undocumented Central American kids had been awarded $1 million, which prompted all this wave of information at the New York Times. And he was like a, a little evasive because he said that this is still confidential information, but he said that unfortunately, very close by, very close to this place, um, in Chicago, there's another case of child labor abuse that he could not disclose anymore because the judge had failed to give him an injunction to raid the place. So we had to go to the Beth, my, myself and my students, like learning that very close to where we were at in Chicago, there is another child labor abuse, big one from a big corporation. That's all the information he could tell you. But if you wanna pull out your calculator now, you see the, the scale of Yvonne's problem by making a simple math that there are 2,000, and I repeat, 2,000 inspectors from the Wage and Hour Division at the Department of Labor that are in charge of surveillance and like inspecting the entire country. So go figure if what type of abuses are out there. Okay, next uh, we have a wonderful uh, discussant today that is uh, coming to tell us um, um, discuss these papers, Cindy Hahamovich from the University of Georgia. Cindy. Hamovic is a professor of history at the University of Georgia. She is a scholar of Southern immigration and labor history in a global context. She is a Guggenheim Fellow, a Fulbright Fellow, and the John E. Sawyer Fellow at the National Humanities Center. She has written two books, The Fruits of Their Labor, Atlantic Coast Farm Workers, and the Making of Migrant Poverty, 1870. 1945, University of North Carolina Press, and the triple prize winning No Man's Land, Jamaican Guest Workers in America and the Global History of Deportable Labor from Princeton University Press. So please give a warm welcome to Cindy Hahamovich. <laughs> Thank you so much. This podium wasn't really built for um, height challenged people, so I hope you can see me over the top. Um, thanks so much for having me here, and I want to give another round of applause to the folks who organized this conference. I have organized many, and I can tell you it is a royal pain. Um, now, both of these fascinating papers deal not just with the experience of migrants, indentured workers in one case, child migrants in another, but with those in power's understanding and treatment of those people. John Connolly considers how British attitudes toward indentured, uh, Indian indentured workers hardened over time. And Yvonne Padilla shows us that the criminalization and exploitation of child migrants traveling alone is not a new phenomenon. So one reckons with change and one reckons with continuity, right? Now John's paper is really two papers in one, as he said, and um, the first part is a very useful summary, as you heard, of 19th century indentured labor in the British Empire when there were borders but not yet walls, right? Um, focusing on officials changing attitudes toward Indian uh, workers. And then the second part of the essay, which you didn't get to hear, kind of veered away to critique the tendency of historians of migration to focus narrowly on uh, migration between nation states. And he suggests that uh, using migration as a category of analysis in order to see beyond the confines of nation states' borders um, would be a, a useful way to think. And in this case, he, he proposes an empire-wide uh, view of migration. Now, both these pieces are fantastic. And so I don't really have critiques, so I'm just going to riff off them. And if I could have the 
bottle of water or the cup or whatever, that would be awesome. I don't know where I'm going to put it. Um, so Jones is the sort of piece that's really fun to think with. And my first thought was that it, it substitutes a nation state frame for a British imperial frame that's narrow in its own way. And I know John's thinking I'm crazy because studying a whole empire is you know, a, an enormous undertaking. Uh, but for it considers one kind of imperial migration, right, indenture, without considering the others, like British migration to the US or South Africa or Hong Kong, um, or convict migration to Australia. Not that I'm really suggesting you do this because you'd be done by the time you're 80, but I've, I've never really seen a study that goes truly empire-wide, and I think somebody could do that as a sort of um, you know, synthetic book that would be really exciting. We might also get a different impression if we compared indentured migration across empires. In fact, when I give talks about 19th century indentured labor in the British Empire, because I'm working on the same stuff, someone will invariably ask me, well, what about indentured migrants in other empires as though one was not enough? Um, and we, it's a good question, though, because we don't really know how much colonial officials copied from each other um, and uh, how they handled the same issues. So to just give you one example, in the British Empire, as indentures got longer and pass laws were imposed on the colonies, as John notes, there was investigation after investigation by the British and then reform after, so they're reforming themselves constantly. Um, and I don't think those reforms worked by and large uh, but they allowed British officials to think that they worked, right? And it just sort of prolonged the indentured system. So it lasts all the way until the early 1920s because they get to think it's better even when it's, it's not. In contrast, Lisa Yun's brilliant book, um, The Cooley Speaks on Chinese indentured migrants in Cuba shows that after a similar Chinese investigation into gross abuses of indentured workers in Cuba, the Chinese government shut the whole thing down, right? Well, why the difference, right? Why would a relatively weak empire do that when a powerful empire like the British kept going and going and going? So a global frame might reveal even more than an imperial frame. And we could just as well challenge the temporal limitations of historians' studies. So indentured labor, as I'm sure you know, was far older than the so-called coolie trade of the 19th century, right? In fact, by the time indentured migrants from India started to move around the world in the 19th century, British and German indentured workers had been crossing the Atlantic to the so-called New World for some 200 years. What's the difference, right? Was this the same recruitment system with different players or an utterly different traffic? and people, how much difference did race make, for example. Um, I, I would love somebody to do that study. And then if we jump forward to the recent past, um, how different were the experiences of migrants, say, uh, in the guest worker programs in a world that has both walls and borders? So, and, and that's really the project that I'm trying to work on is, is comparing the 19th and the 20th centuries, and I've run out of hands. Okay. Now, going down to the local level would also allow us, and it sounds like John, I was talking to him earlier, and it sounds like he does this, but would allow us to consider indentured workers and emancipated slaves, thank you, in the same frame. So Africans were still being imported into the Caribbean just 20 years before indentured Indians started to arrive, and indentured workers worked alongside emancipated people. They were housed in the same quarters. They were clearly recruited not to replace emancipated people, but to undermine their bargaining power, right? And yet the history of emancipation and the history of indentured uh, servitude are, are discussed as two different, they're two different fields almost entirely. There's a few books that connect the dots, but usually they're just sort of glancing um, mentions of the relationship, and, and we really need a study that delves into that comparison. 
So my point here is not that John is wrong about anything or about taking immigration historians to task for fo focusing on nation states. Um, I kind of tried to do that in my own work, but we could propose many different scales, um, some way more ambitious than others, right? Local, national, transnational, imperial, global, and um, we could study the long durée, or we can study the short term, and each has its advantages and its disadvantages. So I'd love to you know, think more about that. Now, Yvonne's paper. Um, Eric Arneson once told me that I was the most depressing labor historian of all time. Um, but I think Yvonne might have taken my crown. Um, her work on the exploitation and incarceration of teenagers crossing the border on their own is eye-opening and horrifying. Uh, Yvonne's paper raises all sorts of interesting issues that I'd love to read more about. I wonder, for example, how far back uh, you'll go, right? So Sarah Rogerson has a 2016 law review article, and there were a bunch of law review articles I looked on, on this topic on, on unaccompanied minors. And she begins with a citation for a 1939 congressional hearing on unaccompanied minors, but that seemed to be about Jewish refugee children coming from Nazi Germany. And I'm pretty sure I've seen progressive era reporting on European unaccompanied minors arriving in the US, although I couldn't find it in my quick um, look. So this made me wonder how differently policymakers, reporters, academics, and others have treated the issue of child migrants depending on where the migrants are from. So, Another issue I'd love to know more about, and I should be trying to sell this as a dissertation topic forever, but nobody ever listens to my ideas for dissertation topics, so yeah, whatever, um, is, is to, to really dig in on the people who bring these children over the border, or bring migrants over the border, who in this article are called coyotes, smugglers, human traffickers, and labor recruiters. And it occurred to me as I was reading that sometimes we, ref we see the people who facilitate migration as heroes, right? I'm thinking, for example, as the conductors on the Underground Railroad. Right? They're kind of doing the same job, but in a totally different context. Or the people who used to help facilitate migration over the US-Mexican border, but whose actions, whose aid has been criminalized right, um, in recent decades. So um, in this case, um, and in most cases, we talk about people who move people across borders as smugglers or traffickers, as Yvonne does here. But if you believe that people have the right to cross borders and shouldn't be criminalized for doing it, then are the people who facilitate their crossings heroes or villains or something in between? And, and by the way, in international law, there's a distinction made between smugglers and traffickers, which I must say is pretty darn muddy. But, but anyway, it's worth, it's worth um, thinking about the distinction. So I'd be re I'm really, really interested in a, in a study of facilitation that goes from, say, the slave trade to the present. Right. Um, rather than you know, just we have a lot. We have work on coyotes, but I don't think we have a lot of work. And we have slave traders, but we just there's so much in between. Um, and I'd be, and I'm glad to know that you're working on the sort of 1965 divide because I've thought about this in relation to 1986. So when H2A workers, agricultural guest workers, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Were um, but before 1986, before IRCA, they were restricted to apples and sugar, so just to a few employers, really. And at that time, all the workers were coming from the British Caribbean, and employers did the recruiting and the facilitating themselves. They formed labor consortiums. They sent recruiters down to Jamaica and other um, formerly British uh, colonies. And it was far less pernicious than this uh, recruiting is today, but it also allowed them to blacklist workers who organized strikes or who sought out lawyers. So there was a up and a downside. And then after 1986, when the H-2A program was allowed to expand into any crop and to bring people from any sending country, 
we get all these private recruiters getting into the business and it gets seriously uh, nasty as it is today. So I, I'm hoping that Yvonne's work will historicize the, this issue of facilitators. And then the last issue I want to raise is that Yvonne's use of incarceration as a frame for understanding both the exploitation of child migrants on farms and their treatment in immigration detention, uh, which she says is you know, frightfully like the treatment of uh, immigration adults, maybe as a metaphor doesn't quite cover all of the things that you're talking about. So it seems to me that your story was a story of mobility and immobility. The car incarceration metaphor kind of captures the immobility part, but employers hire these kids so they're depending on their mobility even as they may immobilize them after they get there. And likewise, private detention centers depend on people's mobility in order to profit from their detention from their immobility. So I wondered if there was a, maybe somebody can, can I'm terrible at metaphors, maybe somebody can, can suggest one later, but I was just mulling about that. So anyway, just a few thoughts on these really uh, fascinating papers, and I look forward to learning from both of these authors and to read their published work. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being so good on timing because now gets the good part with we get to interact with the panelists. So we have exactly 15 minutes for Q&A and this is a very large room so I counted 76 persons. So I am happy to facilitate the discussion and we hopefully we will get a first round of questions. So why we don't collect a first round and I will call you um, and then we let them speak and then if we have time, we do a second round. How about that? Over there. First question. You get the first question. Oof, that's a good question. The text, do, does the que person who asks questions need a mic? Because we, I don't have a portable have a one. Oh, we have a spare? Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much, that was really spectacular. I'm Jenny Breyer, I'm in um, Gender and Women's Studies and the History Department. I know all of you. Um, I actually was really fascinated with how abolition appeared in your papers and what it says about this particular moment in um, a recasting of abolition in our present moment around a particular politics. Um, and always knowing its roots in enslavement, but of course Yvonne's work suggests all of the ways that deportation and other forms of um, exploitation and oppression require abolition as well. And so I wonder if that's actually another thing that your work and in a conference on mobility and immobility to take up abolition in this historical context, which is very different than the historical context that you might immediately associate with abolitionist politics, whether it's in the, you know, the 18th century or the 21st. I, so I'm just wondering if you saw that there because it was palpable for me. Thank you, Jenny. Uh Oh, thank you, Julie. You, you will pass the mic. Okay, so let's let's collect three questions. So hopefully we can do two rounds. Raise your hand. Don't be shy. We need to like a, this is very short the time. <laughs> and hand number three can like please start thinking about the number three. So that's that we we can like have sec two rounds. Hi, right, thank you again for your presentation, it was great. Um, I actually have a question about sort of like the idea of coercion uh, in your papers. So sort of in both instances, right, people are getting coerced into these contracts, whether it's tricked or sort of physically forced into them. Um, and sort of when, when people are talking about that, right, these colonial officials being like, oh, well, you know, they sort of, they're, they're lazy, is part of that because they were coerced, like the understanding of they were susceptible to being coerced and then same for these farm migrants, right? Because like they're seen as you know these children, sort of they're losing their innocence. But is though that idea is oh because you know they were they fell to these tricks, they were forced into this work. Does that go into these understandings of them as sort of these like lesser workers? Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. A third and last question for the first round. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. much. Thank you very much to, to the presenters. Uh, my question is brief, and it concerns about like the profits and, and things mm. associated with these industries. And I, might, I imagine that uh, calculating this with, 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 um, with the first uh, phenomenon might be more complicated, but it will be interesting to have a, an approximation. Thank you very much for these three wonderful questions. So I'll call, like, do you want to do order from, like, right to left, left to right? Do you have a preference for addressing? No, I mean, I'm happy to go first. Okay. Um, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you so much for the reflections, the questions. I thought they were really rich, and they give me um, a lot to think through. And thank you for your questions from uh, the audience. For the sake of time, I'll try to be uh, brief to try to get through the audience questions. Um, abolition in this historical context, as I mentioned in the paper, certainly um, comes up. And you're right, Jenny, that it, this isn't the perhaps the um, historical context that you generally think about um, abolition. I think my first thought would be like the abolition movement around enslavement. Um, and it's really interesting. Uh, to think about that in conjunction with uh, the abolitionist critiques that were marshaled by the defenders of migrant children and migrant adults because they often did call upon rhetoric and ideology from that movement of abolition around enslavement. I mean, the language of slavery was really like across um, the historical archive when describing this kind of labor exploitation. It was often crouched um, in that language and they would often compare um, enslavement to the violent um, exploitation of migrant youth. Uh, some people, even like growers themselves, would say like really horrific things about how they used to quote, um, own their slaves and now they just rented them, end quote. Um, I mean like really, really horrific language to describe um, the, uh, the, the conditions in which they placed um, migrant youth. And I'm also just like really curious about how, um, and struck by the fact that uh, abolitionist critiques of the US immigration regime are also like, they don't start with the abolish ICE movement, that there is like a, a longer history of this. Um, the question about coercion is a very, very good question. Um, I think the lines here between consent and coercion are super blurry um, because some of these kids are consenting to these arrangements in where this process begins, um, but they're certainly not consenting to what actually ends up happening. So um, these um, labor arrangements are rooted and dependent upon things like fraud and coercion. Um, and then there's, of course, the questions of like the really like desperate, the, the desperation that they're experiencing and like the power dynamics and the power differentials. Um, so it's complex um, and it's something that I'm like trying to very carefully uh, draw out in the in the written work itself. Um, and often, I, I think if I understood correctly, uh, youths supposed like immaturity, their innocence, um, that also really played a factor in how uh, the coercion and the consent was described. And that's where the state comes in with these very like paternalistic kind of arguments about their ability to supposedly protect kids who are not capable of um, in engaging in these kinds of arrangements. Um, in terms of profits, there's some, um, so of course like growers were profiting from these kids' labor. Um, sometimes kids uh, or states uh, uncovered a lot of evidence of um, wage theft. Um, there's a particular experiment that the INS engaged with that I didn't bring up in this paper, but it comes up in my broader work. Um, between 1966 and 1971, the INS experimented with this farming out program where they basically rented detained migrants back to farms, and I think that even the INS was profiting from some of this labor exploitation that was happening um, on remote commercial farms. Uh, so that's what I'll say on profit. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, thanks so much for I mean, fantastic questions. And on the question of abolition, you know, absolutely crucial f for this work, and one of my basic starting points is the the fact that abolition ends chattel slavery without defining freedom in, in, in any sort of specific way. And to expand on what Cindy said, traditionally much work on indenture thought about what the extent to which it resembled slavery. At this point, I think it is potentially more productive to think about the relationship between indenture and emancipation, meaning indenture is one of several major developments that does that work of defining uh, what what freedom will actually mean, and and not just for indentured workers, because again, as you said, 
the effect on um, all those who lived in these colonies um, is manifest uh, in wages, um, in policing, and other respects. Um, um, and and there's maybe a tendency as well to to know but not explain um, the fact that abolitionist politics in Britain become less influential over the course of the 19th century, mm -hmm. and that's something I'm very interested in trying to explain. I think the study of indenture lends itself to that to to actually ground um, that what's often referred to as just decline or fade in a set of um, um, economic conflicts over um, post-slavery labor. Um, and so maybe relatedly to jump to the, you know, the excellent question of profit, um, in this context, um, sugar remains the, the, the key commodity and the source of profit in uh, the plantation uh, economy. Um, and one thing that the study of indenture reveals is that that continues to be the case in, in the places where indenture happened on a large scale. And we sometimes miss that. Um, uh, because sugar production gradually decreases in Jamaica, and, and to speak to inter-imperial relationships, the opposite is happening in other parts of the world, in Cuba in particular, which becomes the world's largest sugar producer, and, and where formal slavery still exists in this period. Um, uh, so um, creating a, a kind, what comes to be defined as a kind of free labor that will compete with uh, formal slavery in other empires is another important element of this history, and then I think you know, fantastic question about um, coercion, what it what it means, and um, a, a lot to say. Uh, one potential connection to the other forms of indenture that existed previously is to first of all acknowledge that coercion is a part of labor law in in England uh, across Europe uh, from the Middle Ages forward. That our contemporary distinction between criminal and civil, you know, hasn't fully formed. But I think in the 19th century, there's an important divergence uh, where master and servant law in England is gradually repealed over the course of the century. Indenture to North America for Europeans also you know, is winding down and ceases to play a role in, in US labor relations by the 19th century. The opposite is the case in this, in this kind of post-slavery uh, labor. So I think consent uh, becomes a hallmark of freedom for some but not others mm -hmm. in this moment. Um, and the, the overwhelming view of coercion among officials in the context I deal with is that coercion is actually a, a means of correcting uh, the predisposition to idleness. So that, that quote uh, I mentioned briefly, the worthy of freedom, you know, the view of freedom in that context is not what we would generally think of um, today. Thank you, John. Cindy, uh, is there anything you want to add? Uh, no, but I want to ask a question, so I'll oh, wait okay. to see how many are out good. there first. That's I'm, good. So <laughs> are there any uh, from the audience, another round, or you? OK, we have time for two questions, no, yours and, and that one. So Anthony. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. I was hoping you could uh, reflect on the ways that, in the aftermath of abolition, migration and the importation of new labor served as a mechanism to marginalize uh, formerly enslaved and now emancipated peoples. I'm thinking of the example of Brazil, where after 1888, uh, the abolition of slavery, uh, we see the importation of Southern Europeans um, as a way to uh, replace black labor and to whiten the labor force. And um, I was interested in if we see this kind of phenomenon occurring in other contexts. Thank you, Anthony. And then Cindy, and then we close. Your question, Cindy, and then oh, we yeah, go back I, to I, 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 you. <laughs> I was going to say there's lots of evidence of the, the same phenomenon here in the U.S. So uh, Moon Ho Jung's book on um, uh, the importation of, of Chinese indentured workers into the Louisiana area after emancipation is a similar example. And then there's a there's a, an immigrant train that drives around mm -hmm. the South trying to uh, encourage the importation of immigrants from Europe to supplant African Americans. It doesn't work, of course, but it's the same idea. Uh, so my question was about the is the the issue of um, regulation and enforcement. Um, so I was thinking of Sochi's point earlier about there being only 2,000 
um, labor inspectors around the country. And if you, let's say there was magical funding that came from a, you know, above, and that was increased tenfold, that's still nowhere near enough people to visit every farm, every workplace. Um, so I wonder what you think, in, when you're writing about this stuff, how you think in terms of solutions. Um, I know it's a total counterfactual question, but it, it, I get asked this all the time. So what does a good guest worker program look like? Yeah. And you know, my first answer is always, well, open the borders, that would be better. And then people look at me like, we didn't want a John Lennon song, right? We wanted <laughs> policy, like what do I write in the legislation? Uh, and so I've been thinking about this for years, so I wonder what you guys think. Thank you, Cindy. Just to help the panelists answer, just let me clarify that the ILO condemns the U.S. because ILO says that the U.S. doesn't have enough. <laughs> so ILO says that we are yeah. outside of the norm. So go back to John and Yvonne, who wants to close. Okay, okay. yeah, why not? May I address your question, which I think is fantastic. Um, um, so while in theory the, the purpose of this regulated migration wasn't to replace um, freed people, the, former workers. In practice, it, it did have a, a, a kind of effect like that over time. And I think the key, there's a lot more to say, but it's sort of key distinction is that freed people were able to bargain um, and to alter their relationship to the plantations in particular um, in a way which indenture by design, um, uh, the, the whole legal apparatus surrounding indenture was designed to prevent people from doing that. That created a kind of, um, uh, eventually, a kind of class-based conflict that was transposed into race in some of these um, places. But for instance, when um, freed people went on strike to demand higher wages, um, the, the planter's solution was to rely increasingly on indentured workers who could not go on strike. The, you know, the punishment for illegal absence, any sort of striking counted as illegal absence, was imprisonment. Um, and imprisonment with some form of labor attached to it generally. And then in terms of Brazil, I think it would be fantastic to have greater dialogue generally between work on um, uh, emancipation in Brazil and emancipation in this context, both because of the timing and, and, and the question of uh, Brazilian slavery is very much on the mind of uh, many of those in the British context before abolition happens in Brazil. Later on, I think there's some different dynamics where there's some purposeful whitening projects and sort of, you know, uh, there are some, I think, distinctive elements to the kinds of migration that, that you were signaling in Brazil, um, as well as some potential similarities. Um, Cindy asks a really great question about regulation and enforcement. I also get asked this question a lot. Um, very recently, I feel like I've been asked this question because of the New York Times reporting on migrant child labor. The history that I study shows me that things like regulation and enforcement and increased prosecution uh, result in the prosecution of migrant parents rather than corporations. They act with a lot of impunity. They have a lot of political influence. There was even a Washington Post um, article pretty recently uh, that demonstrated demonstrates that this is still the case. Um, it's, it was like a really close study of a Guatemalan girl who was um, uh, exploited um, and who's, who um, unfortunately, like in her case, her parents were the ones who ended up getting punished for what was happening, for not taking her to school, for like um, subjecting her to the dangers of, of migration. Um, it seems to me that the only answer here is to force policymakers to open up pathways to lawful entry, to, to safe entry. Um, otherwise, uh, people will continue to have to pursue clandestine routes, um, routes in which unscrupulous actors might take advantage of them. I mean, I'm, I'm on the same page as, as Cindy. Um, opening up the borders is the solution. <laughs> Thank you very much. So this concludes the panel. Please give a warm applause to all panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>
presentation and see okay, it's there. We already double checked. Okay. Missing one percent She's here. She was around. Maybe you can start because they said that we were sharp. So you can go ahead. Okay, so I'll introduce you see Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. Okay, hey, hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, we are going to get started. Um, our presenters today have a set of amazing papers for us to enjoy, and so without further ado, um, uh, we will begin with Dr. Alvarez Velasco. Dr. Alvarez Velasco is an assistant professor um, at UIC. Her research analyzes the interrelationship between mobility, control, and spatial transformations across the Americas. She is the author of the book, Frontera Sur Chapaneca, El Muro Humano de la Violencia. She founded and co-coordinated the Transnational Digital Project in Mobilities in the Americas in COVID-19, and she is a member of Colectiva Infancia, an international research network specialized in children migration across the Americas. Please give her a warm welcome. Uh, how do I? How do we get the presentation? Okay, good morning everyone. The tension between human migrations and the border regimes that impede or propel those mobilities is one of the most complex conflicts of our time. Um, fueled by economic misery and growing, in, and growing violence, an increased number of irregularized transit migrants have reached the Mexico-US border in the post-pandemic era. By October 2021, 1.7 million migrants from 160 countries were encountered at this border. By October 2022, that figure doubled. Some were transcontinental migrants coming from India, Bangladesh, or Cameroon, while others were intra-regional migrants from Cuba, Haiti, Brazil, Ecuador, or Venezuela. They have joined those traditionally coming from Mexico and Central America, who together press against one of the most lethal borders worldwide in their relentless effort to enter the US. Those migrants, diverse in ages, genders, race, ethnicity, and class, do not arrive overnight, let alone safely or directly. On the contrary, they accumulate experiences of violent and lawful transits across Latin American borders. Since they depart by air, land, and sea routes from their homelands, they might have been transiting for days, weeks, or years. Some might have been dwelling in South America where they sought for a safe haven which never arrived. That's why they decided to re-immigrate. Once they get on their way, they move and wait. They get stuck and transit. They regularize journeys are an ongoing spatial struggle that unfolds between a continuum of mobility, immobility, and immobilizations. Migration temporalities have become prominent within migration studies. Sharam Khosravi, William Walters, and many critical thinkers have called to overcome the mobility bias, overemphasizing mobile experiences, ignoring migrants' immobilities and immobilizations, and the enmeshed infrastructures. In mobilities might result from the autonomous decision of migrants to strategically stop en route, while immobilizations from the exercise of power to reduce migrants in freedom of movement. This call arises within a global anti-racist, I'm, I'm sorry, with a global racist anti-migrant turn, which has seen the state expand its capacity to detain and immobilize racialized migrant bodies or to externalize borders as hegemonic powers such as the US do, confining migrants to border entrapments and slow deaths. 
Immobilities and immobilizations do not only result from state's repressive apparatus. By focusing on the dynamics of the Andean region and Central America corridor, and inspired by this call, today I will explain the politics of immobilities present in some private places and transit infrastructures. Bodegas, hotels, and casas de seguridad are private places located around border towns and land routes where migrants are temporarily hold as part of the modus operandi of unlawful transits to the United States, dominated by coyotes, paracos, or paramilitaries, in collision with border agents. While being a means of transport, camiones, on the other hand, also hold migrants while crossing borders here, truck drivers operate colluded with border agents. This is an initial approach based on my multi-sided ethnographic work conducted across the Ecuador-Colombia border and on the reconstruction of Latin American, Caribbean, and African migrants' trajectories since 2016. I propose two interconnected arguments. First, that bodegas, casas de seguridad, hotels, and camiones, far from simply being containers of migrants waiting en route, are socially built sites of power, and in the case of camiones, mobile sites of power, within heterogeneous strategies of migrations and border regimes. I also argue that waiting time or immobility is not a passive phase of migration, but utterly productive. Productive because it is when migrants strategize to sustain their mobilities, and productive because those sites are part of highly lucrative border economies where legal, illegal, licit, illicit economic practices gain value around the extraction of migrants' time. If those sites take part in controlling migrant mobility, it should be explained as an effect of the punitive turn in migration operating since last decade in the Andean region, <clears throat> as well as its accelerated impoverishment. That is why the sites, as I will show, are embedded in the political economy of the analyzed migratory corridor, having simultaneously repressive and productive effects. In what follows, I will explain the role that the Andean region in plays in the geography of migration of the Americas, then I share empirical evidence to illuminate my two arguments, to close with some final remarks on what the immobilization of transit migrants to private hands alerts us about our abject present. The immobilities and immobilizations that I study are inexplicable outside the changing migration and control patterns of the Andean region and more broadly speaking of South America. From being migrant sending countries in the past two decades, most South American countries also became migration receptacles and global transit spaces. Systemic inequality, wartime conflicts, ecological devastation, and fortress US and Europe converged to explain the arrivals of African, Asian, and Caribbean migrants, mainly from Cuba, Haiti, and the DR to South America. If those mobilities had changed migratory patterns, the Venezuelan exodus of more than 7 million people would definitely disrupt it. In this changing pattern, South American migratory legal openness, between quotes, has been pivotal. Most South American legal frameworks claim to guarantee, amongst other rights, the freedom of movement and the right to asylum. This explains why, in the past decade, global migrants reached South America to seek asylum, to try their luck, or to transit from there to the US. As these migrations augmented, a regional transit and selective punitive turn unfolded, materialized in restrictive immigration policies, blockages to asylum, deportations, and the reign position of visas to global South countries, measures also intended to curb down arrivals of impoverished and wanted migrants and asylum seekers to the US. Unlike what has happened between the US and Mexico 
uh, which together maintained the most extensive migrant detention system worldwide, until now, in the Andean region, there are no formal migrant detention systems. Yet, this does not mean that other private places operate in the temporary immobilization of migrants, as I will now explain. Irregularized Caribbean, African, and Asian migrants can cross the Ecuador-Colombia border by paying camiones. For the past decade, for the past 30 years, I'm sorry, Darío, a truck driver, runs up his salary crossing people. Depending on the Colombian destination, this takes him from two to 10 hours. If he gets stopped, he uses codes. He says, I tell Colombian cops that I have tornillitos. This is how they know that I carry migrants. Then I pay them $50 to pass. Darío has crossed Asians, Bangladeshi, Chinese, Cubans, and African charging them $30. He only carries small groups, instructing them to be quiet and to move as little as possible. Migrant recounts confirm that while immobile in camiones, they often pray, they do not speak, and when they do so, it is to get information about the journey. If there is a shared aim between transit migrants, it is to reach Necocli or Turbo, two highly crowded Colombian border towns, the last ones before crossing the Caribbean Sea, to later enter the dangerous Darien jungle en route to the US via Panama. To advance in this convulsive route, paradoxically, they must wait. And they do so in modest border hotels. Self-guided migrants transiting in groups or with families stop for days in hotels. This happens when they wait to get wire transfers or raise money. In Ecuador, for example, migrants stop to work in the hyper-precarious, informalized, but dollarized economy. Hotels become thus migrants' temporary houses where they rest, take care, share food, charge phones, activate transnational communications, and download information which is pivotal for their route. Amadora, a Venezuelan migrant, asserted that to afford hotels' price, migrants make cooperachas, a collective payment, negotiate and pay the hotel manager to get a reasonable price. Coyotes also pay hotel managers not to denounce what they are temporarily immobilizing migrants in hotel rooms while retaining their passports. This is how migrant smuggling is experienced by African, Caribbean, or Asian migrants who pay up $1,000 to be crossed from Ecuador to Necocli. Bodegas also hold migrants. According to residents in the Amazonian border, this Rented warehouses are managed by enganchadores or middlemen working with coyotes to identify potential clients within migrants. There, contraband of gas, home appliances, or drugs are also kept. This is why bodegas are fearful waiting places for migrants. Casas de Seguridad, lastly, is an euphemism to name private houses where migrants are immobilized by coyotes for days until new payments are made and transits are resumed. The Mexico-US corridor, as you know, is swamped by Casas de Seguridad. In the Andean region, Central America corridor, so far, the most recurrently identified Casa de Seguridad is a private infrastructure at the foot of the Darien jungle. La Finca de Arcandí, where hundreds of global migrants are kept. The account of Dennis, a 24-year-old Ecuadorian migrant, is revealing. We were taken to this finca after crossing the sea. Guides put a handle around our wrists and a, pain, and a payment sign, as a payment sign. I met migrants from India, Peru, Africa, Venezuela, and Ecuador. We spent two nights before entering the Darien. Denise's descriptions portrayed a sort of Tower of Babel within lush nature. Global migrants waited while wa organizing routes, grouping, and negotiating with guides. Complex logistics coordinated by guides also unfolded to provide food, plastic tents, and information. Denise described how a job market unfolded while they waited. Charging between 10 to $50, Venezuelans who had crossed the Darien offer services including protection and guidance, being maleteros or luggage carriers, and even carriers of children when crossing the jungle. Denise paid $300.
he waited with approximately 700 migrants. You can multiply it and get an idea of the million dollar amount of money that migrants in mobilities produced. I asked Denise if while waiting there were signs of state authority. There are only paracos, he replied. Paracos are paramilitaries of the formerly Autodefensas Gaitanistas de Colombia, today part of the Clan del Golfo, the largest drug trafficking gang in the Andean region, an hegemonic armed actor interacting with migrant smuggling networks. This suggests that in this region, irregularized transit migration management, it's not only in private hands, but is part of criminalized governance, which, as our colleague Andreas Feldman studies, flourishes in spaces with low or new state presence, or where that presence is colluded with illegalized practices. To close, hotels, bodegas, casas de seguridad, and camiones share three features. First, they are sites founded on an exercise of power to repress migrants' mobilities. Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about the prison fixity to unveil how unfreedom is the extraction of the one non-renewable source, time, to produce value. Not being prisons, these sites are spatiotemporal fixities that also operate by extracting migrants' time to produce exchange value, entering into circulation as part of the political economy of the aesthetic corridor. Second, the, politic, the politics of immobilities in those places have therefore a repressive and productive effect. They repress mobility while producing value, not only economic value, but social value. Care, solidarity, knowledge to strategize, negotiate, and resist such complex journeys. Third, what happens inside those private sites remains an enigma. No one really knows how many migrants are extorted, physically and emotionally abused, have disappeared or died. Those sites fall into a gray zone, which, as Agamben points out, is the characteristic of the state of exception, where confined to the right of having no rights, the migrant life survives only by grouping and caring for each other. And I finish with this. This is an in initial analysis that signals that against trans irregularized transit migration, Andean states seem to have ceded the management of this type of migration to private hands subsumed in criminalized governance. By not intervening to protect migrants' lives, not to create decent jobs, those states ultimately confine migrants and asylum seekers from impoverished Latin American, Caribbean, Asian, and African countries to a slow and premature deaths. In this present time of intensifying systemic contradictions, the migrant struggle is added to that of many other social movements across the Americas, which are claiming for a radical transformation against the accelerated destruction of life. Decisively accompanying and making visible that struggle should be part of our critical and committed research. Migrants won't stop to move and wait as part of a special struggle to be alive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez Velasco. Our next presenter is Dr. William Walters. Um, Dr. Walters is a professor of political sociology at Carleton University, Ottawa, Canada. His main research interests are secrecy and security, borders and migration, and mobility in politics. Recent publications include uh, State Secrecy and Security, Reconfiguring the Covert Imaginary, Biopolitics, Borders, Migration, and the Power of Locomotion, and the forthcoming Handbook on Governmentality. Uh, from 2017 to 2022, he directed the Air Deportation Project, a multi-country inquiry um, into the aerial geography, geographies of forced removal and expulsion in and from Europe. Please welcome him. I'm just looking for my slides. Can I help? I yeah. can help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction, and thank you very much to the organizers uh, for this uh, kind invitation. I've really enjoyed the presentation so far. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so my, uh, there's a structure of my what I'd like to talk about today. Um, it talks kind of based around a paper that's almost finished, and I send it off to the journal Mobility. <coughs> um, and, but I also expand a little bit uh, for, for today by talking a bit more broadly about um, what I mean by air deportation. Um, so I want to start with a, with a vignette um, that I you know, expand on in the paper, and it concerns a controversy that surrounded the UK's attempt to deport 50 men, all male, to Jamaica on a, on, on a charter flight in November, December 2020. And there are several angles of this immigration controversy um, that could be followed. One that I um, talk about a little bit in the paper is the absent presence of race, uh, to, to borrow a, a term from uh, the uh, Dutch uh, anthropologist Amade Macharek. Um, what I do follow in the, in the paper, and it overlaps with the question of the absent presence of race, is um, how the plane mediates this controversy. Um, and I think that the plane became a kind of complex uh, mediator in, in several ways over the fate of the people um, threatened with expulsion. So in social media networks, um, the plane served as a way to symbolize deportation. And, and it was used on all sides of the struggles, sort of both pro-deportation and anti-deportation. So the plane was very visible here, and it is in all sorts of other situations, as a kind of political metonym, you know, the part that stands in for the whole. Um, but the, place, the, the plane also figured as a site of, of material politics. Um, so, for example, there was this letter written by 82 prominent black British public figures urging airlines not to accept the Home Office's contract to conduct the deportation. So they were trying to... To, to name and shame the airlines and to sort of, you know, mobilize public um, unrest and, and, and antipathy around the airlines as a way to sort of actually politically intervene in the struggle. And that's worked in some cases. For example, Virgin Airlines no longer uh, uh, conducts deportations from the UK and at various times other airlines have pulled out of it. So I open with this vignette as a way of tabling this sort of wider question of aviation and deportation. My claim is that there's a gap between the way we follow and perhaps participate in a controversy like the Jamaica 50 as publics and activists, and the way that most scholars theorize and think about deportation. What is this gap? Well, I think that with the Jamaica 50, and as with many other mobilizations and anti-deportation protests, airlines and airports feature very prominently in the public imagination of deportation, and in actions against uh, opposing the, the, this particular enforcement practice. Whereas when we look at a great deal of the scholarship on deportation, um, aviation is really quite marginal. It only ever appears usually quite incidentally. And as I've argued elsewhere, the um, forced removal, removal of illegalized people and rejected asylum seekers from the countries of the global north is absolutely dependent on um, a whole infrastructure of planes, airports, air crews, flight routes, seat markets, travel agents, aviation norms and laws, and so on. So without this heterogeneous world of air power uh, the, and the particular castle geographies that it enacts, policies of so-called removal and return would be inconceivable in their present form. Yet scholars um, have rarely examined civil aviation as a technology of deportation. One exception is the work of Deborah Weissman at UNC and her, her colleagues who've made a similar point about uh, writing about ice air in, in the United States. So I share their call to move the study of deportation beyond uh, uh, seeing it as a legal concept and think about it as a physical act, one in which systems of commercial aviation are pivotal. Um, so the, the paper's partly a call to take air deportation more seriously. And let me give a little bit of context for that term. Like we have a, 
boat migration has become a sort of widely used, recognized concept, both in academic writing and in public discourse. And for good reason. Like we come to recognize the way in which um, maritime laws, maritime spaces, boats have become absolutely sort of life and death questions and zones and struggles. Um, so boat migration is, is, you know, recognizes that the sort of material geographies and infrastructures of, of seas and oceanic movements are, are an integral part of how uh, migration is policed and contested uh, in the present. But not so when we think about deportation. We have a sort of largely immaterial approach, almost as though, you know, people are perhaps moved by, like, transporter beams. So, you know, we, there's a lot of writing and obviously investigation into detention, but nothing like that around the actual aviation systems. So that's what this um, my five-year project on air deportation has been trying to sort of address that imbalance somewhat. So one of the fruits of this work is a special issue that recently came out with the French-based journal uh, Anti-Atlas. It's uh, open source, so anyone can, can go to it. And we've brought together some very interesting works from a variety of scholars, activists, um, critical geographers, uh, journalists, and so on. So I encourage people to look at that if they're interested in some of the findings of the project. So that's a little bit about the background to the project. I'm not going to talk about sort of air deportation in general because the sort of term can encompass many different aspects. I'm going to sort of zoom in on one particular aspect, which is the UK's um, charter flight program. And uh, I'm going to offer a little bit of a st statistical portrait um, before sort of zooming in on a few um, sort of concepts. So you can see from, and, and all of this data is, I've, I've generated it from freedom of information um, requests, um, requests that have mostly been made by uh, investigative journalists and activists, but are kind of in the public domain. Because one of the things about the UK's charter flight program is it's really quite secretive. You know, there's a, there's a real dearth of kind of publicly available information or data about it. So, I mean, for example, overall we know, I mean, I've seen a figure that, Germany, you know, about 95% of its deportations in total are by air. There's no figure for the UK, but the Home Office says, you know, we don't publish or collect data about mode of transport uh, for, uh, for, for reasons of cost. So we don't know the precise figures of deportations overall from the UK, but probably a bit like Germany, they're in around 90%. So the aviation is absolutely central. But if we're looking specifically at charter flights in relationship to all enforced deportations, we can see that they are a, a minor phenomenon, but they're, but they're sort of crucial in, in a lot of ways for the kind of long shadow that they cast across the deportation uh, regime. You can see there that, that the numbers sort of drop in, in around 2019, and they've started to tick up again very recently. And when we sort of break it down, well, here's the sort of sense of how the, uh, how the the distribution of, of, of number of flights here is shown in, in purple. You can see it was really high in the 2010, although nowhere near, you know, if, if compared to the sort of uh, aviation system that the United States operates. Then it falls off, um, and then it really ramps up uh, 2019, 2020. Um, and this really coincides with a changing sort of geography of this charter flight program. Um, so you can see here in its early years, and it, it, it kind of began in 2001, but the, the sort of the, the data set that I've been able to assemble really kind of starts in 2010. So you can see that early on this charter flight program is very much focused on uh, countries like Afghanistan, which is marked there in, in, in black, um, Nigeria, which is the green and white stripes, and, and then Albania, and you can see Albania is the one country that sort of runs throughout this program. It's sort of the one constant uh, of the uh, deportation charter program. What you can see by about 2019, 2020 is a, very much a change in the geography. There's a kind of Europeanization mm. of the charter flight program in terms of the destinations. And this very much coincides with Brexit on the one hand. Um, there's a sort of real push into... In, in 2020 to sort of expel people just before the Dublin Convention, um, which is the, 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 the EU convention that allowed states to expel to third countries, you know, to countries where um, it could be 
it was deemed that their asylum hearing ought to take place. So there's a real push then um, to, to, to sort of utilize the Dublin Convention before Britain leaves the EU at the end of the 2020. There's also um, a con sort of concerted program related to the, 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 the arrival of the boats coming across the channel, which becomes this sort of huge public spectacle, a border spectacle around this time as well. So you have politicians sort of saying, we're committed to sending back a thousand uh, people who've arrived on small boats. And so there, there's this sort of, you set up this kind of dynamic between the plane and the boat. The, the, this charter flight program doesn't correspond or map neatly onto the distribution of the, of the nationalities and the citizenships uh, who, who, who experience uh, deportation uh, the most from the UK. So what you can see, uh, and that's sort of the, the, the light brown uh, columns are, are people of Indian nationality. The yellow and red um, uh, columns are people with Chinese nationality. They're by far the largest numbers proportionately and absolutely of people being expelled. But there are no charter flights to either India or China. So it really tells you something about the sort of geopolitics of this program. It's about the, the UK's power to, to, to build roots. And this speaks a little to, to what John was talking about earlier, about empire and, and learning and, 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 and how methods of forced movement kind of travel within uh, empire or in neo-imperial spaces. So if we go back to you know, we see maps all the time of mm -hmm. migration routes. And I've called this a sort of ingression bias. We're always seeing, you know, the, the, the lines and the movements and the arrows showing how people are purported to cross borders uh, illegally. But if you type deportation routes into Google image, what you get are either uh, maps uh, or images from the Holocaust, or maybe you get historic maps of, say, the Britain's deportation of Acadians from uh, uh, the Atlantic provinces, what's today Nova Scotia, to, to, to Louisiana. There's very little in the way of sort of images or visualization of, de of deportation as a movement. So part of the project, in a way, is I'm looking at deportation routes. How do you construct deportation routes? And the UK, sometimes in, in, in parliamentary hearings, kind of boasts about, well, we've been very sort of successful at, at, uh, at creating deportation routes to difficult countries. And there they sort of mean, say, Afghanistan or Iraq in the early 2010s. And they talk about how other European partners have been keen to sort of learn about how you build a deportation route. Um, the, the paper kind of engages with the, some of the sort of science and technology studies literature and the castle geographies literature to think about develop some concepts of thinking about you know, power and struggle within this world. And I'm not sort of going to unpack that a lot, but what I want to do is sort of highlight three, um, well, I mean, I talk about both the affordances and the encumbrances of aviation. And one of the affordances is obviously speed and reach. And we haven't sort of really appreciated or grappled with you know, how aviation transforms deportation, how it really does internationalize and globalize it compared to, say, when you're tied to, to rails or when you're tied to ships. Um, so it creates a, a sort of new geography of deportation, and uh, aviation sort of empowers the state in, in, in various ways. But it comes at a cost. You know, this, this ability to move people quickly over vast spaces, is, it comes at a cost. And, and in the case of the charter flights, it's literally, you know, the cost of chartering a plane. So once you charter a whole plane, you have seats to fill. And you've sold this program to the public on the grounds that, well, it's cost effective, mm -hmm. it's efficient, it's about saving you tax, mm -hmm. uh, saving you, 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 your, your tax money. So you sell it as a program that's all about efficiency and, and, and volume and large numbers, you know, sending them back kind of discourse. But then you have the problem of how do you fill the seats? Because, you know, it happens that deportation is, is, is entangled in law. And people facing deportation have various rights of appeals. So frequently, the, the media gets hold of stories about, well, there were only, you know, 10, only 10 people on this flight that was supposed to take 100 people. And this becomes a scandal in its own right. So it puts the Home Office under a lot of pressure. So what we find is, is what I call in the paper workarounds or fixes. So this is really a way of also sort of thinking about mutation 
in deportation. How this deportation is not a sort of singular or homogeneous thing or practice, it's constantly changing. And by looking, you know, by zero, or zooming in on these little details, we, we sort of see these changes that are perhaps otherwise missed. And that was one reason that the Amada data source is inspection reports. Um, and I use them as a kind of what Foucault would call an archive, you know, where you've got a series and you can <coughs> sort of trace little changes. Um, so some of the workarounds, one of them is special arrangements, which is where, you know, if you're being deported on a regular plane, um, if you have a judicial review going on, then you have a deferral of your, removement, uh, uh, of your removal. Whereas if you're on a charter flight, the Home Office in its letter to you says, because of the cost of, of, of the charter flight and because of the complexity and the logistics, um, you, a, a judicial review will not be sufficient to, to defer your removal. You can only defer your deportation if you get a court injunction, which is a much higher uh, bar to sort of jump over. Um, another workaround is, is the reserves, which was a sort of status of person that was only discovered by the inspectors. This was initially being done covertly by the Home Office. Um, and it's like a standby. You know, you're taken to the plane. You don't even realize that you're a standby deportee. Uh, you might fly. If the seat opens up, you might not. And the last one, which is the most, is the one that the Home Office doesn't uh, admit to, but it's sort of documented in media reports and freedom of information requests, is, is a roundup where you're literally going out to arrest people because you have a plane chartered and lined up to a particular country. So it completely turns the sort of legal concept of deportation on its head. Mm -hmm. You know, it's meant to be a case-by-case -case thing. It's not about nationalities. But here we see the sort of logistics of the regime changing the sort of legal uh, and, and philosophical ideas of deportation. So in other words, and this would be my conclusion, there's a sort of materiality to this sort of aviation aspect. It's not merely something that puts a legal and political phenomenon into effect. It has a sort of irreducibility in its own right that reshapes what deportation is, mm -hmm. what it means, how it appears. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Walters. And our third and final presenter for this panel is Dr. Patricia Macias Rojas. Um, Dr. Macias Rojas is an associate professor in sociology and Latin American and Latino studies at UIC. Her main research interests are the areas of race, migration, and borders, and the global politics of punishment. She is the author of From Deportation to Prison, The Politics of Migration Enforcement in Post-Civil Rights America, which won the Oliver Cromwell Cox Book Award from the American Sociological Association. Please welcome her. Beautiful UIC colleagues, Andreas, Esther, <laughs> Jennifer, I feel in good company. Lori, I think Schaffner is looking. Um, so, okay, yeah, that's often the case with me. Okay, so I'll get started. Um, so, so basically, um, I have been studying uh, US-Mexico border enforcement and the connections between punishment and mobility for over two decades, mostly through a combination of ethnographic observation and history that I'm in, intrigued by the, by the interplay of both. Um, and so that said, what I'm presenting today is actually a work in progress. It's, it's for um, a new project that's in its early stages. Um, I uh, have returned to the field site after 20 years, 20 years after the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. And so I am uh, sort of 
prepared these remarks because I, they're helping me to think through the ideas that are shaping the project. So again, work in progress. <laughs> oh my goodness, I just saw my, my child. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so here we go, deep breaths. So, so the recent fatal fire in a detention facility in Ciudad Juarez points to a deep historical connection between punishment and mobility. Punishment and mobility have a shared lineage that was actually separated and obscured after the abolition of slavery. And so despite this historical connection, the way that we study mobility and punishment today is as separate concepts that derive from separate laws, think immigration, criminal law, that derive from separate institutions, think the immigration system, the criminal legal system, uh, even though they share similar logics. So this is a really complex history, uh, but what I want you to remember is that after the abolition of slavery, two distinct narratives of mobility emerge. And here I'm talking about the US, of course. Um, I know we have a global focus here. Um, so, so two distinct narratives of mobility emerge. One is the more familiar dominant narrative of mobility that's based on this idea that this is a nation of immigrants. It's based on an image of the migrant as a settler founder. It's based on the idea of free white labor. It's based on the idea of liberal egalitarian ideals of being able to move freely. And so if you look up mobility, this is the definition that you get. Uh, this, this ability to move from one position or situation or place to another. And, and it carries with it the assumption that it's usually a, a better one, that you're usually moving to a better place or a better situation. Mm -hmm. So that's one narrative. The other narrative of mobility is actually based on immobility. Mm -hmm. So it's based on, as you know, this history of unfree labor and enslavement. It's based on a history of race and caste. It's based on a history of criminal stigma, a type of stigma, I should add, that no other uh, country in the world has, where if you commit a crime, you are a non-person. Um, so it's based on the history, it's based on this criminal stigma that was used to keep people in place and to maintain a racial order after the, the abolition of slavery. So I'm, I'm not going into more detail here, um, only to stress that these two narratives share a history that has been obscured. So the concepts we use to talk about migration and borders, and even race and borders, are embedded in this racial history and the ways in which mobility and punishment were separated into these different trajectories. And as such, they're limited, really, in helping us to analyze the punitive turn in border controls. Mm -hmm. They limit our ability to truly analyze borders through a lens of race and punishment because we only draw on these traditional narratives of mobility, this nation of immigrants model, that conceals a deeper racial history and past. And so the concepts we use to talk about the punitive turn in border controls are based on these narratives of mobility um, that really <coughs> derive from the experiences of free white settlers, right, of European um, settlers who, who settled in, in the 13 colonies. And so our core concepts in the scholarship on migration and borders are often rooted in ideas of independence, of access to land, of mobility, 
of social rights, of integration. Um, whereas in the scholarship on race and punishment, the core concepts often derive from this concealed history of unfree labor, of dependency, of, of mobility and stigma and political exclusion. And so when we think about core concepts in the study of borders and border controls, you could say in a way that they fall somewhere in between um, these two narratives. Um, so this traditional narrative and this, this narrative of mobility, this narrative of immobility. Um, but often um, the way scholars analyze border controls is through a model of mobility, again, that is rooted in, that was created for the experiences of white settlers. But in actuality, um, border controls, as we've seen, are more akin to punishment. They align more with this other history that we typically don't use to analyze them and are actually you know, rooted and based and stem from these experiences of unfree labor and these early debates around free and unfree labor after the abolition of slavery. And so that history of slavery uh, and the aftermath of slavery really shapes how we understand borders. Um, the ways in which borders developed as a field of study um, the way we talk about borders, the way we think about borders, the way we write about borders derives from this history um, that sh when transportation and punishment were entwined and then separate, which mm. our colleague William Walters um, and uh, my colleague Soledad uh, um, touch upon. So in other words, they derive from this shared lineage when mobility and punishment were blurred and entangled and then separated under a new racial order. So borders are actually embedded and steeped in this racial history, uh, but are often analyzed through core concepts that are, that are pretty often devoid of any analysis of race. Borders are often analyzed through core concepts of territory, sovereignty and citizenship that appear on the surface not to be about race at all. Mm -hmm. And so borders, um, you know, again, are, are often analyzed more through this, through this other nation of immigrants model. So in this new project, I've been returning and drawing on critical race theory as a <laughs> framework to reimagine and rethink core concepts in borders through a lens of race and punishment. And I'm, I'm not gonna get into that intellectual, it's a fascinating intellectual history um, and intellectual lineage, um, but the text that I'm clinging to right now is that of um, W.E.B. Du Bois's mm -hmm. Black Reconstruction. Um, and so um, CRT, um, and, and I should say that Du Bois is one of the intellectual and, and antecedents of, of critical race theory. So, so CRT gives us an alternative reading of borders it allows us to see how core concepts of, top, of, of territory, sovereignty, and citizenship are actually racially embedded. If we look at the border through, and border controls through a lens of race historically, and if we situate it in this history, then we, we can reimagine how we talk and think about, about borders. And so CRT, for me, um, it taps into this logic of the border that has been overlooked. Um, this logic of, of borders functioning more like punishment. And so the traditional view um, is to look at borders through this traditional lens of mobility. I mean, think about it. Borders are often thought about, okay, they regulate unwanted migration or they regulate entry and exit. To me, that comes from a particular model um, of migration. Um, and so, so the traditional view is to think about it as, as, as more akin to the management of mobility and migration to the regulation of entry and exit. This is a story that's devoid of, of race, although you know, there are really important scholars that have brought in race back in. But, but this conceals the way you know, borders share a history with punishment, uh, um, and particularly that history when punishment and mobility were entangled. And I'm referring here 
you know, to, to a, a topic that's already been covered earlier um, on the forced mobility of paupers, um, of poor people and, and convicts, right, to populate this land, to cultivate it, to settle it at the, at the expense of indigenous peoples. And so CRT brings that hidden history into focus. It brings into focus that racial history that's buried, that history when mobility and punishment were entwined but became severed and racially separated under a new racial order. It brings into focus core aspects of borders that have seldom received full attention, aspects of border controls specifically designed to contain and confine, right, that are more akin to immobility than to mobility. And so one sort of uh, core aspect or this one function of borders that has been given less attention and that's highlighted when we look through this lens is the way borders actually function to disrupt settlement. And this is, I'm wrapping up here. Um, and to keep people on the move, as a, a co-author co um, uh, has, has written. Um, and so this is a different way of thinking about borders than simply talking about the regulation of exit uh, and entry or restricting unwanted migrants. Um, for much of the history of the US-Mexico border, border controls have functioned to disrupt settlement. And so the best example is the history of policing of Mexicans on the US-Mexico border, but it also, the logic also applies to Chinese immigrants during um, the era of Chinese exclusion. There's a really interesting book, Racial um, Reconstruction, that looks at this, it's super interesting. Anyway, I, so I would argue um, that it also even helps us to understand the logic of what we're seeing to, today of the busloads of people you know, being brought, you know, to Martha's Vineyard, to Chicago. Um, um, and, uh, but the historical function, I guess to, to come back to the point here, the historical function of the US-Mexico border has been to facilitate, not to restrict, but to facilitate a temporary flow of labor without settlement or claims to land. And so again, notice this is, this is different from the traditional model of European migrants who were allowed to settle, who were given access to land and social rights. That's not what the logic and the history of the US-Mexico border has been. So I'll say it again, the historical function of the US-Mexico border has been to facilitate temporary flow of labor without settlement or claims to land. And so border controls have explicitly functioned to disrupt settlement. Um, and this function has been explicitly stated in early border patrol handbooks, and that just stuck with me, seeing um, that in the training of border, um, board, early border patrol handbooks just has sort of stuck with me because it, it connected with what I was seeing on the ground where um, Mexicans and Latin American migrants are allowed to enter through a voluntary departure system, right? But with, again, without, without settlement and then experiencing that constant disruption, that constant di dislocation, that constant um, uh, a sort of fragmentation of networks. Um, and so um, what I also observed is that in bringing in unwanted labor, border controls were also targeting people with longer history of settlement. Um, and so this is what I've observed in my ethnographic work on border policing, um, but also we see it in, in the interior as well. So if we look at the case of Chicago, which I'll briefly mention, and we look at the history of Mexican migration to Chicago, and we have you know, our colleague in history to thank um, Latinos in Chicago for, for this really important work. So if we look at the history of Latinos in Chicago, um, it's, it's interesting because Mexicans here in Chicago don't experience the same kind of hyper-segregation that African Americans have experienced, right? It's in the literature. But what's interesting and what Lilia Fernandez's work shows is that Latinos, the way that we've experienced um, sort of segregation is through dislocation, is through disruption of settlement, is through gentrification. It's this, this constant sort of uprooting um, and, and just this inability to allow us to establish roots so that we're constantly um, uh, thought of as foreigners when, when in fact we are not. And so, um, so and here I'm, I'm really drawing on my colleague Ralph Sintron's idea that I've, uh, in a conversation we had once about this idea of trans displacement. And so I'm playing around with this idea that this is one of the one of the logics of, of borders, this uh, dislocation, this displacement, this fragmentation 
of networks um, that this other model allows us to think about. So, so let me just wrap up. Um, so it's basically old way, what I'm trying to say here is that old ways of thinking about and studying borders aren't that relevant anymore. They conceal more than they illuminate because the frameworks themselves are rooted in a particular racial order, right? Uh, uh, based on this system of managing mobility created for free white ethnic free labor and one created for formerly enslaved uh, people. And so we need new frameworks to account for these shifts, right? Um, and so critical race theory offers ways to rethink old concepts and to better understand the connections between race, borders, and punishment. And so although borders are studied and analyzed apart from punishment, they actually have more in common, right, with scholarship on punishment. They share a logic with race and punishment. Borders um, derive from this concealed history when transportation and mobility were connected, then racially um, divided and separated. And so. All I'm trying to say is that we're stalled in our understanding, <laughs> that these old frameworks and concepts that we use to study borders and, and punishment um, are actually racialized. <laughs> They're embedded in this racial history in ways that we haven't come to terms with. And so we have to consider the sort of the racial history of these concepts and only then, I think, can we really deepen our understanding of the punitive turn in migration controls. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentations. We have approximately 18 minutes for questions and answers. And so I'd like to turn it over to you, to your questions. Hi there, I have a question for Soldad. I was wondering about the relationship between debt and this waiting period before migration. Uh, so many people who come to the US now and presumably in the past, um, are indebted not necessarily to the employer or even to the recruiter, right, but to the loan shark or even family members you borrow money for at sometimes incredible interest rates. Uh, so I wonder what the relationship is between that, that debt and, the, and how the problems of policing it when, when we have laws about debt peonage, but not about that. We call it. Uh, why don't we collect uh, two more questions and then turn it over to our panelists? Thank you. Do uh, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Soledad. Uh, I was wondering about the Darien region and the logics of uh, govern or governance there. Uh, that they have like, like an autonomous indigenous government, is a especially protected song for, 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 environmental, uh, for, for the environmental law in Panama. So I wonder if these two uh, considerations also contribute to make this space and a space of exception to some extent and, and how this thing works for people who is in transit there. And I, was, I have a question for William. And I was thinking in your intervention and <coughs> in how this uh, use of like these charter flights is actually contributing to modeling uh, a charter deportation model itself in the sense that uh, you were suggesting that uh, it is difficult to trace these deportation routes, but it's also difficult to trace the impacts of this uh, deportation process in the sense that in some cases, like following how it happened in the, in the States, uh, selling people, sending people back uh, to Central American countries, uh, these people, some of them were killed. They were running, from, running away from violence in some sense. They were returning to their own states, and they were killed in the process. Some children were misplaced in, in countries that they shouldn't be, should have been. So I, I, I wonder if this, uh, this is a debate in the UK too. Hi, thank you all. Uh, Patricia, I was wondering uh, if you see in your analysis of mobility, immobility, 
some room for uh, categories of uh, both property and wealth accumulation and the flows that are accepted uh, in those processes. So for instance, after Guadalupe Hidalgo, you have a change in the border and a massive transfer of property from Mexican-Americans to Anglo-Americans in California, in Arizona. So, so th there is something in terms of how we conceive mobility that has to do with how we understand uh, the wealth must flow, who gets to accumulate wealth, who doesn't, who is deprived of those opportunities. Thank you. Hello, yes. Uh, thank you for your questions. And I will start with the question of the debt. That's a very important piece of all of this. And I think that within um, studies of border regime, we have not paid much attention of how, in how the debt functions as a control um, mechanism too. Migrants before leaving their home uh, countries, they already get in debt with chulqueros, local uh, prestamistas. But while they are on journey, they have to also get in debt to continue their route. And how do they manage that? Usually they connect with their families and their families will get in debt too. So this means that there is a an end chain in depthness uh, along the route, which also alerts us on how the economic factor of all of this regime is playing a key role within uh, the control of mobility and immobility across the borders. Also, I would say that uh, debt also comes into play as part of the political economy of the migratory corridors, because not only chulqueros are lending money, but also uh, cooperativas, local co-ops of part of the financial system. So in local uh, villages, local towns in the Andes, for instance, they will lend money to people at high interests and also you have chulqueros. So this means that, again, this entanglement between the illegal, legal, licit, and illicit economy is playing a key role within the dynamics of mobilities and immobilities. And I think that paying attention to the debt opens up a new uh, picture of analysis and in the work that I've been doing, um, women are also the ones that are getting more in depth because they are the ones that stay at home or the ones that are starting to move across the same complex journey. So there, here you have a couple of new uh, research of avenue to be um, analyzed. And regarding the Darien, uh, Luis, uh, the Darien is such a, it's one of the most complex spaces nowadays across the Americas. One thing that we have to understand is that the Darien is now calling our attention, but people have been traversing across the Darien for decades and decades, and they have been negotiating with the indigenous groups that were living there, that are living there. So what I have found um, of the research, of the preliminary research that I've been doing, is that the changes in the dynamics of um, controlling this land, the la this land is the jungle, is the gap that connects South America with Central America, has been transformed uh, because the paramilitaries now have been subsumed under the Clan del Golfo. This means that they have negotiated with indigenous territories there to be in charge of one of the zones of the jungle. Uh, and m most of the narratives that I've been collecting for migrants that have been able to traverse the Darien is that once they negotiate and they pay the Paracos, as they say, uh, they can traverse the jungle following a couple of different uh, paths. Paths that are, uh, of course, not being controlled by any state authority. So your question about how, uh, how the state is not present there and how this idea that the Darien is a, uh, yeah, it's a, yes, like, what you said? Yeah, and a, set, and a state of exception, it's totally true. And here we need to uh, question what is the role that the Panamanian state is doing there, but also the Colombian state. I think that there is much to talk about it, and thank you for the question. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I, I would say that the, 
charter flight program has a kind of paradoxical visibility. So in, in certain operational ways, there's a lot of secrecy. So for example, um, if you're traveling on a regular <laughs> flight, you're told the time and place that you're leaving. If you're on a charter flight, you're just told this sort of two week window. And a lot of people report, you know, they're woken up in the middle of the night and, and taken out of the detention center. Uh, and, and they're in, you know, a terrible state of, 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 of anxiety and confusion. So there's, a, there's that kind of secrecy. Um, there's the fact that, you know, this was initially part of the program is about, well, the, the problem when people are on regular planes, you know, they can uh, disrupt the flight and hopefully, you know, a fellow passenger will intervene or the captain often will sort of say, no, the, the, this is actually not safe to, to, to carry this through. And, and they all ha have the deportee and the escorts removed from the plane. And this was one of the whole reasons for the charter program was to create this sort of avenue or this deportation corridor to use Hasselberg and drop bombs term, a new kind of deportation corridor that takes it away from the regular flight system. So there's all kinds of operational secrecies and invisibilities. But then you have um, these controversies, uh, 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 say around the Jamaica flights, and the flights to Jamaica are quite infrequent. There's probably been about five or six in the last 10 years, whereas there's flights to, to Albania sometimes every month. Uh, but the Jamaican ones, because of the kind of raw nerves that they set off, say, around rin Windrush, um, become really sort of uh, large-scale kind of public uh, controversies and, uh, and struggles. And, and so they become very visible. And, you know, you, you have um, then the beginnings of, of, of tracings of who is on this plane. So, I mean, let's say the work of of my colleague Luke de Narona, who's written a wonderful book called Deporting Black Britons, you know, which sort of uh, spends a lot of time with uh, people in Jamaica who've been uh, removed on, on, on charter flights, often hearing, you know, that basically I'm a national, I'm a citizen, that I was deported because, you know, the Home Office screwed up the paperwork of my, of my grandparents or something like that. Or the recent Esparto flights, which are these, you know, rapid uh, sort of accelerated drives to remove people who've, who've come on boats across the channel. And again, journalism then will follow sometimes the story of you know, a guy from Sudan who's been uh, sent back or sent to Frankfurt, for example, and then what ha wh where do the Germans then send him? So there is the beginnings of a sort of opening up, and that kind of resonates with the kind of literature, the turn towards a kind of post-deportation, uh, you know, like our, our, our colleague um, Sharam Khosravi, the, the book he edited on that. The other thing I would say about this, this heightened visibility, um, and it's something that I think in a way, it's, it's ambiguous, it's, equ it, it, uh, it's equivocal, because it's not as though, um, <coughs> you know, politicians are like, oh, damn, you know, there's a controversy about the Jamaica flight. You know, it's coming back to the absent presence of race, there's something about the charter which is also, it's about the power to cluster. It's about a power to sort of herd people, uh, uh, you know, to put them together on a boat, which evokes all sorts of, you know, distant historical memories, say, of transportation. So even though the politicians, the government will say, you know, this is a legal process, everybody on this plane, you know, there's been a case-by-case -case basis, which sometimes is true is, and sometimes isn't true, is nevertheless it generates this image of kind of clustering of, say, brown bodies on a plane, which makes headlines and sort of, you know, there's a lot of the public then buy, they, they dig that. So you can't sort of scandalize it by saying, look at this flight, it's terrible, because there's a lot of the public that says, yes, this is it's actually too good. They should be sent on boats, not planes, because planes are, you know, too luxurious. And they hear the word charter flight, and they go, well, we go on charter flights to Spain. You know, what's wrong with a charter flight? Yes. So, um, Christian, I love your question <laughs> uh, because it, it raises, um, it, it sort of is a good example of, of the new kinds of questions we can ask when we shift this perspective. Mm -hmm. And so critical race theory actually does talk a lot about land and property because it's based on the, the ownership of, or the people as property under slavery. And so, um, so what I love about this example is that it actually, this, this transfer of, of property that you're asking me to consider, um, that it fits with this idea of disrupted settlement. And so I'm going to, to sit with that. Um, 
Uh, but I'm also just in, in hearing, you know, the responses and things like that. I mean, it is interesting, you know, the question about debt, I think, is also mm -hmm. important because that's something that people yeah. in the criminal justice scholarship talk about. So it's in our interest to yeah. really, we I guess this is what I'm getting at. It's like we study these things separately. Yeah. And this is what I mean. It's like there, there is a racial separation yes. in our concepts. I literally, I think I'm seeing my colleague um, in CLJ, we were at a conference recently and the migration scholars were here and the criminal justice scholars. And I think, I don't know what you did, but I was going between two rooms like, okay, where do, where do I fit here? But, um, but yes, thank you, Christian. And, I, and it, is, it is sort of making me feel like, oh, maybe there is something to this, like, you know, keep going with this. So thank you so much. And we have time for one more question, maybe two. Uh, so I have a question for Dr. Macias. I was wondering, um, I guess I'm a student of um, Ralph Cintron, and what a lot of what we talk about is sort of um, the world in relation to climate change. And, I, and one of the big concepts we talked about was the notion of climate change migration. And I'm wondering um, in your research, and honestly I'll open this to the panel too, in all of your research really, um, is there sort of like with climate migrants, uh, the concept of deportation becomes kind of um, convoluted because it's like you were deporting people to areas that are now uninhabitable. So I'm wondering, one, does the criminalization of climate migrants change? And two, um, what exactly like does migration look like in relation to climate change? Whoa, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, please, you, you take this one, and then I'll, I'll try to add something at the end. Yeah, that's a very complicated question because this is what we are witnessing now. All migrants that are traversing from the Andean region across Central America, they are already climate migrants or climate refugees. But the problem is if before there was no um, there was no, as we know, law that has been put in place to protect people on the move. With this idea of climate refugees, it's even worse. We know the limitations of the 1951 uh, Vienna Conventions in refugee matters. We also know the huge limitations of the 1984 Declaración de Cartagena in refugees matters. So if we want to expand this idea of climate refugees, we are we are revolving with uh, documents that are in reality dead letters. So what do we do? That's a huge question. Uh, in Central America, we know that the dry corridor, which is the corridor that is pushing people to move out of their fields, to move out of El Campo because of uh, what's going on there, those people are joining the migrant caravans and are joining all the masses of people arriving here. So um, as you mentioned, and I think that this is part of a symposium like this, the idea is to bring together the conversation on the problems that normally are treated separately. But now we need, in this age of streams, we need to bring the conversation and to try to discuss what do we do with this. Thinking about climate change, and with this I end, um, means of transport, William, uh, airplanes are yeah, part of all of this. That's what I was thinking. And what do we make out of this? The deportation flights are part mm -hmm. of the climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. The camiones, all of this is entangled in, in such a complex moment that, of course, your questions as students always are enlightening. Thank you for that. Yeah, can I add to that? Um, who's, who's modern? Oh, can I add to that? <laughs> Sorry, I thought I saw someone with the microphone. So I, I love, I love this question, and so I'm going to try to end on a, on a, uplifting note, um, and that is um, because in this return to the border to do this research, I've decided to bring in. Um, I'm looking, I'm doing the research in communities that hit up against the wall, right? Oh. And so 
it, it, and, and they're in communities where people are not necessarily even migrants. And so one of those communities is an indigenous community. And so through that, I've been, I've been reading sort of more of the literature on indigeneity and borders and indigenous studies. And my colleague, Jonathan Inda, recommended mm -hmm. this really amazing book that I want to recommend to you and everybody here. It's called Unsettled Borders. And I didn't bring in this book, but this book is bringing another, another view of mobility that draws on indigenous epistemologies. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, I, you, you were on this trip with me where we visited you know, ancestral lands you know, in Mexico. And, and when we think about that, what she calls this sacred science, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a, a, an understanding of mobility and footsteps and connection to land. And, and so to me, the, the answer to the question that you're asking is, is in that literature. And, and so, and in, in that, those um, otros saberes, as a colleague in Mexico has referred, or, or these other epistemology. Um, uh, yeah, there was one other. Oh, but, but, but this is, again, this is what's possible when we move away from these traditional models of, yeah. of mobility. When we move and, and when we, we bring in race, yeah. that then we can, you know, sort of interrogate things. And by race, I don't just mean groups of people. I'm talking, you know, because race is, of course, made up. I'm talking about <laughs> a history of the idea of race. And, and that means reckoning with the history of slavery. That means reckoning with, with the history of genocide. And so, um, yeah. So thank you for that question. And I should say that that is my child. I'm a very proud parent right now. I'm sorry I had to say that. I'm a very proud parent. <laughs> That is our time. Thank you all very much for sticking around. We will reconvene at 1230.
Hello? Okay, cool. All right. I think we're ready. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. <laughs> yes, uh, and there is a new Zoom link. Was it sent out to, it was sent out to everyone, I believe. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is the Sanctuary Roundtable, Roundtable featuring Elvira Arellano, Karma Chavez, Naomi Paik, and Barbara Sostaita. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm very excited to be moderating this panel with this incredible lineup. Uh, I think the idea of sanctuary is critical to immigration policy and the immigrant rights movement. During this panel, panelists will explore the meaning of sanctuary, some critical questions to consider. Uh, what is the historical background of sanctuary movements? Who does sanctuary apply to? What is possible under the framework or legalistic policy of sanctuary? And does sanctuary fall short in some ways? Um, and just a few sen sentences about myself. I'm a second year master's student in Latin American Latino studies. Uh, and my engagement with immigration issues started in college when I joined the University of Chicago Coalition for Immigrant Rights and engaged with how migration issues touch the lives of undocumented students on campus um, and also um, around the city. So while not a Chicago focused panel, the city and campus have been an important part of the immigrant rights movement. So it seems fitting we are here today exploring the meaning of sanctuary. Um, I will now introduce our incredible panel lineup. Uh, Carmel R. Chavez is chair and Bobby Sherry Pat Patton, endowed professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latina O studies at the University of Texas in Austin. She is co-editor of Queer and Trans Migrations, Dynamics of Illegalization, Detention and Deportation and author of Queer Migration Politics, Activist Rhetoric and Coalitional Possibilities, and the Borders of AIDS, Race, Quarantine, and Resistance. Naomi Paik is the author of Bands, Walls, Raids, Sanctuary, and is developing a new project, Sanctuary for All, Sanctuary Everywhere, that brings together environmental and migrant justice. She is an associate professor of criminology, law, and justice in global Asian studies at UIC. Barbara Sostaita is an assistant professor of Latin American Latino Studies at UIC and the author of the forthcoming book, Sanctuary Everywhere, The Fugitive Sacred in the Sonoran Desert, under contract at Duke University Press. Elvira Arellano is an organizer and human rights activist. In 2006, in defiance of an order of deportation, Arellano and her son, Saul, saw sanctuary at Adelberto United Methodist Church in Humboldt Park. Her activism while in sanctuary catalyzed a new sanctuary movement, a network of religious communities and organizations committed to defending and sheltering migrants at risk of deportation. Uh, to get us started, Naomi Paik will be contextualizing sanctuary history to situate our conversation. Oh, thank you so much, Linda. Um, can you guys hear me? More or less? No. Okay. How about? No. It is on. Okay, I'm gonna have to love the mic. Can you hear me now? No? no? They can't, you still can't hear me. Okay. Uh, oh, take it out, okay. How about this? Oh, there we go, okay. <laughs> Hello, Hello, everyone. I also wanna congratulate Linda for, um, she is soon to be joining the PhD program here at UIC in sociology, so congratulations, Linda. And thank you for moderating this round table and thank you to all the co-panelists. So Sanctuary has a long genealogy that stretches back millennia, um, but this round table will be focusing on US sanctuary movements, which have been led by migrant justice or migrant organizers and their citizen accomplices. So the original sanctuary movement began in the US Southwest when eight churches publicly declared sanctuary in 1982 responding to the predicament of people fleeing the Central American dirty wars, during which military governments brutally suppressed leftist and indigenous opposition movements, killing more than 75,000 Salvadorans and 200,000 Guatemalans. I think I need to slow down for translation. Okay. Because the US supported these ruthless dictatorships, it refused to recognize Salvadorans and Guatemalans as refugees, since doing so would admit its responsibility for mass death. Instead, the United States deported these mag migrants back to lethal conditions. 
In response, sanctuary activists violated federal laws by providing transportation, shelter, food, and legal and medical aid to migrants, while also pressuring local jurisdictions to pass policies protecting refugees from the INS. By offering sanctuary, they connected the root causes of migration, including U.S. support of repressive regimes to the unjust immigration laws that refused to deal with the fallout of that support. The Reagan administration, in turn, responded by criminalizing the movement, infiltrating sanctuary churches, and prosecuting eight activists for running a modern underground railroad. However, their convictions emboldened the movement. The number of sanctuary congregations doubled. While the Central American Peace Accords closed this iteration of the sanctuary movement in the early 1990s, the criminalization of migrants, among others, intensified. As the US relentlessly pursued deportations, especially after 9-11, the new sanctuary movement moved to protect migrants once again. In 2006, our honored guest, Elvira Arellano, and her son, Saul, entered sanctuary in the Adalberto United Methodist Church right here in Chicago in Humboldt Park and organized for the sanctuary movement. I just want to do a quick sidebar to hear that um, Ms. Arellano was originally swept up in a series of post-9-11 raids on airports targeting undocumented workers as threats to um, our critical infrastructure. And this shows how 9-11 has increasingly cast immigration and migrants as a national security threat. So as during the 1980s, religious sites have used their status beyond the state, beyond state control to shield migrants from deportation. The new sanctuary movement has also taken more assertive actions like organizing rapid response networks and know your rights workshops, while also lobbying local governments for sanctuary policies that prohibit local agencies from colluding with ICE. Additional policies decriminalize common migrant practices like street vending and provide resources like driver's license to un undocumented persons. These policies can be effective. In Chicago and Cook County, for example, they slashed the number of ICE detainer requests um, to Qu Cook County Jail from 1,400 to 70 in the course of one year. These prior histories have enabled the most recent resurgence of sanctuary following the 2016 presidential election that sent a white nationalist to the White House. The number of sanctuary jurisdictions jumped from a few dozen in 2010 to more than 600 in 2017. More congregations declared sanctuary, and the idea spread to new sites like transit systems, restaurants, and schools with students faculty and staff at more than 200 universities petitioning uh, to, the, to declare themselves sanctuary campuses. Just as another note, the University of Illinois refused. But even as the president has changed, many of the policies targeting migrants have remained. So we still not only need sanctuary principles and policies, but we also need to make them more radical and capacious, and I would argue abolitionist, if we are serious about keeping each other safe and about honoring our common dignity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi, for helping to ground our conversation in important historical context. I'm gonna start our conversation with the question to Elvira Arellano. Elvira, you became one of the faces of the new sanctuary movement when you entered Adalberto Church in 2006, but also became a leading activist through your work for migrant justice. Many of us are less familiar with your continued migrant justice work after the U.S. deported you in 2007. Could you tell us more about your activism in Mexico for migrants from Central America, your return to the U.S., and your work with Venezuelan migrants here in Chicago? How do you see sanctuary fitting into your work? Sí, muy buenas tardes. Gracias por la invitación. Ahorita que la profesora estaba leyendo parte del libro, me estaba recordando yo de el padre José Landaverde. Él murió en diciembre y él fue un gran activista aquí en Chicago. Cuando yo lo conocí, él fue quien me contó la historia del de movimiento santuario 
en los años 80 y cómo las iglesias uh, protegieron a las personas que estaban viniendo. El padre, él era del Salvador. Uh, o en una ocasión me tocó viajar a Boston, Massachusetts, para participar en la marcha del primero de mayo. Y poco a poco, a través del tiempo, um, fui alimentando mi conciencia y conociendo un poco acerca del santuario. Después de haber uh, tomado santuario y que me deportan en México, uh, la deportación no, no va a detener ese espíritu, esa hambre de justicia para los demás. En Chicago, mientras estuve en el santuario, recibí mucho apoyo. Jóvenes estudiantes como ustedes, profesores académicos como ustedes, llegaban hasta la iglesia para hablar conmigo, para que yo contara mi historia, cuál era la razón que yo había tomado santuario en esa iglesia. Y mi hijo tenía cuatro años cuando yo fui arrestada. Y a mí los cargos que me iban a poner eran cargos federales. Yo iba a estar en la prisión de tres años en adelante. Podía ser y pensar, me voy a dejar, no estoy sola. Porque líderes activistas de la comunidad me empezaron a decir, no estás sola. Si tú quieres luchar, tú puedes lograr muchas cosas. Y fue por eso que yo decidí luchar. Cuando me deportan en México, pues yo no sabía que en México estaban cruzando la gente para venir a los Estados Unidos. Y fue hasta acá donde yo conocí gente de Honduras, de Guatemala, de El Salvador y de Nicaragua. Muchas de las mujeres eran violadas, secuestradas, asesinadas, hombres y mujeres. Y fue que dije yo, yo tengo que ir a la frontera. Pero yo tardé. Porque en ir a la frontera, porque yo tenía mi corazón herido y yo no, no aguantaba poder ir a la frontera y ver cómo esa gente estaba viniendo a llegar a este país donde nos iban a tratar como criminales, donde nos iban a arrestar, donde nos iban a deportar, donde iban a separar nuestras familias. Y fue gracias al padre Luis Ángel Nieto, que él fue un gran activista en Los Ángeles, que él me dijo, tenemos que ir porque hay un grupo de mujeres, de madres, que buscan a sus hijos desaparecidos. Y tenemos que ir para buscarlas y para ver cómo podemos ayudarle. Y fue esa la razón que fuimos, empezamos a ir a la ruta migratoria, organizamos caravanas, protestas, via crucis para defender a los inmigrantes, a su derecho a transitar libremente por nuestro país México, que pararan las extorsiones, que pararan los secuestros, que pararan las violaciones, porque no solamente mujeres estaban siendo violadas, también hombres, ¿verdad? Y fue así como me involucré en el movimiento migrante me americano, formamos el movimiento migrante mesoamericano y el movimiento migrante le también este, arropó a las madres que buscan a sus hijos desaparecidos, madres de Honduras, de El Salvador, de Nicaragua. Y para mí, el, el de ese tiempo, el momento más impactante fue cuando la caravana de madres decide ir a San Fernando, Tamaulipas, que fue en el 2010 cuando fue la masacre de los 72 migrantes este, y, 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 y logramos llegar hasta allá, en ese lugar, en ese cuartito ahí donde, donde masacraron a esos 72, hasta ahí llegamos. Y la policía municipal y la policía federal no quiso acompañarnos, fue el ejército quien nos escoltó a ese autobús de madres y a nosotros los activistas para poder llegar hasta ahí con las madres, ¿verdad? Y fue un tiempo bien difícil, pero lo más importante es que en esos años sí logramos bastante. Algunos migrantes lograron que se les diera su salvoconducto para poder transitar por México. Algunas caravanas sirvieron, ¿verdad?, para que se respetaran sus derechos, ¿verdad? Y fue parte del proceso en México. Como activistas también recibimos amenazas. Mis compañeros, la mayoría hombres, siempre me decían, Elvira, entre menos sepas tú, tu vida está, va a estar más a salvo. Yo soy madre, soy activista y también yo soy de Michoacán, pero de Michoacán yo me tenía que trasladar hasta el punto de reunión para nuestro activismo, que era a la frontera de Tenosique, en Tabasco, era um, en Chiapas y también era en Oaxaca, para el lado, lo que es uh, sur de México. 
Entonces, yo siempre viajaba en la noche para llegar en la mañana a la otra ciudad. Sí me hacía bastantes horas y mis compañeros siempre decían y temían por mi vida y varias veces fuimos amenazados precisamente por nuestra lucha por los migrantes de Centroamérica. Entonces, pues llegó, cruzo acá a los Estados Unidos, ¿verdad? Y entonces, a, a lo poco que acabamos de hacer ahorita en la iglesia con nuestra pastora Jacobita, que es en el santuario, pues a, a recibir a los migrantes de Venezuela, Uh, se abrió un refugio temporal. Aquí están nuestras compañeras, María, está Sofi y está Saulito, ¿verdad? Que entre todos con nuestra pastora Jacobita hicimos todo lo posible. Nuestra iglesia no es un refugio, no está condicionado, pero las los personas venezolanos decían solamente queremos un lugar en donde podamos descansar y dormir seguros. ¿Verdad? Y, y se abrió provisionalmente, se, yo creo que se recibieron más de 200 gentes en nuestra iglesia y eso es pues lo que nos hace sentir bien que podemos hacer algo por los demás. Gracias, Elvira. Thank you for telling us about your activist work. Uh, your experiences raises questions about how sanctuary moves across different spaces. So I'd like to ask our panelists, panelists about sanctuary in place. How have sanctuary movements and campaigns worked in different locations, like here in Chicago or U.S. borderland regions in Texas or Sonora, or across borders as Elvira's activism shows us? What does sanctuary look like in different places? Karma, would you like to get us started? Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> Hold up. Uh, I should have been ready for that because we planned that it w that I would go next, but uh, here we are. Um, so I'm actually going to take this off for a minute for clarity since I know we're having volume issues. Um, uh, first of all, just want to uh, say I'm very grateful to be here and uh, thank you colleagues for the invitation and for all of the labor you all have done here and for folks who are uh, doing all the, the unseen labor in the background, putting stuff together, making sure we're fed and caffeinated. Um, Thank you uh, for that. Um, it is a, a true honor to be uh, on this panel. I, um, you know, honored to hear your story, and of course, uh, these two incredible scholars. Um, it's a wonderful thing. So uh, I, I was trying to think about how to answer this part of the question or get us kicked off on this part of the question, and I guess I I was thinking a, 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 of a couple things and. Um, so one was a concept that I, I learned about when I first got to Texas that probably had existed long before this, but um, the, the notion of, of sanctuary in the street. And um, so in Austin, where I live, um, I don't know what happened during the pandemic, actually, but prior to the pandemic and in the kind of post-2016 uh, moment, you know, um, Austin is uh, progressive, of course, but uh, we can understand that, that that doesn't always mean actually progressive. And, uh, you know, there's uh, collusion between immigration and law enforcement. And so it was mostly a, a group of, of older white retired folks who um, had sort of long been involved in struggles around um, Latin America and had uh, been you know, kind of seeing how things were going. And, and I don't know that they developed the concept, but they were enacting the concept of sanctuary in the street. And so essentially it was kind of like a phone tree. And if uh, there was word that uh, someone uh, might be in law enforcement trouble and who also had immigration issues, this kind of group of older white women would descend um, on the scene uh, and, and try to put up a, a protective barrier uh, around the, the, the person who was in trouble. Um, and uh, I, I, I thought that was uh, a creative kind of response. Um, it reminded me very much of, you know, more than 20 years ago working in Tucson um, on, on the border and uh, the, the ways that people would do that same kind of thing. And so it wasn't necessarily called sanctuary um, in the streets, but uh, I was thinking about um, my friend uh, Raul Osmani uh, uh, Akaraz, who uh, you know would put himself under 
uh, a truck, a border patrol truck, to protect someone from being deported. And so um, really got me thinking about the importance of sanctuary as a micro practice um, that should be performed based on your, your local needs. One other example I wanted to, to give that's actually not on the southern border, but on the northern border, uh, several years ago I had the opportunity to uh, work with a very small liberal arts college in upstate New York uh, to develop their sanctuary plan. And, you know, very small, maybe uh, 1,200 students, you know, maybe 100 faculty or something like this at this um, institution, another maybe 100 staff, and we were all crammed into their, like, multicultural student space to map out what uh, actual sanctuary would look like on a small college campus, uh, and um, I don't. I think that maybe they had like three or four undocumented students, and as far as they knew, uh, no undocumented workers on campus. But they were invested in this as as a practice of coalition building, uh, as a practice of world making, and um, it was it was quite inspiring to be able to be a part of that. And so. Um, I guess I just offer those three little quips uh, as a place to get us started. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to stress how honored and humbled I am to be on this panel. I see everyone here um, as a teacher in a way. Um, Naomi, I've learned so much from your work on abolition and sanctuary. Karma's work gave me the language to think about fugitivity and sanctuary and queerness and sanctuary. Elvira has taught me through her work about insurgency and sanctuary and about sanctuary that crosses borders. And Linda, working with um, her on a master's thesis, I've learned about environmental justice and sanctuary, how sanctuary allows us to imagine more livable worlds. And so, I just want to say thank you. I, I feel really honored to be sharing space with all four of you. Um, yeah, I think for a place in sanctuary, for my current project, I'm um, my field work is in Sonora, Arizona, and this is the place that's um, commonly thought of as an origin story for sanctuary um, in the United States, though there are many origin stories that we could point to. Um, but having studied the 1980s movement, um, I want to emphasize what Naomi mentioned about the Underground Railroad and how people like Jim Corbett, um, who was one of the conductors of the Underground Railroad, was known as a Quaker coyote. The media often talked about him as a, as a coyote. And the, the purpose, when I've interviewed folks involved in that movement, they've told me that the goal was to move people, not to settle in a place. Um, because they were very aware that um, a place was not a permanent sanctuary. And that, as Elvida mentioned during her remarks, even when they arrived to the US, people would be subject to criminalization, incarceration, and all forms of um, targeting, right? So churches, shelters, and other organizations across Mexico were also involved in sanctuary movements. And so what people now call this vertical borderlands, there existed a strong underground fugitive network of spaces to um, aid and um, help transport Central American migrants fleeing violence. And I wanna emphasize that there are a lot of Mexicans involved in this role and in this story. I recently had a conversation with a graduate student at UIUC, his name is Isaac Wink. He's researching the work of Maria del Socorro Pardo de Aguilar, who was one of two Mexicans tried in the sanctuary trials that Naomi mentioned. So two of the eight were Mexicans and people who were doing the work on the Mexico side of the border to shelter, harbor, um, and aid um, people on the move. And so I think just the point about I want to make about place and sanctuary is sanctuary is always a place-based practice, right? Because place and land shape all of our interactions. But sanctuary, and as Karma um, said, right, these called it these micro practices. I think these micro practices or these um, insurgent fugitive practices that are on the move and that are sheltering people in movement and in transit 
not simply at one fixed, settled place of protection. Um, I'll pass. Thank you so much. We're gonna go. We're gonna move on to the next question. Um, so it seems that sanctuary can take many different forms in different places. I'd like to ask the panelists about what might be holding sanctuary back from helping us move towards migrant, just, migrant justice. What are some of the limits of current sanctuary practices like sanctuary city policies or sanctuary, sanctuary churches, congregation? Uh, Barbara, would you like to get us started with this question? Sure, thank you, Linda. Yeah, and um, so yeah, I think I'll start by thinking about how I came to study sanctuary, which was when I was a graduate student at the University of North Carolina. And after the 2016 election, I was part of a team that crafted a sanctuary campus petition. Um, and in that process of drafting a petition, I think we were immediately um, met with the limits of trying to institutionalize a tradition that is inherently unruly. Um, and so we had to immediately, we had to put limits. Um, when you institutionalize something, when you write it in a petition, you're placing limits and boundaries on what the practice can be. And so we realized that it was, we were asking for help for our students who were the brightest of the brightest in North Carolina, who could make these claims to a good immigrant framework, who could make these claims, going back to Yvonne's paper earlier, claims to innocence, claims to brilliance, claims to productivity, um, and so we, we quickly realized that there were limits to trying to take this practice and in, implement boundaries around it. And in my work, I think a lot about sanctuary um, and the sacred, because sanctuary comes from sanctus, um, a, a Latin word meaning sacred. And because my training is in religious studies, I look a lot to religious studies scholars who theorize the sacred as that which disrupts or disturbs the profane, the profane being the everyday. And so they, they theorize, these folks theorize sacred as unsustainable, as something that doesn't last, as unruly, as messy, as contagious, as transgressive. M. Jackie Alexander in Pedagogies of Crossing refers to the sacred as mobile, um, as something that moves, and because it moves, it can't be easily captured. And I, so I think about this with the limits of sanctuary, because I think sanctuary as a sacred practice is unruly, is messy, and these sanctuary cities, sanctuary universities, sanctuary homes, sanctuary campuses, I think are trying to um, operationalize or instrumentalize a tradition that is very, very sacred. And by sacred, I mean fully sacred, meaning <clears throat> nurturing and destructive, healing and harming, it's fully sacred. Um, so in my work, I, I work a lot with a nurse, Panchito Olachea, who um, was deported from the US to Nogales, Sonora, and Panchito, enrolled in nursing school and became a nurse and saw the need in his community to offer services to people who were poor, migrant, Central American, and unable to access health care in Mexico. And he became, began walking down the streets of Nogales with a backpack with medical supplies. And they called him the walking ambulance. And by the time I met him, he had repurposed an old church van that had been donated to him from the US and was driving from migrant shelter to migrant shelter, offering care to folks, stuck, immobilized, right? To borrow Soledad's language, um, <coughs> immobilized in transit. And he and I spoke about his work and he described it as a sanctuary on wheels. And I mentioned this because um, I, I, I'm also really taken with the sanctuary in the street. Um, tradition or practice about how sanctuary, I think, has its fullest power um, when we embrace this messiness, this fugitivity, um, and that, these, that when we refuse stasis and when we refuse fixity. So I'll stop there. Right. Thank you so much for that. I'm completely 100% on board with everything you just said. 
And I think if we look at the long genealogy of sanctuary, even like going way back before the sanctuary movement of the, hello. Oh, lift my voice, okay. So if we even go back uh, to the long genealogy of sanctuary and really think about um, some of the histories from medieval Europe even, right? We can think about the very practice of sanctuary has always been in opposition to the sovereign, right? It's always in opposition. So if we take it into the contemporary period, it's always oppositional to state sovereignty. So even thinking about uh, a sanctuary church or a sanctuary city or other jurisdiction, there's some kind of opposition to the sovereign power of the US federal government. You cannot intrude into this religious space because um, we are doing something different here. And so there's this um, antagonism that's kind of inherent to the very practice of sanctuary. And yet when we go to other kinds of jurisdictions at different levels, like to the local government, right? We're actually using the same, we're, we're making appeals to the same structure of governance that we're actually trying to undo. And so there's, there's a contradiction there that's kind of inescapable, right? Because you're asking this very state that's responsible for the conditions that we're trying to protect people from to protect us from that very thing, right? So it's kind of a paradox and a contradiction that you can't get out of. And I think um, the other thing, I really love the kind of emphasis on uh, sanctuary on wheels or sanctuary as unruliness, as disruption, as something always in motion. Because we often think of, or kind of a more conventional approach to sanctuary is thinking about it as a very specifically place-based practice. You cannot enter this church. This jurisdiction of this city will not collaborate with ICE, right? And so it is a kind of, it's thinking through bounded spaces. Right? And that is repro reproducing, again, some of the very structures that we're trying to fight against about territoriality, right? about bound boundaries, and about borders. Right? Um, it's in a different kind of valence, but it can reproduce some of the same problems. So uh, you know, I know Barbara has worked on this with um, certain migrants in sanctuary, but it, it does become, uh, it's different, but it, it does become a, sp a space where their mobility is constrained, where they're not able to leave the space of sanctuary without the threat of deportation. And so there is a kind of, um, I heard uh, a minister who, who has hosted sanctuary in their church, actually in North Carolina, and she described herself as kind of a humanitarian, uh, you know, um, low-level low security uh, prison guard. <laughs> Right? And she's like, you know, the people who were uh, living in my church could leave at any time, kind of, but not really. And so there were times when uh, the people that she was sheltering just wanted to walk out of the church and keep walking. Right? And so there is this kind of same logic of um, boundedness about borders that is um, like when we think about sanctuary as a bounded practice or a place-based practice, we actually need to think about how can we undo <laughs> the very logics of uh, territoriality, bordered spaces, and things like this, if we're gonna get real about making a sanctuary as uh, effective as possible. Can we go in front? Okay, sorry. So I'm gonna move on to the next question. Uh, so far our conversation has shown us how powerful sanctuary can be, that it takes many different forms, whether it's in motion or stationary, um, and also how current sanctuary practices might be holding, uh, holding us back. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question about looking to the future. Where do you, where do, we, uh, where do the panelists want to see sanctuary movements moving in the future? How can we advance sanctuary movements for justice? Um, Naomi, could you start us off? Okay, um, I'll try to be brief since I'm talking too much. Um, okay, so as I'm going to put go hard for abolition and sanctuary together, that we actually need an abolitionist vision of sanctuary if we're going to get real about um, really taking the migrant justice slogans, sanctuary everywhere, sanctuary for all, um, seriously, right? So what would it mean? Who is included in the all? Like in the current configuration, we're thinking about undocumented persons at risk of deportation. But does that include... But how can we make that all as capacious as possible, including citizens who are similarly, not exactly the same, but similarly criminalized and targeted by the state for early death, right? How do we think, and then also, can we think even more capaciously in terms of who is the, who, what, who or what is included in the all? Again, if we go back to the genealogy of sanctuary, it's not just about humans under duress. It's about, think about butterfly sanctuaries or um, national parks or marine preserves, things like this, 
right? So if you think about the all as encompassing also any kind of life form, including non-humans, including um, habitats that are under duress from things like climate change and extractive capitalism, right? All of the things that life depends on, air, clean air, water, land, right? If we can include all of these things in sanctuary, then we're really radically opening it up. And that it's not just about this is the appropriate subject who deserves protection. And we let go of any kind of um, boundaries around who's deserving or undeserving. That's one of the logics of the good, bad immigrant, for example, that we need to let go of completely, right? And then if we're thinking about sanctuary everywhere, what does that mean when we have often thought uh, our conventional approaches to sanctuary are about that bounded space? If we're thinking about sanctuary everywhere, then we're thinking about creating um, a, space of, um, a space where everyone has dignity and everything has dignity. Everything has the um, resources it needs to live and live well, right? Then we're actually thinking about the elimination of sanctuary as a bounded practice, right? And so, yeah, I'll leave it there. I mean, that pretty much sums it up as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I mean, but I think it's, I think it, what I would add is that um, part of what I think you propose, Naomi, is, is thinking about um, sanctuary as an expansive logic and expansive practice. And so if uh, we can apply that in the broadest possible ways, we we do logically get to an abolitionist vision um, where people are cared for, uh, the environment is cared for, uh, animals are cared for, and things that are, if sanctuary is definitionally opposition to the sovereign, um, then uh, all of that uh, happens without um, having to, to abide by um, the 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 nation state the borders the walls and I think um, to me the the other way I think about this is like I always turn to um, when you know in the 2016 moment and everyone is like oh how do we get these policies written at our university or how do we get this and I I kept saying to people we should do this absolutely but you know it doesn't actually mean anything right like they will collude with ICE. They will turn a student over who is accused of a crime. They will not hesitate to do that. And, and if we look back to the early 1980s, even like 1970s, really when sanctuary in like Tucson was getting started without that name, it was a practice of illegality, right? So fundamentally opposed to the sovereign. And so for me, that's, Part of it too, we have to, um, you know, be willing to engage in in, in law breaking, knowing that uh, the laws are unjust. That sanctuary is fundamentally opposition to the sovereign, fundamentally a sacred practice of the unruly. So um, that, in this framework, requires participating in a legal practice, and then the broader vision of that right is abolition of the very concept itself. So. <laughs> so are, are we ready to move on to Q&A? All right. So I, I think we're ready to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, yeah. Or do you need a mic? Uh, Elvira, muchas gracias por su presentación and thank you to everyone. Um, I think I have a question for Elvira in particular. Uh, me gustaría preguntarle, bueno, mi nombre es Mario, soy de Tangancícuaro, Michoacán, uh -huh. hijo de migrantes y mi abuelo era bracero. Entonces, para... El mío también. Ah, pa pa paisanes aquí. Sí. Y este, bueno, estudio mi doctorado en la Universidad de California, en Santa Cruz, en el uh -huh. Departamento de Latin American Latino Studies, que es el mismo departamento que está acá. Um, mi pregunta tiene que ver con esa idea del futuro, ¿no? de, de los santuarios. Eh, no sé si se ha percatado o en sus grupos ahora esta migración que desde hace unos 3, 4 años de centroamericanos pasando también ahora por Michoacán, ¿no? cambiando las rutas y quedándose en una 
en un tránsito limbo, ¿no? Uh -huh. En donde antes quizás conocíamos que se quedaban en la frontera, eh, deambulando, pero ahora también se quedan en esos espacios en las poblaciones, ¿no? Yo los veo en mi pueblo cada que voy, pidiendo apoyo, dinero, en los topes de las carreteras nacionales. Entonces, un problema que creo que he percibido y antes trabajando también con comunidades en Michoacán y particularmente con la Iglesia Católica, que son los grupos que están de repente más conectados que el mismo gobierno, um, creo que hay un problema como de responsabilidad y también en términos de ciudadanía de dónde queda este migrante, ¿no? ¿Quién lo acoge y cómo y de dónde toma eh, apoyo, ¿no? Entonces, en este como que limbo de si es el gobierno, si son las organizaciones no profit, eh, ¿qué es lo que ve usted en estas tensiones? Sobre todo ahora pensando que las migraciones siguen cambiando ¿no? constantemente y están llegando a otros lugares donde no teníamos, eh, hace cuatro o cinco años en mi pueblo no teníamos a los niños centroamericanos con sus papás pidiendo apoyo. ¿no? Entonces, como que hay una demanda posible de que se ocupen más santuarios, más movilidades, más santuarios moviéndose, pero es complicado, ¿no? Entonces, ¿cómo dónde ve usted sus retos o qué encuentros quizás con los gobiernos, con otras instituciones se podrían como unir? Gracias. Sí. Bueno, pues en, um, hace, ay, perdón, no me fui. <risa> en 2000, um, 2014 fue cuando yo crucé de regreso a los Estados Unidos y mientras estaba en México, um, supe que los migrantes um, sí venían, sí cruzaban por nuestros pueblos, pero cruzaban con los coyotes. En nuestros pueblos los coyotes tenían casas de seguridad, pero después ya cuando el tiempo cambió y muchos de los migrantes pues empezaron a cruzar en grupos acompañados sin la necesidad de un a coyote y es cuando comienzan a aumentar los secuestros, ¿verdad? Les secuestraban, ¿por qué? Porque ellos no están pagando, un coyote no está pagando por la seguridad de ellos. Ah, el padre Alejandro Solalinde en el albergue, nosotros fuimos a Oaxaca para apoyarle mucho cuando él estaba siendo amenazado de muerte, ¿verdad? Y desde ese tiempo nosotros estuvimos luchando para cambiar las políticas públicas en México Sí se logró un cambio, se les comenzaron a dar los salvoconductos a los migrantes. Desafortunadamente, ahorita en este momento, eh, el Instituto Nacional de Inmigración en México es un cáncer terrible que viene de años atrás. No es del gobierno actual y se ha dificultado hacer el cambio. Todos sabemos lo que acaba de ocurrir hace unas semanas, ¿verdad?, en Juárez, y uh, nosotros tuvimos una reunión hace antes, una semana antes de que ocurriera esta tragedia en Ciudad Juárez, tuvimos una reunión con el padre Alejandro Solalinde, el cual ha estado muy cercano a nuestro presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador en México, y él ha estado hablando sobre un proyecto, ¿verdad?, para precisamente ayudar a, la, a los migrantes, Um, el papá de mi hijo eh, es de Honduras y nosotros tratamos de arreglar sus papeles de él cuando antes de que naciera mi hijo y fue bien complicado para arreglar sus papeles. A pesar de que yo tenía el conocimiento y conocía más gente, ¿verdad? Fue complicado. Después de que nació mi hijo fue bien complicado. Nos, mm, yo crucé la frontera en 2014 y el papá de mi hijo se tuvo que quedar atrás porque él no tenía sus papeles para poder llegar a la frontera con Estados Unidos. Y ya estando acá fue cuando él arregló su residencia, ¿verdad? Pero básicamente arregló su residencia, pero para poder llegar a la frontera y poder reunirse con nosotros. Y él está acá con nosotros. Pero en realidad el proceso para arreglar el estatus migratorio de las personas allá en México por parte del Instituto Nacional de Migración, aunque nuestro presidente esté dando otras instrucciones, en el Instituto Nacional de Migración están el proceso, lo están tratando de hacer lo más tedioso posible para las familias. Pero nuestro presidente es una persona muy humanitaria y él está haciendo todo lo posible para que las familias inmigrantes en nuestro país sean protegidos sus derechos. Sabemos que 
la delincuencia organizada creció muy fuerte en nuestro país, ¿verdad? Y los, uh, en la administración de Felipe Calderón, el combate a las drogas puso como a, lo, a la delincuencia organizada en peligro su, su, se puede decir, su fuente, su modus vivendi, que era traficar con drogas. Entonces, es cuando la delincuencia organizada comienza a secuestrar personas, ¿verdad? Y no solamente secuestra migrantes, sino también empieza a secuestrar a los ciudadanos mexicanos y empieza a secuestrar a las personas mexicanas que están intentando, o cualquier persona que esté en la frontera intentando cruzar a los Estados Unidos precisamente para extorsionar y pedir rescate a la familia. Entonces, uh, precisamente eso es una de las cosas por la cual muchos de nosotros como michoacanos, como mexicanos, decidimos, decidimos dejar nuestro país para venir a protegernos de eso, ¿verdad? Y ahora nosotros estamos uh, luchando desde acá también para que eso cambie y que nuestro país cambie, y por eso es que estamos apoyando a nuestro presidente en México para que las cosas cambien, y es verdad, el Instituto Nacional de Migración va a desaparecer. Va a desaparecer, no, no, este, uh, no tengo yo muchos detalles, pero sí nos, sí nos, en, sí nos habló el, el padre Alejandro Solalinde sobre este nuevo proceso y del cual se estará hablando, nuestro presidente estará hablando de ese cambio en ese proceso que se va a dar. Y fue precisamente, del, él nos habló de ese cambio una semana antes de que ocurriera lo de Ciudad Juárez. Y no es algo que se esté haciendo por lo que ocurrió en Ciudad Juárez, no. Yo soy testigo, mis pastoras Jacobita y Emma son testigos de que tuvimos esa reunión con varios líderes de California también, este, donde nos hablaron de ese nuevo proyecto del cual este, se va a hacer en México con el asunto de inmigración. Yo como activista, yo puedo decir que el Instituto Nacional de Migración es el coyote más grande que existe en México. Sí, porque nosotros fuimos testigos y lo denunciamos en México, que a través del Instituto Nacional de Migración detenían a los migrantes de Centroamérica y los vendían a la delincuencia organizada desde 3 mil pesos, depende del país donde vinieran. En aquel tiempo, cuando yo estaba en México, veíamos gente de Honduras, de Nicaragua, del de Salvador, de Guatemala y poquitos de, de, de Cuba, ¿verdad? Porque Cuba también es otro asunto, ¿verdad? Que desde, desde uh, Miami se les apoya con, con Coyote VIP para que ellos puedan, no, no tengan que sufrir to, todo lo que sufren los demás. Entonces, es, es la realidad y de verdad nosotros estamos luchando para que ningún migrante tenga que sufrir no, las mujeres no tengan que ser violadas y nos estamos dando cuenta, a la, las, hace dos semanas nuestra pastora Yuri Contreras fue a la frontera para salvar a unos niños y reunirlos con sus padres acá. Desafortunadamente, eh, el, eh, por parte del Instituto Nacional de Migración de allá de México, llamaron a la Guardia Nacional y ella estuvo arrestada. Y nosotros desde acá estuvimos luchando para, y llamando a todos lados para que la pudieran dejar en libertad, porque ella es una persona que hace el trabajo humanitario de rescatar a los niños. Ella está más enfocada en los niños para reunir con sus padres y eso, ¿verdad? Afortunadamente, ella solamente estuvo como 24 horas detenida, pero es algunas de las cosas que se están haciendo mal, en México, ¿verdad?, que están persiguiendo, como lo mencionan, están persiguiendo personas que ayudan humanitariamente y Padre Alejandro Solalinde fue una de las personas que fue perseguido mucho tiempo por ayudar este, a los migrantes y que nosotros estuvimos ahí siempre para apoyarlo y pues este, re, ojalá y que haya respondido a tu pregunta, ¿verdad?, pero sí me siento muy emocionada de que se está haciendo algo en México y que sí va a haber un cambio positivo para, para los migrantes en nuestro país. Gracias. Uh -huh. Other questions? Buenas tardes. Eh, para una pregunta para la señora Elvira y una pregunta para el, para el panel. Eh, quería preguntarle la idea sobre el santuario en el caso de organizaciones criminales, ¿no? Si hay posibilidad de que un, un santuario exista con con, con actores criminales. 
o si como usted relataba, básicamente la única protección posible es digamos, salir de México eh, para buscar protección al otro lado de la frontera. ¿no? Y le hago la pregunta con respecto al, al, a, a la Iglesia Católica, que un elemento muy interesante era, por ejemplo, que en el caso de las, eh, de las guerras civiles en, el, en Centroamérica, fueron cuentísimas, como mencionaba Naomi, pero había ciertos límites a lo que se podía y no se podía hacer, más allá de que hubo exabruptos y hubo asesinatos de, de sacerdotes y todo, pero la idea de que la iglesia era un santuario donde los desplazados internos, por ejemplo, en El Salvador, iban en necesidad de protección, era algo que no se tocaba. Y eso da la sensación de que en México se ha perdido, porque la, 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 incluso la iglesia católica eh, hace una labor tremendamente discreta a nivel pastoral, porque tiene miedo de lo que puede pasar. ¿no? Y usted estaba mencionando digamos, el caso de los calabriñanos, el caso del, del cura Soralinde, que lleva haciendo una labor de casi 20 años y que aún así ha recibido amenazas, no tenemos claro de quién. Entonces, quería preguntarle eso, si usted consideraba que hay límites, hay, hay la posibilidad de la existencia de un santuario en ese contexto. Gracias. Sí, ah, como lo mencionaba hace un momento, ¿verdad? Nuestro, ah, a través del de padre Alejandro Solalinde es que nos ha estado comunicando y también a través de los medios de comunicación el padre Solalinde ha estado hablando sobre este nuevo proyecto en relación a hacer un cambio en la política migratoria en nuestro país. ¿Verdad? Porque básicamente lo que está haciendo ahorita el Instituto Nacional de Migración está fungiendo como, como un guardia, ¿verdad? Más sobre seguridad y no como… Um, lo que nosotros pretendemos es que los migrantes se les permita quedarse en nuestro país, los que quieran y los que no, pues que tengan su permiso, porque muchas veces les dan su permiso en lo que es la frontera, pero lo que es acá en el norte les quitan el permiso, no se los reconocen y los deportan. ¿Verdad? Entonces, eh, eh, yo creo que sí va a haber un cambio muy significativo en relación a inmigración en nuestro país. Y pienso que va a ser este año, ¿verdad? Nuestro presidente habló la semana pasada y ellos están diciendo que sí va a haber un cambio significativo. Desde luego, ¿verdad? La delincuencia organizada ha hecho un daño muy grande en nuestro país y precisamente incluso tenemos otro compañero, Rubén Figueroa, que él estuvo muy activo. También él recibió amenazas y también él está de este lado de la frontera, ¿verdad? Y en, nosotros en ese tiempo, los medios de comunicación, gracias a los medios de comunicación, es que nosotros creíamos que gracias a los medios de comunicación es que nosotros, nuestra vida, Uh, podía protegerse, porque a través de ellos podíamos hacer las denuncias de lo que estaba pasando en nuestro país. Entonces, yo, yo siento, como, o sea, estoy muy agradecida que a través de los medios de comunicación podíamos hacer todas las denuncias y fue a través de los medios de comunicación que llegó mucho apoyo también para el padre Alejandro Solalín de Fray Tomás, ¿verdad? Y en realidad sí ha habido muchas amenazas para todos los padres que han estado haciendo, aún en contra de la misma Iglesia Católica, porque ellos estaban, muchos de ellos estaban desobedeciendo a la Iglesia Católica y se me hace tan, o sea, a veces es extraño que en México los padres de la Iglesia Católica están apoyando mucho y acá en Estados Unidos cuando yo tomé santuario fue una iglesia cristiana la que me abrió las puertas y, la, y muchas de la Iglesia Católica dijeron que ellos no iban a abrir sus iglesias en Los Ángeles fue sí fue donde se abrió santuario pero el padre tuvo mucha presión por parte del obispo para que terminara el santuario y tuvo que reubicarse a la familia en una iglesia cristiana para poder asegurar que ellos estuvieran protegidos, ¿verdad? Entonces, pues, eh, para mí el santuario es muy importante y para eso luchamos en México también y desde acá, ¿verdad? Porque aunque estamos nosotros acá protegidos, pero tenemos que seguir luchando para los que vienen atrás estén protegidos también y eso es lo que pedimos siempre eh, a, a nuestro presidente, ¿verdad? Y él es muy humanitario, muy humanitario nuestro presidente. Nosotros creemos que sí, él está haciendo un verdadero trabajo en favor de los migrantes. Y Elvira, mientras estuviste hablando, también pensé con las caravanas de migrantes, con pueblos sin fronteras, que varias de las peticiones que ellos publicaron llamaban para que México sea un país de santuario. Son muchos de estas caravanas migrantes on the road, on the move, en, en movimiento, están imaginando cómo el en el tránsito se pueden crear comunidades de santuario.
y de refugio, que son temporarias, que son frágiles, um, pero comunidades de santuario y, y pueblos sin fronteras demandando que México sea un país de santuario. Cuando, uh, cuando yo fui deportada en 2007, yo visité la ciudad de Ecatepec, Estado de México, no sé si algunos de ustedes lo ubican, pero en ese entonces José Luis Gutiérrez Cureño era el presidente municipal y él declaró el municipio santuario para los migrantes porque era en esa ruta donde los migrantes llegaban, era esta lechería, que era, se puede decir, que la zona más grande donde llegaba el tren y muchos de los migrantes de Centroamérica, ahí era donde bajaban. Entonces, se les secuestraba, se les extorsionaba e incluso el presidente municipal puso el primer albergue por parte de un municipio pagado por el municipio con todos los gastos, con camas y todo se acondicionó y ahí se estaba recibiendo a los migrantes para que pudieran descansar y pudieran y no fueran perseguidos. Entonces, sí había, uh, hubo este, colaboración de ese municipio y, y se declaró santuario el municipio de Catepec. Uh -huh. I was uh, uh, appreciating Andreas's question, and so I kind of wanted to also hear from the the panel about it, because what it's what it's making me think about is, if I understood your question, that you were asking about sanctuary in the context of repressive spaces or in the context of political violence in Mexico with the drug cartels. Is if I understood a part of your question to be asking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so I would love to hear. I mean, especially like Naomi. I'm curious because you have written about Guantanamo, or I'm, I'm thinking about spaces, you know, like Egypt or Palestine, or. Um, and, and whether it, yeah, uh, it's just an interesting question um, that, and I'm just curious about that. Because then what that also made me think about was the, th that sometimes like the right sort of co-ops ideas of oh, sanctuary yeah. as they did with, you know, the victims' rights movement. Yep. And, and so it's just making me think about these other ways of thinking of about it, but I'm just curious about it. I hope it's okay that I'm asking that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is a really great question. And I would say in the context of uh, the U.S. and U.S. border regimes, you see an escalation of organized crime and cartels and trafficking networks in response to the escalation of state violence at the border. Right? So the more walls that go up, the more border guards that you have, the more that you close off, seal, or try to seal off certain parts of the border, the more that migrants have to rely on or think that they need to rely on organized um, cartels or trafficking networks in order to cross at all. And so you really see um, like this kind of escalation of violence, not just by the state, but also in response to the state. So I think we need to look at the responsibility of the state and the accountability of the state for creating the conditions out of which more um, violent, more organized um, crime, uh, uh, criminal cartels like can do their work, right? So it's not just about looking at the cartels themselves, right? It's also thinking about what is our responsibility or what is our government's or our state's responsibility in terms of like um, creating those kinds of conditions. So I think that's really important to think about in terms of if we want to really solve the root uh, causes of organized crime, then we need to look at the state as well, right? And so I think that's part of um, what I would try to direct our attention to. And this is not to say that, you know, um, the cartels are great or that they're not like violent institutions and that they don't harm people, right? But I think that trying to resolve the issue of uh, violent criminal networks by further criminalizing them or by escalating state responses of violence is obviously not working. So maybe we should try something else, right? And so this is where a kind of ab more open abolitionist framework I think could be useful to us in terms of thinking about getting out of these kinds of um, non-solutions 
that clearly haven't been working for decades. Maybe we should try some other kinds of strategies, right? Um, and, it, and, and this isn't to dismiss the fact that these, um, these uh, networks are not real problems, right? But it's just that our solutions are non-solutions and they're actually making the problem much worse. So I, I, that's uh, kind of what I would say. Yeah. We have about three minutes left. Should, should, yeah, should we stack them? Yeah. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Sofía. Uh, vengo acompañando a la señora Elvira. Uh, es, aquí están hablando de los santuarios. Muy perfecto, ¿verdad? Santuarios para los que van llegando. Pero ¿y nosotros qué? Los que ya llevamos aquí 40, 50 años y que no pudimos... Uh, en, en la anterior amnistía no pudimos arreglar. ¿Qué hay de nosotros ahora? Somos trabajadores esenciales, así nos etiquetó el presidente Biden, que somos muy indispensables, pero en cambio, ¿qué hacen? O sea, ¿qué hacen las leyes para nosotros? Uh, nosotros somos humanos, igual que los que están allá en el Congreso, tenemos las mismas necesidades, comemos, lloramos, reímos, nos enamoramos. Ellos también hacen todo eso. ¿Qué nos diferencia a nosotros los indocumentados de ellos? Lo único que nos diferencia es que ellos tienen un puesto, un puesto que pueden decidir lo que se hace y lo que no se hace en las leyes. Por eso desde este momento estamos uh, también exigiendo ¿verdad? A, a, esas, a esos congresistas que sean más humanos que tengan más a misericordia para todos los indocumentados. Los indocumentados vivimos en una esclavitud emocional, esclavitud emocional, eso es lo que estamos viviendo. Porque ¿qué pasa? Un trabajador indocumentado está siempre con el temor de que si me corren de este lugar, ¿verdad? de que tengo que trabajar 12 o 13 horas, y me voy a enfermar. ¿Cuántas personas adultas como yo están tan enfermas? Porque han tenido que trabajar 10, 12 horas, 7 días a la semana y que por ser indocumentados, las empresas les exigen trabajar 7 días a la semana. Porque les dicen, oh, uh, luego le digo a mi amiga, ¿y por qué tienes que trabajar tantos días? ¿O por qué tantas horas? Es que el... el el voz de mi fábrica me dice que si no lo hago, ya no me da trabajo. O sea, nos tienen amenazados de esa manera. Por eso yo le llamo esclavitud emocional. Ah, estamos aquí, o sea, yo vine acompañando, no debería, no debería de hablar, pero me permití tomar el micrófono porque quiero hacer esa invitación a ustedes. El día primero vamos a marchar, el día primero de mayo. Estamos muy preocupados porque nuestra gente por el mismo miedo no acude. Tenemos que hacer fuerza, tenemos que hacer presión. Muchos de nuestros a, amigos, de nuestros compañeros y de todos no quieren salir. Tal vez una, una de las razones es por el miedo, pero la otra razón es porque ya están cansados de luchar. Dicen, ¿para qué? Si no, de todas maneras no nos escuchan. Pero yo les digo, y si no hacemos nada… Tampoco nos van a escuchar, entonces hay que levantarnos, hay que unirnos, hay que hacer fuerza, porque este país se debe a todos nosotros, los que, los que trabajamos de esa manera, los que levantamos a este país. ¿Y quién levantó a este país en la pandemia? Fuimos nosotros, los trabajadores esenciales, porque los, los que tenían sus, sus cheques que les daba el gobierno, o sea, decían, ¿para qué voy a trabajar? Si el gobierno me está dando un cheque, ¿verdad?, y nosotros los indocumentados no teníamos nada, teníamos que salir a trabajar porque necesitábamos comer, necesitábamos pagar nuestra renta. Entonces, no se me hace tan injusto de parte de este gobierno que, 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 que muchos de los indocumentados dan la vida aquí y que no se nos escuchen. Los invito, por favor, pasen la voz a todos, tenemos que hacer eso. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, there are also, we have a few flyers here, so if, you, if you're interested in learning more, we'll pass them around. Um, and can we also, just for a second, acknowledge that Elvira's son, Saul, is here. 
who was just um, Saul was just elected to the Chicago Police District Council, um, and so we're talking a lot about abolition, making safer communities, and Saul is um, on May 2nd going to start that work. So, and congratulations, Saul. So our next panel will start at two o'clock. So we have a short break. Thank you, Thank you all. That was great.
All right. I'll give folks maybe an, uh, 30 more seconds and then we'll get started. All right. Thank you, everyone, for staying till the bitter end. This is the fourth and last panel uh, before the keynote. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, okay, awesome. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you for staying. Um, echoing what everybody has said before me, thank you to um, the, uh, Dean Freeman, who is back here, and all of the staff in LAS who have done such a phenomenal job, to Jonathan and the organizing committee. Um, it's wonderful to be here and um, be a part of this conference, so thank you all for this symposium. This last panel, um, as Jonathan um, announced in the morning, is titled Displacement, um, and I will be chairing the panel. Uh, my name is Gayathri Reddy. I'm an associate professor of Gender and Women's Studies and Anthropology here at UIC, um, and also the co-PI of the Diaspora Cluster, and um, the co-founder with Anna of the Displacements Project that Anna's gonna be speaking about today a little bit. Um, so this panel um, is um, titled Displacement, and I'll just very briefly read out the, um, our, our, um, uh, our abstract that kind of lays out sort of the broad parameters of the, of the panel, and then I'll introduce the first speaker who unfortunately cannot be here, but um, has recorded his presentation and will be here on Zoom for the Q&A. So it's gonna be a, a interesting technical challenge to make sure that uh, he is able to participate, but here we go. So the panel, as I said, is titled Displacement, and it draws on sort of archival research on oral history interviews, on ancestral lived experiences, on performative public art and dance practice. And so this panel traces the long histories of displacement and the material and immaterial ways in which unbelonging and dispossession are marked on racialized bodies and communities in the US. It asks who belongs in this nation, this state, this neighborhood? What are some of the practices of containment through which racialized communities have experienced multiple forms of invisibilization, displacement, and dispossession. And how do struggles over land, housing, and basic human rights speak back to these ideologies and practices of displacement? And so drawing on a range of different media and forms of public engagement, this panel um, you, uh, not only serves as a medium for witnessing these struggles, but also visualizes modes of subaltern resistance in response to these sustained efforts at racial segregation, containment, deportation, and state violence. So with that, I will um, introduce the first speaker, which I think Jonathan, um, had in his opening remarks, referenced um, John Lowe, who will be the first presenter in this panel. Um, John Lowe is, um, uh, a, an enrolled citizen of the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi. He holds two BAs, an MA, a JD, and a PhD, and is currently an associate professor at the Ohio State University, where he's also the director of the Newark Earthwork Center. He is an award-winning author, and his latest book is Imprints, the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi and the City of Chicago and he will be speaking to us today via a prior recorded session, um, and the title of his presentation is Indian Removal from Chicago, From the Trail of Death to a Tale of Erasure. Right. So hopefully this works. Hello everyone, um, John Lau here. Uh, 
thank you for letting me uh, appear before you uh, via Zoom. I wish I could be there uh, in person, but am unable to. But uh, I've been given the opportunity to share this presentation with you. Uh, it comes from a uh, uh, article that I wrote and was published in uh, the spring 2023 issue of Chicago History Magazine. Uh, if you would like a copy of that article, feel free to reach out to me through email, low.89 at osu.edu. So, title of the uh, uh, paper, hopefully fitting with the uh, themes of this uh, conference, is Indian Removal from Chicago, From the Trail of Death to a Tale of Erasure. Chicago is on the lands of the Potawatomi. Why a land acknowledgement for Chicago should acknowledge this historical fact? Well, it's sort of basic. A land acknowledgement should uh, acknowledge who were the original peoples of these lands and perhaps also include, preferably, a call to action also, right? So with land acknowledgements that I've been seeing uh, some have gotten it historically accurate and many have not. And so I'm going to discuss that, uh, why we need land acknowledgements to acknowledge whose homelands Chicago sits upon. So we know that there were a lot of people in Northern Illinois, uh, more than uh, 15, uh, uh, lots of folks. And this is a short, description, I'm not going to read through all the names, but they're people, uh, communities, tribal nations uh, that uh, I suspect some of you, if not many of you, are familiar with, right? So, no doubt this is an area with a lot of people, indigenous peoples living in this area. But, as far as creation stories, as far as I know, the Potawatomi are the only uh, tribal nation that has a creation story that uh, centers them in the <coughs> excuse me, Lake Michigan uh, area. I've heard from my elders creation stories that place us at uh, near Grand Rapids, near Milwaukee, near Chicago. We also have uh, creation stories uh, that uh, place us at the uh, Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. But uh, I don't believe any other uh, tribe, tribal nation situates its creation as being at or near Chicago. For instance, the uh, Miami, their creation story, I believe, is that uh, they were near Mishawaka, Indiana. Uh, the creation story of the Ojibwe and the Odawa is that uh, they're created either at the uh, Straits of Mackinac uh, or also at the uh, Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. I only point that out because it situates the Potawatomi as being here in Chicago from the beginning, at least according to some of our stories. So what's the controversy about? Uh, Part of the uh, controversy is that before uh, the Beaver Wars uh, that started in 1609, where the Iroquois moved into the uh, Great Lakes region and drove the Algonquian people, the residents of the area, from this area, fighting over the resource of beaver pelts, uh, there's no written record of who was where. We have to rely basically on our oral histories and our teachings. When Europeans came here, Joliet, Marquette, et cetera, when they got here and started writing things down, we were in the process of uh, post Beaver War uh, trauma and diaspora. And so tribes that had lived here since the beginning 
were only returning here just as Europeans were arriving. So uh, Joliet and Marquette don't uh, write a lot about the Potawatomi, but we were moving in back into our homeland after uh, this Beaver War conclusion. So it's just a um, accident of history that we don't have very good uh, information written by the settler colonists about who they encountered when they got here. But in our language, uh, we've uh, always been a part of uh, the Gago Nux uh, uh, since the beginning. So uh, I've got some evidence I'd like to share with you. Uh, the maps. Uh, all of the villages, many of the villages, uh, this is just a list, and I apologize for its length, but it just shows that you know, there are not villages in and around Chicago that are in with Miami names, with Ojibwe names, with Odawa names, with uh, Meskwaki names, with Menominee names, Ho-Chunk names. All the, the names are all Potawatomi. I've never seen a map that discloses locations of so many villages in and around Chicago, but in their Potawatomi names, which would indicate that the Potawatomi were the people living in those villages, and the Potawatomi were the people who were naming those villages and occupying this space. So after the Beaver Wars, uh, we can see that uh, Chicago is included in this territory of the Potawatomi that ran from the uh, Keweenaw Peninsula, Green Bay, down to uh, uh, along the western shore of Lake Michigan, uh, to uh, north central Illinois, around Chicago, including Chicago, and up into uh, Michigan and Indiana, all the way to the Detroit and the Maumee River Valley near Toledo, Ohio. So we had a very large territory that we uh, are our homeland. This is another map that was established during uh, the uh, Indian Claims Commission to determine what areas were the lands of whom, the purpose of which was to ascertain who should be uh, entitled to any um, treaty payments, any land payments, any unsettled claims. These court cases before the Indian uh, Court of Claims were uh, based upon uh, many times, not just legal arguments, not just historical arguments, but also the teachings of our elders. The elders testified in court as to who was where and when. And this is a map that reflects what that testimony reflected that Chicago is on the lands of the Potawatomi. This is a map made by one of our uh, language specialists of Pokagon Band of Potawatomi, and it shows how many Potawatomi villages there were in and, uh, well, around Lake Michigan. A lot of them, right? All along that territory that I referenced earlier. And specifically, uh, Kyle Mallett, our advanced language specialist, has determined where our villages were. Again, I'll make note that there's no indications that there were uh, complementary uh, Ojibwe, Odawa, Miami, or other nations' uh, villages so close to Chicago or Chicago. So I think these maps are pretty powerful. But I have more evidence. The treaties themselves. Oftentimes, uh, people will say, this is the lands of the Council of the Three Fires based upon the treaties that were written. But the treaties were written by the United States government, and they referred to us as the United Nation of Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Indians. And that's a fiction. Uh, federal government fiction. We were never a united nation. We were never a council 
uh, in the way that the Iroquois had the uh, their uh, tribe organized into individual tribal councils and then a grand council among the Onondaga. That's not how the Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi were organized. We were referred to as the Council of the Three Fires and Three Fires people just to reflect that we were related to each other, that we are relatives, but we shared no government uh, amongst ourselves. There was no nation, uh, but uh, as uh, James Clifton has uh, said, uh, the historian James Clifton, uh, this was a fiction uh, that the United States government wanted to make sure that mo nobody claimed that they were exempt from removal from that 1833 treaty by claiming, oh, well, I'm not Potawatomi. Actually, on my mom's side, I'm Ojibwe, et cetera. You know, they wanted to include just a great sweeping away. And we know that that's what Indian removal was with a great sweeping away. Uh, this is a uh, late 19th century mural uh, of that 1833 uh, Treaty of Chicago. And it refers to it as the last council of the Potawatomi. It was not understood that there were other people here or it was not imagined that there were other people here. It was the Potawatomi people who were here. So in the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, uh, Leopold Pokagan, our patriarch of our particular tribal nation, negotiated there along with other Potawatomi people and negotiated our exemption from removal and why we're still in Southwest Michigan and Northwest Indiana. So we're very close to Chicago, only some 70 miles away uh, to the east. And as James Clifton said, <clears throat> the so-called United Bands of Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi were from villages in northern Illinois and south central Wisconsin. And the designation was misleading since all those involved were Potawatomi in social identity and political organization. The cover name merely recognized the fact that numerous Ottawa and a few Chippewa had earlier, earlier assimilated into the Potawatomi communities and that the Potawatomi proper had long-standing alliances with these other societies, but this was Potawatomi land. So after the trail, after the Treaty of 1833, there was a great sweeping away of the Potawatomi from Northwest Indiana, uh, Northern Illinois, South, Southern Wisconsin. If the tribes didn't flee to Canada or Northern Wisconsin, they were essentially swept up and removed except for the Pokagon Band, who had negotiated that exemption from a removal. This trail of death that we endured, there's no tale of other tribes being removed on a trail of death. There's no Ojibwe trail of death. There's no Ottawa, Odawa trail of death. The reason why it's the Potawatomi trail of death is we were the people that were here and we were the people that were being removed. The people. So when you think about uh, the historic figures uh, that you're familiar with, uh, Robinson, Wabansi, uh, Saganash, Billy Caldwell, Shabona, all of these people were Potawatomi. Uh, I'm not familiar with, I'm not aware of any Ojibwe or Odawa chiefs that in the early 1800s, uh, we're here in Chicago. So we're all familiar with Dusabo, uh, the sort of founding non-native person to this uh, city. And when he came here, he married a Potawatomi woman and was adopted into the Potawatomi tribe. He didn't marry an Ojibwe woman. He didn't marry an Odawa woman, a Miami woman, a uh, Meskwaki woman. He married a Potawatomi woman and was adopted into a Potawatomi family because that's who was here. It made only sense that, of course, he became Potawatomi. Of course, he married into the Potawatomi because we were the people that were here. So 
were also the only uh, tribe to have sued for the Chicago Lakefront. We sued for the Chicago Lakefront as unceded territory uh, in 1914. It went to the United States Supreme Court in 1917. And I think it's a matter of sovereignty uh, is involved when we make claims about homeland. I don't think it's up to individuals to claim that it's my tribe's homeland. I don't think that's how sovereignty works. I, our tribe, the Potawatomi, sued the Chicago Lakefront. No other tribe has sued for any return or any recompense for Chicago. Why? Because this is Potawatomi land. So this is the current UIC land acknowledgement. And it uh, has the all too common uh, narrative of uh, UIC resides on the traditional territories of the Three Fires people. It doesn't. Uh, it re resides on the territories of the uh, Bodawadmi or the Potawatomi. And I'm not sure what the rest of it is referring to about purchased after two and a half years of open warfare, uh, but in any event, uh, it was the Potawatomi who fought at Fort Dearborn. It was the Potawatomi who signed the Treaty of Greenville that allowed for Fort Dearborn to even be created. That was Chief Tottenby, the first signatory to the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. It was the Potawatomi who were speaking at the Chicago Columbian Exposition, Simon Pokagan. It was the Potawatomi who sued for the Chicago Lakefront. No other tribe has this history or this connection to Chicago other than the Potawatomi. So a proposed uh, land acknowledgement. The University of Illinois at Chicago is situated on the ancestral homeland for the Potawatomi who cared for the land until forced out by non-natives. Uh, uh, Jibwe, Odawa, Peoria, Kaskaskia, Miami, uh, Mascouten, uh, Sac and Fox, Kickapoo, Ho-Chunk, Manami, and other tribes whose names have been lost also gathered and traded in this region. We recognize that this was an intertribal area of traverse and trade. Today, Chicago is home to the largest urban indigenous population in the Midwest, and they continue to honor, honor this land with its and its waterways practices, practice traditions, and celebrate their heritage. And I believe every land acknowledgement should include a call to action. So in, recogn in recognition of this, the University of Illinois at Chicago commits to, and then we need to fill in those blanks, or the UIC needs to fill in those blanks. So thank you for letting me share uh, this uh, moment, uh, this time with you. If you have any questions, I believe that uh, I'll be able to uh, answer those. I'm going to be online during the conference during this time. Again, if you'd like a copy of my paper from the Chicago History Magazine, uh, email me at lau, L -O -W dot 89 at osu dot edu. Miigwech, Iguan, Wawena. Thank you. the historical record and land acknowledgements and for helping us to think through sort of the importance of place of Chicago, what it means to be here and to be displaced from here. So the next presentation um, is by Jian Li, um, who um, is an interdisciplinary artist based in Chicago through performance objects and socially engaged art. Her work explores dynamics of connection, power, violence and resistance. She has worked with social justice and community-based organizations for over 30 years in immigrant rights, economic justice, LGBTQ issues, and domestic violence. She holds an MFA in fiber from Cranbrook Academy of Art, an MA in ethnic studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA in linguistics from Stanford University. And she will be speaking to us um, also sort of speaking to a specific um, project that um, she has been involved with for several years titled Who's Lakefront? So give me one second to get us situated. 
Okay, hello. Is everybody awake? <laughs> Excellent. All right. Uh, so my name is Jian Lee. Annyeonghaseyo. Uh, um, and I want to start off by asking how many of you grew up uh, in and around Chicago? Okay, not that many. All right. And if you did grow up around here, did you know any of the information that Dr. Lau just talked about? A little? Uh huh. Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, let's see. So I grew up. Uh, my family came to Chicago when I was nine, and uh, we had lived in all of these other places before that, starting on the, what is that, the east, going west, uh, Tokyo, Seoul, Stockholm, Lancaster, and then Chicago. Um, and uh, no one told me any of these things when I was going to CPS, and after we moved to the suburbs, to one of the best public high schools in the nation, yeah, no one told me any of that. So, um, uh, partly because of having moved around a lot when I was young, I've always been interested and had to be interested in issues around place, language, culture, assimilation. Um, and when we came to the U.S. in 1980, uh, what my, my father was going to graduate school and my mother ended up um, working at and then becoming the owner of this store over on 47th Street in Bronzeville, which also nobody told me about. So as many of you I'm sure know, Bronzeville is the heart of what was called the Black Belt, where African Americans from the South coming here through the Great Migration were, uh, were confined um, and forced to live in very crowded conditions um, until they were able to win um, policies that allowed them to live in other places. So um, no one told me why our family, Korean immigrant family, would be having this store on the south side of Chicago where we did not live. We lived on the north side. And um, it was all a great mystery. So um, yeah, so partly uh, that mystery um, led me to um, graduate school in ethnic studies at UC Berkeley where I got to learn about things like the middleman minority. Um, and, uh, and many, many years later, after lots of working in different non nonprofits, um, I uh, decided to uh, focus on art. And um, it's been great. Uh, if any of you are ever thinking about it, I say go for it. Because um, in, <laughs> in the current age, you can do what you want and call it art. Um, <laughs> And that is a great thing, because for me, that means like all of my interests in place, in migration, in racism, in colonization, um, and all of the uh, skills I have in project management, and all of the research that I want to do because I'm a curious person and want to talk to people and learn about things, I can do that through art. So I went to art school in the Detroit area. And how many of you have spent much time in Detroit? Ah, yes. So I had not. Um, and when I went to Detroit, I was shocked. Because um, uh, here in Chicago, as you know, we have great segregation. It, it, we are the heart of segregation. But in Detroit, that segregation not only exists, it exists along the city suburb border. And it is very apparent and it is very stark. And I didn't know my way around at all anyway. Um, so when I got to art school, this is what I ended up doing, um, is starting a series of walking projects, um, which is a lot of what my art has been about since then. Um, so using walking as a way to witness the histories and structures of racism and colonization that appear in every place that you ever are. Um, but most of the time, we don't pay attention to because you know we're going to school, we're going to work, and we're in a rush, and we're late. So, um, so, uh, so this first project was uh, walking these five roads. Um, someone had told me about these radial roads that go out from downtown Detroit, uh, which is where they all meet um, at, the, at the south. Um, and that those roads had been created by native people 
Um, and, and some of them were also US military highways when there were forts. Uh, why were there forts? Because uh, the settlers needed to uh, fight off the native people. So, um, so I used this project as a way to try to learn as much as I could about Detroit um, and, uh, and, and look at uh, not only the histories, but also uh, the current situation of these neighborhoods and suburbs and towns and why they look the way that they looked. Um, I think you all know this. If you have your eyes open and you're in a particular neighborhood, if you look around, you can see if there's money in that neighborhood. You can see if there's been investment. You can see who lives there. You can see the class and the race of the people who live there just from looking at the built environment. So, um, yeah, so these were walks I did of 25 miles each. They took about 10 to 11 hours. It is a long time. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, 25 miles, um, when you go through, you go through the city and you go through parts that look like this, and then you go through parts that look like this. Um, and um, I, I learned a lot. And then I came back to Chicago, and I did a series of similar walks here, because um, we also have radio roads um, that cut through the grid that were created by Native people long before there were any uh, European settlers or other settlers of any kind. Um, and I, um, I started trying to learn all of this stuff that I did not know about Chicago, my hometown. Um, and so I read John Lyle's book and he was very gracious and kind to like answer to a cold email and just like talk to me. Um, and, um, and specifically uh, when I read the chapter about the lawsuit that he talked about for the lakefront Again, I was shocked because the lawsuit to me feels like a very modern instrument. Um, and um, because I did not have a lot of relationships with Native people and I was not plugged into the community and the activism and, um, uh, and, and sovereignty issues, uh, in my mind, as I think uh, exists in many other people's minds, Native people existed in the past. Um, and so seeing this very modern way of uh, resistance um, and fighting for sovereignty through, the, um, through this lawsuit um, was really eye-opening to me. And also just reading, reading the actual text itself, um, which is actually very short, um, uh, there were just uh, really dumb things, like the conclusion is really dumb. The only possible immemorial right which the Potawatomi Nation had in the country claimed as their own in 1795 was that of occupancy. So at least they recognized there was a right. If in any view it ever held possession of the property here in question, we know historically that this was abandoned long ago and that for more than half a century it has not even pretended to occupy either the shores or waters of Lake Michigan within the confines of Illinois. I don't know if you were able to get it from um, how Dr. Lau described the lawsuit, um, but the, the, uh, the basis of their claim was that um, all of the treaties, including the Treaty of Chicago, the boundary of the ceded land was the shoreline of Lake Michigan. And ever since settlers have settled here uh, in this area, uh, they have built out the lakefront. It is all landfill. and. Um, Oh, that's that. Anyway, um, where is it? Here. It is all landfill um, uh, built out um, ever since uh, there have been uh, European settlers here that settled here. Um, and so um, the Pokagon um, band had argued that all of that landfill was unceded territory and that therefore the city of Chicago should either give it back or pay for it. And you can see this was. This was the Supreme Court's decision, uh, is that they may have had a right of occupancy, but that they had given it up by not occupying, not occupying this land that existed under the water in 1833. Um, and also by the terms of the Treaty of Chicago, uh, the, uh, the signers, the Potawatomi, had agreed to move, be removed uh, to Kansas, uh, west of the Mississippi, within three years of signing. So that's dumb. Um, anyway, so 
I'm Korean. Um, I come from a place that was also occupied, um, not for as long as the U.S. has been occupied and in a very different kind of way. But, um, uh, but I think we share something about um, we get a little mad, so this made me mad. Um, and so I wanted to do something about it. So uh, when I talked to Dr. Lau, I said, well, I didn't know about this. I think many other people don't know about it. What if we do something that makes people know about it? And I said, well, how about if we draw this line down Michigan Avenue? Michigan Avenue just happens to be where the shoreline of Lake Michigan was in 1833. And I thought, well, why don't we just mark the land itself? This is the boundary between land that was nominally ceded, although that can be argued too, uh, versus the lake bill or landfill, which was never ceded. Um, so this was my initial rendering of it. Many years later, no, actually it was, <laughs> it was supposed to take place within a year and then because of the pandemic, it took two years. Um, and we ended up um, being able to do it in 2021. Um, there were many, uh, there was a big project. Um, part one was um, getting together uh, native folks um, who would be interested in working with me on this. Um, I'm not native, it didn't make sense to do it without um, consultation, direction, advisement. Um, and Dr. Lau was kind enough to introduce me to some other members of his tribe. Um, and I got in touch with the American Indian Center and people introduced me to other people, including the Native American Support Program here at UIC, um, which was Jacob Adams at one point, and then Toll Foster, who is the director there now, um, who were very supportive. Um, and I learned a lot, and I still have much, much more to learn about um, working with Native folks and navigating um, dynamics within the community. Um, and um, and then this so so we made this line, um, uh, not this line specifically, but uh, from Roosevelt up to uh, just north of the Chicago River, and we decided to use sand because that's what that shoreline was was sand dunes, and uh, I got two thousand pounds of red sand from a company in Canada called Sandtastic. And uh, we figured out how to make a line on the ground. And then in October of 2021, we had a procession. Um, yeah, it was amazing. It was about 130 people um, and uh, a number of women elders from the Pokagon Band came and led the procession as well as a couple of um, uh, Native veterans uh, who live in Chicago. Um, and um, we made a mile and a half of red sand along Michigan Avenue, um, passing by really the heart of downtown, as you all know, and passing by uh, various monuments to settler colonialism, um, as well as um, this that I'm guessing many of you have seen, which is by Andrea Carlson, an Ojibwe artist um, based here in Chicago now, who was also on the planning committee for this, whose lakefront um, project. Uh, we put up posters, um, uh, handed out postcards, and um, uh, made this website um, thanks to uh, a graphic design class um, of students um, who's lakefront.com, and it's still live, and it was just the place that I wanted to put all of the resources, all of the research, all of the information that we were drawing on. Um, Look at that, we had a drone, um, and you can see the line and the people. Um, and the line existed for a few days until the city uh, cleaned it up. Uh, that was another big part of uh, this project was navigating the bureaucracy of uh, getting to do this project in public space, uh, which just sort of encap encapsulates all of the issues around who owns the land, who controls the land, who decides what gets to happen on this land. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, look at that. There was a line of red sand on Michigan Avenue downtown. That's like a real place where real people go. Um, and, um, and there's a, we made a video documentary. It's available on YouTube. Um, and ah, so uh, following up on that, I'm currently uh, working on a related project, um, learning about the actual construction of the landfill itself was fascinating. Um, there is garbage in there, 
Uh, there's the rubble from the Great Chicago Fire. Uh, there is uh, slag from U.S. Steel um, that was never sanctioned by anybody um, that they made to expand the factory land. Um, I'm going to finish. Thank you. And um, uh, and so this this project called Shoreland um, is a series of walks, um, uh, audio narratives that you can listen to while you walk. Um, so they're uh, tied to six different points along the lakefront. They have slightly different themes. It is the text of the treaties and the lawsuits and the legislation. All of that landfill didn't happen by sheer willpower. It was a lot of legislation and lawsuits um, and a lot of what I call settler engineering. So, um, so that's gonna that's that's gonna happen um, uh, uh, this summer. So if you're interested. Um, the information is, is on my website, and I'm also on Instagram. Um, but I just wanted to end with this slide to acknowledge all of the people on the planning committee, as well as many friends, including people in the audience, um, who made this really big thing happen. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gian, um, for um, getting us to continue to think about place, to think about art as a way in which to connect with um, um, some of what we do in the university um, and what the talks have been speaking to and to think about settler engineering um, and to continue to get us to think about place in a, a different context and to think about bodies out of place. Um, the next presentation is by uh, Mario Lamont. Mario, um, Dr. L Mario Lamotte is an assistant professor of black studies and anthropology at UIC and also a member of the diaspora studies cluster. His research centers embodied pedagogies of Caribbean arts and expressive cultures and the intersection of queer life worlds and social justice in Haiti. A performance artist, his work, is a pl his work has appeared in multiple journals um, and edited volumes. Um, including uh, the co-edited volume, Time Signatures, Race and Performance After Repetition. Mario Lamotte holds a PhD in performance studies from Northwestern University and his talk today is titled Chrome Avenue, Haiti, Gynecomastia and U.S. Detention Centers. So. <laughs> Bonjour, bonsoir, good afternoon. Detained Haitian men developing big breasts. In the course of my postdoctoral research at Duke University's Haiti archives years ago, I came across this startling, somewhat salacious headline from a May 1982 issue of the New York Amsterdam News, the city's long-running black newspaper. In 1981, a year before AIDS was named so, and two years before people from Haiti were wrongly, accu um, wrongly accused for bringing, bringing it to the United States, dozens of Haitian men held in U.S. detention centers grew breasts. The story sounds like the perverse magical realism associated with Haiti by some in the global imagination. But it was very ordinary racism. Racist immigration policy coupled with racist fear of Haitian contagion and of the bodies of black people. To paraphrase many scholars of Haiti, Studies have illustrated how Haiti has long been depicted as a strange and hopelessly diseased country, remarkable chiefly for its 1884 liberation from the French and its ensuing embargo by colonial powers. 
These resulted into an extreme isolation from nation-building international exchanges. Or, as in a 1989 Vanity Fair headline, Haiti, a bazaar of the bazaar. This afternoon, I, have, I offer highlights of a 45-minute polyvocal protest piece I last performed in 2018 at a dance and theater arts festival. I began semi-nude, exposing my own Haitian flesh and empathy and intention with these men suffering and slowly dressed up by the conclusion. This is not possible today given the time con constraints, but I'm happy to discuss the intention behind that choice in the Q&A. Instead, I adopt and retell remains of a story in a mode of critical fabulation that retraces how Haitian freedom is closely monitored. In terms of my own theoretical inclination, reading this particular headline um, as another trivialization of Haitianness triggered an instance of dédoublage, a fully embodied and continuous process that invokes Haitians voluntary or coerced acts of self-doubling, shape-shifting, and symbolic teleportation through phobias and prescriptions at home and elsewhere. These Haitians too underwent performances of dédoublage as their bodies were used to punish black difference, positionality, and nonconformity as they maneuvered through American anti-Haitianism and anti-blackness. My dédoublage today invites you to be witnesses of a unique story about Haitians' physical statelessness juxtaposed with archived radio interviews with people who dared to brave the seas around that time. As Haitian people crossed the Caribbean Ocean to flee go government repression, the CDC infamously identified four risk groups for HIV AIDS. These were the so-called four H's, homosexuals, heroin users, hemophiliacs, and Haitians, the only black and very specific ethno-national group among the cluster. The long-term effects of this stigma were, of course, particularly devastating to gay men and to Haitian people, two groups who had been socially vulnerable and marginalized long before AIDS appeared. According to the CDC, the exact risk factor, quote unquote, for Haitian people was unknown. Haitians were not any more biologically susceptible to HIV AIDS than people of any other nationality. The elusive unknown risk factor was Haiti's history of colonization, exploitation, poverty, and voodoo as detailed, for instance, by Paul Farmer's AIDS and accusation, Haiti and the Geography of Blame. In the name of delousing these supposed AIDS and voodoo bodies, government employees at Chrome Detention Center in Miami, Fort Allen in Puerto Rico, and other detention centers doused migrants from Haiti with an insecticide spray containing phenotrin a compound with anti-androgenic properties, and slathered them with quell lotion, which contained lindane, a weak estrogen. The spray was labeled not to be used on humans or animals. The lotion was by prescription only, to be used in small quantities and for a limited time. The New York Times, which covered the case years later, underscored that Immigration authorities applied quell lotion to Haitian migrants with a paintbrush, often repeatedly, even when they had no symptoms of lice. Quote, it was a policy at Chrome to de-louse only the Haitians. Cubans and other undocumented aliens were not de-loused upon arrival, end quote. The testosterone suppressing and estrogen boosting properties of these two products, misused, applied improperly, and in excess caused these Haitian men to develop breasts. For the Haitians who had risked their lives at sea to be held in detention centers where their bodies were feared, abused, and deformed, it was a question of courir pour la pluie tomber dans la grande rivière, running from the rain only to fall into the river. I mentioned the epidemic of gynecomastia, unusual growth of male breast tissue to several scholars of Haiti and immigration rights, none of whom had ever heard of it. Few mainstream media sources seem to have picked up on the story as it unfolded then. In April 1982, the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report contained a short article that concluded, quote, 
Two possible hypotheses to explain these cases of gynecomastia are, one, that the diet of Haitians improved greatly after they arrived in the US, causing refeeding gynecomastia, or two, that the affected men were exposed to an estrogen or estrogen-like substance during processing of chrome, end quote. These are the people from shithole countries, as the former president declared. These are the people whose suffering Americans continue to construe as a, as a threat if the September 2021 whipping of Asian migrants at the Del Rio border is any evidence. These are the people whose bodies are viewed either as a source of disease or a source of labor, but never it seems as bodies deserving of protection, whom in sensational news cycle are featured as fatalistic, persistent, callous, overwrought, unfeeling, and thus outside of humanity without naming the white supremacist and American racial capitalist manipulations of the country's environmental and sociopolitical degradations. I hate to do this piece. <laughs> who are these migrants who had taken to the sea in the early 1980s? The US government classified them as economic migrants seeking opportunity abroad rather than political refugees. In other words, they were fleeing poverty rather than persecution. This distinction relies on an artificial and arbitrary separation of the economic and the political. In the 1970s and 1980s, millions of Asian people were, who were not direct victims of the Duvalier regime's violent oppression, who were not among the political prisoners tortured and killed, oftentimes publicly, were nonetheless victims of the dictatorship. The poverty and hunger they, they fled resulted from the exploitation, land dispossession, and taxation of the Haitian poor by the Totomakut, the Duvalier's henchmen, and capricious and greedy authority figures. The distinction between economic migrants and political refugees relies as well on political expediency as far as the US is concerned. Jean-Claude Duvalier, the younger man in the image, um, Jean-Claude Duvalier's government um, was inarguably repressive even if it wore a veneer of liberalism in comparison to his father's regime. Jean-Claude was a right-wing dictator. He was also the US's man in the Caribbean, like his father before him, an avowed anti-communist, a hop, skip, and a jump from Cuba. We, the United States, funneled aid money to his government. And after the election of Ronald Reagan in November 19, 1980, the, the Haitian government no longer had to pay even lip service to human rights. In the spring of 1980, anti-Duvalier journalists Comper Philo and Jacques Price, who were later persecuted, tortured, and exiled, condemned the dictatorship repeatedly by interviewing people as they prepared to flee and by airing their stories. Quote, people in the hold can't breathe, shared a man before his second crossing attempt. There are Haitians who go mad, who fall into the sea, even if you're his brother, you can't speak up, shut your trap. If you get angry, you'll be in the water too. Even if it's your mother, let her drown, shut your mouth, don't speak. When you get to Canal du Vin between Haiti and Cuba, you're going to puke your guts out against the roiling sea. If it's their day, they'll get there. If it's not their day, death will take them. They will not see the promised land. Uh, I'd see it's, it's its own kind of misery, explained the man. We're all crammed together like how, you, how they pack cans of milk. Women, well, women, when they have their blood, there's not even water for, for them to wash themselves. When the captain is going to sleep at night, uh, he looks down in the hold, and if he finds a girl who looks good and healthy, healthy he sleeps with her. The captain will give them water to wash themselves, and they'll sleep together. Even if the captain mistreats her after, some of the women think that they are lucky to be chosen." End quote. But we know all too well that there's more to the story than a man's perspective of women servicing a captain in this manner. That same spring of 1980, journalist Jean-Dominique and Michel Montas reported from Miami on the prejudicial treatment of Haitian asylum seekers under US immigration policy. 
Montas interviewed the deputy director of immigration services. Quote, the Cuban, when they arrive at Key West, to a man, their story is, I'm leaving um, Cuba because of the political situation, and if I return, I would be, you know, which is a claim for to political asylum. The Haitian inevitably, on the first contact with us, when he steps off the boat, he says, I'm looking for a job. I'm coming here to work. I want to support my family. You know, we have this humanitarian feeling for these people, but this does not meet the definition of political asylum. Therefore, we do not accept it at that point as a political asylum claim. However, once the person gets into the community and he seems to meet, he meets the other Haitians who are here and the attorneys involved, he learns very quickly, ah, you must say these magic words. At that time, he comes back and says, give me the papers for political asylum. Our position relative to the Haitians is that we don't feel that they are persecuted when they are returned to Haiti. We have no proof through the Department of State, of course, who is our eyes and ears in foreign countries that would convince us that they fear uh, persecution if they are returned. In a more just world, immigration policy would not hinge upon the victim's ability to frame and package their own suffering in institutionally approved ways. But so many rights-based claims do in the Haitian context and elsewhere. The immigration offic official expressed scorn for Haitian asylum seekers who learned the right way to tell their stories as though they were savagely trying to game the system. He seemed not to consider or to care that Haitians might have an equally valid claim to political oppression as Cuban refugees, that the difference was not a degree of quality of suffering, but of knowing the narrative. Jean-Dominique closed the broadcast with a call for solidarity. Political refugees are political asylum seekers. The Haitians are here. Their desperate odyssey, their silent determination to work, the fear that fills their eyes, all of this is laid out in the United States on the front page of the daily paper, on the television screen, commented upon on the radio. All of this rallies certain conscious Americans just as it, as it weighs upon our own conscious. Without a doubt, there are other boat people throughout the world, but these, they are our brothers, and we're all responsible for them, and of commentary. They were not only Haitian. They were men. They were adult men. They were adult black men. When was the last time you saw a brochure for a humanitarian agency with a glossy image of an able-bodied black man on the cover? If there are institutionally approved ways of narrating one, one's own trauma in order to be considered a legitimate victim, there are also categories of people who are considered especially innocent and deserving of protection, sometimes in a legal sense, sometimes as a social fact, sometimes both. Children, women, the disabled, the elderly, white people. In America today, a single missing white girl is a tragedy while a hundred missing black and brown girls is not even a statistic. A black child is an adult in the eyes of the police. And the myth of black men as hypersex and aggressive and monstrous is as old as this country itself. The men we enslaved, got rich off of, and feared, the Haitian men on Chrome, Chrome Avenue, to borrow the words of poet Félix Maurice Oluwa. In 1987, 30 Haitian men, by then former detainees living in the U.S. and seeking residency, filed a civil lawsuit against the federal government, contending that the misuse of chemical insecticides by detention center staff caused them to develop abnormal breast tissue. The physical damage was so extensive, they had to have surgery. They lost the lawsuit. Many, especially those who felt emasculated, are unwilling to retell and relive this story. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Mario, for that sobering um, um, but important um, witnessing, but also um, call to kind of think about bodies out of place in different ways. The next presentation and the last presentation, I know we're running a little bit late, but is um, 
by um, Anna Guevara. Um, Anna Guevara, uh, Professor Anna Guevara is an associate professor and the founding director of the Global Asian Studies program at UIC. Her interdisciplinary scholarship, teaching, and community-engaged work focuses on immigrant and transnational labor, the geopolitics of care work, the Philippine diaspora, and critical race and ethnic studies. She co-founded the Displacements Project uh, with me, and she um, holds a PhD in sociology from the University um, of uh, California, Irvine, and her talk today is going to be about the project writ large, Displacements, a People's History of Uptown. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I think my colleagues at University of California in San Francisco will, will um, want to make sure that I call out UC, UCSF. But, um, <laughs> yes, from the ant eaters. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I just wanted to begin by just uh, saying thank you uh, to uh, my co-panelists for your presentations, John, Gian, and Mario uh, Gaitri for uh, moderating and also really a special shout out to Vicky, um, without whose labor this would not be possible. So thank you so much. <laughs> so just thinking about the presentations that came before me, um, in many ways, the project that I'm about to share with you that Gayatri and I co-founded is um, about storytelling. But I think in the process of doing this work, it's, we've learned, at least I've learned, I don't wanna speak for Gayatri, but I've also learned not just how to become a storyteller, but also how to listen and how to perhaps um, shift when the community asks you to shift and to use the tools that they empower us to use um, rather than you know, really come at them with particular, um, particular medium. So um, this project as Gayatri, um, articulated earlier is um, one that we co-founded in 2019. It's a public history project. Um, it's a digital uh, multimedia project that um, attempts to, to tell and narrate and share submerged histories in one particular neighborhood in Chicago in the north side called Uptown. And a project of this magnitude really could not have been possible, you know, we could not have done something like this on our own, so I also wanted to acknowledge all of the students um, who have participated and helped build this project. Um, Kenny Allen, Ria Sharma, Shilpa Menon, Tamal Elawala, Abdul Bashir, Laura Sato, and a lot, many, many undergraduate students, uh, some of whom are here and will be here who have participated in this project. So huge gratitude, gratitude to all of them. So what we are trying to do with this project is to unearth and visualize the long history of displacements in this one uh, neighborhood, as I said, um, called Uptown from the perspective of racialized uh, communities as a way to tell a different story of Chicago, um, Chicago's urban history um, and mirror larger themes about indigenous displacement as John narrated earlier about the Great Migration, which Gian um, pointed to, about gentrification, about militarism, and most importantly, to connect various issues, um, whether that's militarism and migration, police brutality and gentrification, through the lives of racialized communities and their everyday and historical struggles. So Uptown has been a portal, uh, many of you will know, has been a portal for migrant and immigrant communities with multiple communities that were displaced to this neighborhood. And most importantly, these displacements of various communities in many ways were often a product of intentional segregation by design. Native Americans who were displaced from Chicago by treaties as John highlighted earlier, and later by intentional urban relocation programs that displaced them back to Chicago from reservations. There were also multiple communities that were displaced by wars, many of which the U.S. Uh, played a central role 
such as the Southeast Asia, um, Southeast Asia resulting, you know, such as in Southeast Asia resulting in the Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian refugees who relocated to Uptown. Uptown was also home to Bosnians from former Yugoslavia, as well as Eritreans and Ethiopians following the wars in the Horn of Africa. Uptown was also a neighborhood where Japanese Americans were relocated to uh, post-World War II following their incarceration in various ca camps across the US. Puerto Ricans were displaced multiple times in Chicago, nine times according to Jose Chacha Jimenez, who tells this particular story, and their pen penultimate displacement was from Lincoln Park in Uptown, um, or Lincoln Park to Uptown as, as a result of gentrification. The mechanization of the coal mines, as many of you know, um, also pushed uh, white Appalachians and African-American coal miners to Chicago, and many of them migrated and were uh, resettled to Uptown, which became actually the largest um, Appalachian community outside of Appalachia. Uptown was also a destination uh, for African Americans uh, pushed out of the Deep South by Jim Crow laws, and I could you know, enumerate on a number of other communities, but the main point here is to highlight that Uptown has been a port of entry, a port of um, a gate in, in many ways for various migrants across the US. As a result, Uptown became this uh, multiracial neighborhood. It was a multiracial anomaly, as some scholars would say, in a segregated city that revealed the underside of that segregated order. And in many ways, Gian talked about this in her presentation. The ways in which people who uh, were thrown together as a result of these histories intentionally actually um, came together to fight back. That is, people who could not fit into the segregated order became a community of people who willfully would not fit into Chicago's uh, segregated order. So what we tried to, to do in this particular project is to trace these uh, various displacements, but also engage in a kind of intentional counter-narrative with these community members who we have been working with um, for a few years now. So um, there's a specific um, kind of ref visual reference on the title of our project, this with a dash placement, really to signify the kind of um, counter narrative that we're trying to highlight, but also to signify the kind of um, emplacements and placemaking that we are also trying to present as a counter narrative to multiple forms of displacements that these communities have experienced for decades. So in the interest of time, um, I will highlight one specific example of a counter narrative, exploring what it means to, to live through this racism and segregation and um, introduce you to um, one of our key interlocutors, the Winthrop family. So as um, Gian highlighted earlier, segregation um, in Chicago is, I mean, is a well-known fact, and, but when we think about segregation, we often focus only on the South Side. Less well known is that um, the same tactics of segregation, of redlining, of race restrictive covenants, of block busing, um, were also deployed on the north side. And one example was in Uptown, which is one of the earliest settlements of African Americans on the north side of the city. Uh, thanks to a race restrictive uh, petition that was circulated and um, spearheaded by the Central Uptown Association, or C. UA and signed by 1,500 white prop, uh, property owners and residents of Uptown who were fearful of the so-called and quote unquote colored invasion of Uptown, African Americans were segregated to live on just one block of Uptown on the 4600 block of Winthrop Avenue. So in the face of this, you know, I mean, it's this particular segregated order, the residents of this block who referred to themselves as the Winthrop Avenue family came together to form, to figure out a way to live through this segregated order. And they created a tight knit family, which they are very proud of, and a, a very you know, tight community of uh, members who were trying to just navigate this uh, particular landscape. Much like Sadia Hartman noted, care was an antidote to violence, to racism, to segregation for members of the family, a community that continues to exist today 
more than 100 years later, but many of whom live elsewhere in Chicago and are because of, and we can talk about this, this in the Q&A, it is very uh, expensive to live in uh, Uptown. And so many of them, while they wish to stay or return to Uptown, are unable to. So they are all, they're scattered throughout the city, but also um, across the U.S. So speaking to the afterlives of slavery in her book, uh, one of the um, one of the inspiration for our work and in the ways that we analyze um, and engage with the Winthrop family is the work of Christina Sharp, who wrote um, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, and where she says, even as we experienced, recognized, and lived subjection, we did not simply or only live in subjection and as the subjected. And so this stories of Winthrop Avenue family in many ways echo this statement. They were and are fully aware of the racism and segregation that their ancestors experienced, but they choose and they push us, actually, <laughs> Gayatri and myself, push us to reframe the narrative told about them, uh, told about their stories. And they underscore a counter narrative where they serve as not only merely, you know, as not merely subjects of racism and the so sordid saga of segregation in Uptown, but instead they emphasize love, laughter, sharing food, planting seeds, caring, community building, as their narrative, as the kind of story that they want to tell about themselves. And here are a couple of their stories and um, what I just want to share a few of them with you. One of the fondest memories was right across the street was a playground. And, you know, they didn't have the, you know, nowadays they make swings out of a rubber, a tough rubber. Back then, swings were wooden. So there was always someone jumping off of the swing. Once they get real high, then the swing comes back to hit them in the head, and then you're on your way to the ER white hospital to get some stitches. So uh, one of the fondest memories was that playground. Uh, because everything really was based around older, older people. But that was the one thing that belonged to the children, was the playground. And it wasn't always there. But Mama Sophie, which is Sophia O'Brien, right? Uh, her and a few of the other elders, uh, when we had a block party, they made it a project to put a playground there. And, and they did it, and they did it, and it, it's, um, it blessed us. And you say you would play together in the playground. So who were all the other okay. on, on my Well, mainly, it would be uh, my siblings, okay, so it's four mm -hmm. of us, right? Mm -hmm. Well, on the second store, uh, floor was Miss Green, and she didn't have any children. But on the first floor was Miss Askew, okay? Miss Askew was, um, um, she was white, but her husband, uh, Butch, he was, he was black. So her children were mixed, and mainly it would be playing with them. And to this day, we are still connected. When I say we're a family, Winthrop Avenue, we're family. So another favorite that I remember about Winthrop Avenue, is the back porch. Oh, there was two huge back, uh, big trees. And the leaves hung over the porch. So we were on the third floor. You could actually reach some of the leaves that were hanging. The leaves had beans in them. It, it, it looked like um, whole green peas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but bigger, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, being a girl, you know what we did. We played house. So that was wonderful play. The neighborhood was full of nature. I'm gonna say that. So between the trees and 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 many people had flowers in their backyard. The one thing about the community, you really unless something was special going on, you really didn't see people playing in the front yard. Or was Miss Brook? So that is Cheryl Clark. She talks for a long time and she has many stories. And I wanted to share that with you because these are the kinds of stories that, um, that they want us to, to tell. 
about the Winthrop Avenue family, about what they remember, and the kind of uh, placemaking strategies that they're also attempting to engage in in this particular, I mean, in a, in a space that has, um, where they're very familiar with this, I mean, they know of the segregated order, they know the state violence has created uh, this particular space and restricted them to this particular space, but the stories they want to tell are these stories that they remember about their families and the kind of home that they've made on this particular block. Um, I wanted to just conclude, I know that um, I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to conclude with um, this particular image and the previous slide is, a, um, is part of this image. This is an artwork that was designed by Anandita Vidyarti, who is a, an undergraduate student here um, at UIC, who is um, minoring in Global Asian Studies, and a um, beautiful artist, and who is quite talented, and she worked with us over the summer to um, look through and listen through some of the interviews that we've conducted with the Winthrop family and try to render their stories um, visually and creatively. So um, she titled this piece, uh, Gold Down Winthrop Avenue, and that is um, explicitly referencing a particular form of art, Japanese art called kintsugi, which is a practice in Japanese pottery that joins broken pieces or potential cracks or imperfections with gold, uh, specifically gold. And it doesn't, and the idea is to not discard the pieces or hide the blemishes or imperfections but instead to highlight and highlight them actually, um, transforming the final product into a new and different, but no less beautiful um, product. And this is just uh, for your information, a 16th century form of art, which has re recently been rediscovered not only as an art form, but also as a philosophy and a worldview to navigate life. So uh, with her particular artwork, um, what we're trying to, um, what it's allowed us to tell is this particular counter narrative um, narrated by the Winthrop family members who again are fully aware of racism, of the racism that they lived through, that their families, their ancestors lived through, the segregation, the segregated order, the violence um, that their ancestors experienced, but choose to focus on the texture of their resilient lives on the laughter, the joy, the pleasures, the collective meals, the light excursions, the dancing on the streets, the abundance of love, and the practices of community building that indicate what it means to live through these practices otherwise. The counter-narratives of the Winthrop family reveal a very different story, a different picture than what, that, than what is told about them through the lens of displacement and discrimination. Instead, their counter-narratives highlight and narrate stories filled with joy, filled with laughter and caring. And this is a way for them uh, not necessarily to forget their past, but to reframe what is seen and also what is heard, to produce a counter-narrative that places them going down uh, Winthrop Avenue with abundance and with gold, uh, sharing joy, laughter, and creating a deeply knit, um, tight-knit community that has withstood the test of time. Thank you. Unfortunately, well, it's a nice hopeful note to end on, but unfortunately, we have run out of time. We are all available for if you people, anybody has questions, please feel free in the break to uh, come up to us and ask us questions, but unfortunately, we'll have to end this session right now. So. Thank you all very much. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andreas Feldman. I'm associate professor at the Latin American Latino Studies program in the Department of Political Science. I'm also uh, the PI of the uh, Global Migration Cluster. And I have the honor of introducing our, our keynote, keynote speaker, uh, Valeria Luiselli. Before I do that, I would like to start by thanking the, the organizers, uh, the LAS team, uh, the Dean and Vicky and, and her team, also my colleagues in, in the organizing committee. And I would like to start by taking the liberty of saying that in a, in a more sort of personal sense, this is a very satisfying and rewarding uh, occasion uh, because in a way it shows the fruits uh, of the cluster initiative. And I, I, I see many colleagues here who have been working on this and it has been a long, at times a bit torturous process. Uh, Jenny's laughing. Uh, but I think the ones who actually had the idea in mind had precisely this sort of end product probably, you know, this idea of having a, a group of scholars. I mean, UIC was, before many of us came here, uh, a site of, of really excellent work in migration, broadly conceived. But the idea was to, in a way, fulfill two objectives. On the one, on the one hand, diversify the faculty, and on the other, try to sort of harness the potential that UIC had. And just by seeing many of the ones who were hired, um, young, talented, committed, uh, just the level of this, this conference in a way shows that. And I think it, it reveals the incredible potential that there is here, and a potential that I hope we can harness in, in the future. But I, I must say it gives me a lot of satisfaction. So before becoming too emotional about this, I'll, I'll, I'll start by uh, thanking and, and, and well doing what I'm supposed to do, which is introducing Valeria. So I'm honored to introduce Valeria Luiselli as a keynote speaker this afternoon. Uh, professor Luiselli is a Sari Samuelson Levy Professor in Languages and Literature at Bard College and a visiting professor at Harvard University. She was born in Mexico City and grew up in South Korea, South Africa, and India. An acclaimed writer of both fiction and nonfiction, she's the author of several novels, essays, and short stories, including Sidewalks, Faces in the Crowd, the story of my teeth, uh, Tell Me How It Ends, an essay of 40 questions, and Lost Children Archive. Her work has also appeared in, in several uh, outlets, uh, media outlets, including The New Yorker, The New York Times, Renata, and Max Sweeney. Um, she's the recipient of, and bear with me, because she's, recipient, she's the recipient of several awards, um, very prestigious ones, including the Dublin Literary Award, two Los Angeles Times Book Prizes, the Carnegie Medal, and the America Book Award. She has also been nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Kirkus Prize, and the Booker Prize. In addition, she was the recipient of the 2019 MacArthur Fellowship, a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree, and Bearing Witness Fellowship from the, Arts, from the Art for Justice Fund. Beyond her artistic creation and scholarly work, Professor Liselli is involved in various activities to promote social justice and give voice to migrants, refugees, people deprived of, from their freedom, as well as victims of gender violence. There are many examples of this, and this reflects, I think, in, in her wonderful work. Um, following her work as a translator for detained migrants, she started a liter literacy program for girls in a detention center in upstate New York that focuses on creative writing. Professor Liselli holds a BA from the uh, famous UNAM in Mexico, and a PhD in comparative literature from, the university, from Columbia University in New York. So without further delay, let's warmly welcome Professor Liselli with a round of applause. <laughs> and just one last thing. So Professor Liselli will you know, read part of uh, her, her new work, and then uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end of, of her reading. Thank you. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Hi, thank you very much, everyone. Is the sound okay? Yeah? So yeah, this is it's not n like my new work. This is a, a new essay, <laughs> just something I'm working on. And 
I haven't really written anything about um, uh, the period in which I worked uh, uh, giving a, a workshop in a detention center. Um, it's been more than four years since, since then. And I, the last um, non-fiction piece that I wrote uh, really about um, un undocumented children in the immigration system was a long time ago. So somehow pa time has passed quickly and that book was called Tell Me How It Ends. And it's a book that doesn't speak about something that came later. Um, it, that's not quite accurate. It was already happening then, but it became more and more the practice, which was that a lot of children uh, that passed through the, through the immigra immigration system and used to pass only very briefly through detention spaces called shelters, but detention spaces, in the period in which I was working in those spaces, they would be detained for much, much longer. But I speak about this a little bit here. Uh, so I don't, I don't write about that in Tell Me How It Ends because it didn't seem to me then, um, it, I was really not aware that that was what was coming, but that's what was brewing. So uh, I've written a text. Um, I haven't yet read this out loud, so uh, let's see how it goes. Um, and here it is. It's for now called Sometimes, Still, and Across. A few years ago, following a period in which I had served as a volunteer interpreter for undocumented children in deportation proceedings, I decided, I decided to start a small writing workshop in a detention center near New York City. The students were a group of girls between the ages 12 and 16. Most of them had crossed the US-Mexico border without a visa and had been detained by Border Patrol and had then been locked up in this dark place, a place similar to so many others of its kind, a type of place which the government cynically calls shelter but which is unquestionably a, a carceral space for children. In the last session of our workshop, I asked the girls to write five sentences beginning with a veces, which means sometimes. I thought that a sometimes could be a way to make space for the little things that happen, either flickering instants of the psyche or of mundane everyday events, and that passes by almost always unnoticed or ignored. Sometimes I brush my teeth without toothpaste. Sometimes my friend farts in class. Sometimes I'm afraid of adults when they laugh. Sometimes I don't have enough strength. I understand writing in this way, like the space that opens with sometimes. Or rather, I am interested in the kind of fiction that is coded in sometimes. Fiction that hinges on surprising readers, on constantly keeping them on edge, is written in a kind of suddenly. The writing that comes from again was perhaps born with, but also self-exhausted with Beckett, because it was paradoxically, paradoxically irrepeatable. No longer has Gregor Samsa stuck to a bed, lost in the intricate pathways of guilt, and it has the band of children and Lord of the Flies leaving behind whatever humane attributes they once had and giving themselves over fully to being indisputable motherfuckers. Once upon, fiction is sweetly tucked away in the mausoleum of fairy tale and fable. Fiction written in never is by definition impossible. And I'm not sure what to make of fiction in still, but I may come back to that later. And I don't come back to it later, not in this version yet. <laughs> I, but in another version, I will. <clears throat> in the specific case of this particular workshop, a workshop taking place in a situation of physical confinement and psychological terror, where the students were not only living in detention, but were also being subject to a removal proceeding, this sometimes was maybe an opportunity, I thought, small but real, for the opening of a parenthesis. A parenthesis that is, that made space for a narrative outside the repetitive, beyond the determined, beside what is mandated by the implacable clockwork of routine behind closed doors. A parenthesis for a time outside time and outside of doing time, a door that opens sometimes. <laughs> 
We all took our seats around the dining table, and my niece, who was helping me give the workshop, distributed blank journals and pencils. Some girls were happy with the design of their journal cover, some were not, some traded. As we began to introduce ourselves, some girls looked at us expect in expectant silence, others with a little interest, others with less, justifiably skeptical. One girl whispered something in another's ear. A staff member from the center reprimanded her, respeto. We were two years into the Trump administration, and the panorama for undocumented minors had changed significantly. The turn things took, like most things in those years, were for the worse or the much worse. The agency in charge for centers of, for unaccompanied minors is not ICE, but the ORR. This is thanks to something called the Flores Agreement, which the Supreme Court passed in 1993 and which set up minimal standards in, for living conditions in detention spaces for children, such as being allowed to sleep on a bed or having access to clean drinking water. The Flores Agreement also ensures, quote, prompt release of children from immigration detention. During the Obama years, children who arrived alone to the US were held in these shelters or centers for a few days or weeks and released as soon as possible to a family member. But after family separation policies took hold in the Trump years and during the rampant increase of ICE raids that resulted in the mass displacement of people from their communities into detention centers, uniting or reuniting a child with their adult family member became much more difficult, sometimes impossible. Children and teenagers were being held, therefore, in these spaces for many months, and in some cases, years. A few of the girls in the workshop had been transferred several times from state to state, place to place, without ever knowing when their forced peregrinations through the detention system would ever end. From the kitchen adjacent to the dining space, a potent smell of lentils blew in intermittently toward us. Sometimes when I smell boiling lentils, I remember a story my daughter's paternal grandmother often tells about when she was a little girl and they fled Spain, the Spain of Franco, and were thrown into the concentration camp in Argel-sur-Mer, just across the northern border. Sometimes, when there were not enough lentils for everyone to eat, the woman in the camps would boil shirt sleeves and bits of trousers. Children ate that cloth and lentil soup and asked no questions. I wondered what the girls in the workshop were being fed and if they asked questions. A layout. First, our small writing circle sitting around the table. Then, in its immediate periphery, three staff members sitting on chairs pushed up against the wall. They were there to oversee the workshop. Then, beyond and above the caretakers, hanging at an angle from the corners of the room, cameras that surveyed us all. I'm not sure who surveilled the eyes behind the screen, behind the camera, but I imagine that these concentric circles of surveillance had to end somewhere, maybe in Pennsylvania or Kentucky. We had clear instructions. Not a single piece of writing was to leave the center. Only things the only things allowed in were writing materials and books. We were not allowed to talk about the girls' cases in the workshop, meaning we could not suggest writing exercises that would lead them to write about the reasons why they migrated or about their migration journey. The reason for this was simple. Anything that they wrote down would constitute evidence, a document potentially used against them in the deportation preceding trial, even if it were fictional. A lawyer and friend also advised us not to suggest exercises that would incite the girls to talk or write about their circumstances in confinement. There was no written prohibition on this, but it was quite clear in every stage of our work there, from the moment I pitched the workshop to the period in which we awaited approval while we were cleared by ICE and later by the center's administration, to the small interactions with staff in the center itself, that there is a certain nervousness in allowing a stranger in who might later leak information out. 
there is a secretiveness in the way detention spaces are operated that exceeds, and this is from talking to friends that do a lot of work in prisons and sort of comparing stories, but there is a, there is a, there is a kind of um, operation that exceeds uh, the secretiveness even of that of normal prisons, normal quote unquote normal prisons. When we were in the early stages of planning the workshop, conscious of the restrictions we had, but still largely unaware of the kind of surveillance there would be, I tried to imagine ways for the workshop to allow a space for the girls to denounce the conditions they were under without getting into trouble by doing so. I came up with a plan, a plan that ultimately failed, but it failed well, and it's a failure worth recounting because failures are often a lot more telling than stories that simply go well and end well. This was the plan. We could read the Quixote together, which Cervantes actually had written in a prison. It was a light-hearted, but also deep and wildly imaginative book, and its chapters were almost always short, so we could read them out loud at the beginning of each session and then still have time to devote the second part of the session to writing. After some sessions, we'd come up with a system of equivalences and correspondences between the world of the Quixote and the reality in which the girls were living. For example, the famous windmills would be equivalent to ICE officers, and the band of Galicians in chapter 10 would be equivalent to the staff in the detention center. We would slowly, together, refine this system of equivalences by means of drawing analogies during informal, during informal conversation, and then eventually each girl would have a kind of cheat sheet connecting the two worlds. That's where we could start playing. I'd give them prompts for short fictional scenes written in Quixote code. All of them would be quotidian scenes, humorous, nothing incriminating for the detention center itself. However, by now, the girls would have a code, and if they ever needed to use it, they could, amongst themselves or with us, if we gained their trust enough. The important thing, or so I thought, was to give them the instruments for whenever they might need them. After all, that's what writing is for. In any case, I wrote to a publisher, and they generously donated 20 Quixotes, and we arrived in the center on our first day with boxes full of paperbacks, good intentions, and a good deal of ignorance. The plan, as I've already said, failed. It failed, first of all, for the most obvious reason, which was that the amount of surveillance, or the type of surveillance, simply made the whole plan too risky for the girls, even if we tried to dress the whole experiment in humor and Quixote-like Quixote delirious imagination, discussing why ice might be like windmills and if the staff in the center might correspond better to the donkey in the donkey scene, or the Galicians who beat the shit out of Don Quixote and Sancho, excuse my archaic Spanish, was simply too dangerous. The worst thing that could happen to us would be to get kicked out. But the consequences for them, for the students, were of course much more serious, very real, and even life-changing. There were always staff members present, listening to our every word, and then there were the cameras, and who knows where those led. Second, the plan failed for a reason I should have foreseen but didn't. Almost all the girls, except the few of those that had grown up in capital cities, spoke Spanish as their second language. They were speakers of Mayan languages, among them Achi, Chu, Itza, Quiche, Man, Mopan, Quechi. They all spoke Spanish, as that's the language imposed by the Latin American governments in schools, even in indigenous communities. But reading the Quixote is not easy, not an easy task for any young reader, with its archaic lexicon and peninsular conjugations no longer in use in Latin America. We read some paragraphs out loud together, and I immediately sensed a deflation of what enthusiasm there might have been in the room. I also suppose that a story about an old man from La Mancha was not immediately appealing for teenage girls. <laughs> Last, the plan failed for a great reason. And the reason was that the girls already had a written code language. And as soon as we had passed around the journals, pieces of paper were being ripped out and notes were being passed around. We only realized this at the end of the first session when we were picking up and packing up and saw a mysterious looking note, half in Spanish, and asked one of the girls what kind of code it was written in. She smiled, a little mischievous, big, smart black eyes, 
and said nothing. Immigration cases are not criminal cases. Migrating without documents is not a crime, as some people believe it to be. It's considered an administrative fault. And therefore, it is the immigration court and not the criminal court that processes immigration cases. Following this logic, one would think that the ultimate punishment for migrating would not be prison, since there was no crime in the first place. But in reality, this plays out quite differently. Since the creation of, Department of the Department of Homeland Security in 2002, so it's not that old, not that necessary, since the creation of the Department of Homeland Security in 2002, migrants have been increasingly criminalized. They're detained, in legal jargon, under the suspicion of being deportable, which is as ridiculous as anyone saying that someone is punished under the suspicion of being punishable. Under such suspicion, tens of thousands of people a year are incarcerated until proven not guilty. That is, until the judge has reviewed their case and determined whether the person is eligible for asylum or other forms of immigration relief, or if, on the contrary, the person is not eligible and will be deported. That decision can take months or years, and in the meantime, the person remains locked up. And unlike most citizen prisoners, 90% of whom are in publicly run prisons, the vast majority of undocumented migrants are sent directly to privately run prisons or detention centers. In fact, as of 2022, 79% of the undocumented population who is incarcerated is in a private facility. All of this means that while a person remains in detention for waiting for a decision on their non-criminal case, there is a company that is making money. Geo Group, for example, one of the largest companies in the prison industrial complex, has a net worth of $1.2 billion right now and grew 40% in 2023. They receive tens of millions each year from congressional appropriations, therefore your taxes, my taxes, and in return fund individual campaigns very generously. Marco Rubio, for example, received 60K from them in 2022. By the way, this give and return process, even in Mexico, is called corruption. <laughs> the case for minors is different, but not so different. The centers where accompanied, unaccompanied minors are kept while they wait for their cases to go to trial or while they're able to reunite with a family member are owned by nonprofit organizations that have contracts with the government. I asked a lawyer about this, whether the nonprofit organizations that operate so-called shelters for children are indeed fully nonprofit. She chuckled. There's no real way to know, she told me. How can I find out? I asked her. You can file a FOIA, but even so, that might not give you a straight answer. As the weeks went by in our workshop, we tried out writing prompts, games, narrative strategies. I like a prompt inspired by the Olipo, which involves asking students to write one, a one-paragraph bio, and then once they've written it, to write it again, this time with a constraint. The constraint is they cannot use the letter E at all. The results are marvelous, because the second version is usually much better, full of unexpected solutions, even humor. Someone who writes, I am a student, the first time around, may write, I am a human child who is at school, the second time. The discussion around that particular exercise is always illuminating, because students tend to quickly realize how a constraint, or what was perceived as an obstacle, is in fact the reason why their writing suddenly picked up. Circumnavigation leads to discovery. But we still had a problem. We still had an enormous obstacle, and we hadn't found an imaginative way around it. A couple of girls had gotten into trouble with the staff of the detention center for something they had written in their journals. The staff wouldn't tell us what it was and why they were in trouble, but their journals had been confiscated, and that day they had to borrow pieces of paper. We were annoyed, of course, at the staff, why would they be reading the journals in the first place? But of course, there's no privacy in detention, and we should have known that, and we should have protected the girls from something like this. On our ride back home from the center that day, my niece had a brilliant idea. What if we collectivized the writing so that the girls didn't have individual journals at all, but all wrote together in one kind of enormous journal? 
Individual sheets of paper were fine, but we also wanted to be able to collect the work for the girls to see and have and read. We didn't want to produce material that was immediately going to be discarded, sheets of paper that would end up in the trash the day later. We'd made a fanzine. We'd make a fanzine. What's more, each girl would also choose a pen name and would use it if and when they wanted. So we arrived at next week's session full of new enthusiasm. My niece led the session, explained what a fanzine was and how we would be writing collectively. She told them she would use the pen name Masorca, which means corn cob, but also a group of friends. And now everyone would choose their own name, following the only rule that the name be either an animal, a plant, or something existing in nature. The girls thought about it, brainstormed, and wrote down a name for themselves. Then we went round, uttering new names out loud. Huracán, Cascada, Mar, Conejita, Sol, Flor, Terremoto, Luna, Mariposa, Rosa, Estrella, Abejita, Arcoiris, Oscuridad. From that moment on, something changed profoundly in the way we worked together. It was the collective spirit of the fanzine making, sure, but it was something else. And I think that something was the almost magical cloak of visibility, invisibility, afforded by the new names. Suddenly, they were not themselves, but both a character and an author. Conejita, Bunny, wrote things very much akin to the gentle, discreet spirit of a rabbit. Oscuridad, darkness, was full of potent lyricism and wrote of chains and broken wings and feeling locked. Terremoto, earthquake, wrote about intelligence. She ended a beautiful paragraph about the importance of cultivating intelligence with the dictum, no vas a tener miedo, you will not be afraid. The things they wrote in the fanzine were not directly about why or how they had left their homelands, but in a deeper sense, they were. They wrote about the importance of friendship, about sorority and solidarity amongst women, the dangers of hatred and greed, their grave concerns about the environment and how mining companies, mostly from the US and Canada, are destroying their communities. During one session, they wrote feminist manifestos against sexual abuse and defending the sovereignty of their own bodies. Several of them, deeply religious, wrote about their spiritual sentiments and their connection to their God. Others, less so, preferred to write about the importance of making good decisions and remaining centered and courageous in the face of uncertainty. They were very proud, I think, of the fanzine they produced over the months. And in the very end, they wrote a kind of prologue or introduction for it. <clears throat> They decided, in a subtle but at the same time potent turn that I did not expect, to address the prologue and therefore dedicate the entire fanzine to future girls in their same situation. Primeramente, un saludo a ti, compañera, que estás leyendo esto. Nosotras somos chicas que conformamos un grupo creativo. Nosotras creamos esta publicación acerca de nuestros sueños, ideas, pensamientos. Este fanzine lo trabajamos todas las niñas que pasamos por la casa Brooks. Nosotras creemos que es importante ser solidarias, apoyarnos unas a otras. Siéntete orgullosa porque has venido tras tus sueños. Amate y valórate a ti misma. First and foremostly, a salute to you, sister, who are reading this. We are girls who formed a creative group. We created this publication about our dreams, our thoughts, our ideas. This fanzine was created by all of us who passed through the Brooks house. We believe it is important to have solidarity with each other, support one another. Feel proud about yourself because you have come after your dreams. Love and value yourself. The girls had understood in a few months what it has taken me a lifetime devoted to writing to understand, which is that one writes for a community and in order to form a community. Nobody knows their readers, who they will eventually be. But when we write, we somehow know there is someone out there whose mind and ours will meet one day and find a sense of communion, of companionship, of real understanding. This is the most beautiful thing about writing, 
how it can travel in space and reach another mind. Poor Tesla guy invent investing billions in science fiction when we have already invented transmigration and time travel. The USA is the country with the largest immigration detention infrastructure in the world, detaining almost half a million migrants each year and maintaining a daily bed quota of 35,000 people. The detention center system will continue to expand until private prisons are fully outlawed. The Biden administration made some small steps in that direction when they ruled out when they ruled that the government's Department of Justice would no longer sign contracts with private prison companies. Unfortunately, the new law does not apply to detention centers because they fall under the jurisdiction of the Department of Homeland Security. When a young person arrives undocumented and alone to the United States and is thrown into the Department of Homeland Security's immigration labyrinth, the narrative of their lives becomes reduced to a few generic statements to a one-way street of identity. You are undocumented. You are a refugee. You are unaccompanied. You are a minor. You are a migrant. You are illegal. Names of things and things themselves begin to disappear. The name of the river that rolled down the mountainside and across your town disappears. No one cares what it was called. The name of the boy next door and the name of the woman who sold candy in the corner shop are gone. The, di the dinner table is slowly erased and so is the back of your grandmother flipping tortillas, humming or muttering or almost always scolding. Gone are the affections, gone the small things that gave you a name. Nobody knows your favorite kind of shoes, your favorite story, the type of pen you prefer, the boy you liked. The process of migrating is often the process of undocumenting. An undocumented person is someone who has been violently stripped off a language, a narrative, a story, unless they defend that story, and most people will. In the last session I gave, I asked the girls for five sentences, starting with a veces. I don't remember any of the sentences with exactness. They were something like, a veces extraño a mi papá y a mi mamá, a veces no quiero hablar, a veces recuerdo a mi pueblo. But there was one that I've never, ever forgotten. It was written by Terremoto, earthquake, in small, neat writing. She read it out loud, soft-spoken but resolute. A veces estoy triste, y a través de triste estoy feliz. Sometimes I am sad, and across sad, I am happy. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks so much for your, for your talk. In, in a previous panel, we talked a bit about... I'm holding it. <laughs> That's why I sit in the front row, so that I can hear <laughs> whether I use it or not. But <clears throat> is it off? No, it's on, right? I think, I think it is on. I just literally was holding it away from my <laughs> face. Um, but in a previous panel, there was some discussion about refugee and asylum and the genre of narrative that is required to fit into mm -hmm. the established legal categories. Yeah. And I just wondered if doing these workshops made you think about that mm. um, and its many contrasts to the, you know, the many other forms of narrative that you were exploring. Yeah. Um, well, the short answer is yes. <laughs> it really did, but not only the workshop, but um, previous to the workshop I had uh, worked for uh, a long time in um, translating uh, cases, translating testimonies so that they could be 
become a case that a pro bono lawyer took and then um, hopefully won. And those were cases, uh, testimonies of children who were in deportation proceedings. And the, um, the categories for eligibility there are, are as, as narrow as uh, asylum um, criteria. The, the most kids um, ask either for asylum or something called a SIG uh, protection, uh, special immigrant juvenile status. And, um, and of course, what both, what both uh, paths of immigration relief uh, force is a, is a kind of um, a one, one way or one lane highway of, of a story. Uh, you can, you comply uh, or not, right? And so yes, stories have to of course fit into those very narrow categories. And the idea of writing is always the, to do the opposite, right? To, to kind of, um, n uh, to nuance, to multiply, to, to, to create multiplicity and, and, and layered stories of selfhood, of life. Mm. Yeah. I have a question. I, I'm very, if, if I understood correctly the story of my teeth, is exactly the culmination of a workshop you organized with Humex workers. And so I wonder if your experiences uh, with the hum Humex workers mm -hmm. informed the, your ideas at the planning process that you just described for the mm -hmm. detention center, considering that both workers, um, uh, this factor, well, I imagine that those were factory workers in the story of my teeth. Yeah. And so my question is, what are the uh, similarities and differences that you found in the planning process of those two mm -hmm. in the creative process that you uh, were able to get from the Humex workers that mm -hmm. culminated in the story of my teeth? To what extent you think, like maybe a few years from now, you will be able to replicate the story or, mm -hmm. or use what you learn from the detention center, something similar like that, that it will be very much needed for the current times as we are now, like getting into that type of creative process. And also, um, I was very surprised by your choice of Del Quixote, because maybe you also s suspected that there were gonna be some literacy challenges. So if you were to like eliminate that blind spot, what other story or like literary artifact would you have chosen mm -hmm. for that particular audience in, in upstate New York? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, after the Quixote failure, uh, I we didn't we didn't bring back any particular uh, book to to follow us. And I was I was hopeful with a Quixote because uh, I had volunteered a few times with a really interesting um, uh, group in uh, in New York in uh, run uh, kind of like a one room schoolhouse that that was run by a guy called Stephen. Um, I'm blanking, but uh, he he had a a group of students from like from five years old to like seventeen. So it was like a really, 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 really uh, wide range age range, and he managed to teach them Paradise Lost, like, like including the kids. He taught them Latin and musical notation, and then. I met them when they were in the process of translating the Quixote from English, no, from Spanish into, um, into English, but in a musical theater version. And not only that, they had, they had swapped the Quixote guy for, like, so he was no longer uh, a man from La Mancha, but a group of immigrant children. So it was like a, col a collectivization of the, the identity of the Quixote. And they were wild. It was these incredibly delirious, I mean, if the Quixote is already delirious, this play was so much more and wonderful. And they would, um, they would uh, showcase their, their advances uh, in people's houses and in small venues. And so they, they came to my house twice in two consecutive years. So I was hopeful that we would establish a connection with them I, didn't tell, I don't tell this in the piece, um, 
but there was another fail in the in my process of trying to understand how to teach in this place um, that was um, if we basically I, I wanted to establish a bridge between those kids that were doing the Quixote uh, and the girls in the detention center so we brought in letters the kids wrote letters and we brought them in for the girls to read and the girls were really ex excited to 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 have correspondence as always I mean as, as, as we all used to be before email, right? Um, and however, they then uh, scolded us and said that we were not allowed to bring letters in, which is insane. Uh, that's again, you know, what I was uh, right, right about in the piece. You know, not um, e there's even more restrictions than in in normal prisons, which is something quite difficult to understand. You know, like. Uh, even all the good things in term, you know, that, that people have been able to do in prison work, like bring literacy programs and, uh, and correspondences, uh, that all of that is like just n not viable in a detention center or difficult, very difficult to do. So yeah, I think I gave you a kind of long answer. And then the who makes factory thing, um, yeah, she's referring to a kind of delirious book that I, uh, <laughs> I read, I read, I wrote, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, some years ago in which um, I didn't know really I was writing a book, but I was uh, very interested in um, understanding the connection between a factory and a gallery owned by that factory. And the factory is the juice monopoly in Mexico, Jugos Mexicanos, Jumex. And... Um, the, the gallery is owned by Humex, and I just thought that it was weird, and the gallery is uh, contemporary art, and um, so I wanted to ask the, the, the workers how they felt about the fact that their work ultimately bought the, these pieces of like desiccated dogs, and I don't know, pictures of, uh, I don't know, contemporary art. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so we established this mechanism by which I would write an installment each week kind of about the art that was in display, but also about other stuff. And they would read those installments out loud, and then they would uh, respond to them. They would criticize them heavily, often. It was like a brutal workshop. Um, but I wasn't physically present. I was, in, I was here in the US. And so they would, um, they would record all their sessions, and then I would get the MP3 file, audio file, and listen to them. And then I would write the next installment. So it was like a nine, it was like a 19th century serial novel process, except with MP3 uh, in the middle. <laughs> and so what resulted was this book called "The Story of My Teeth," uh, about an, an auctioneer that auctions teeth, uh, among other things. Um, but the process of listening and sort of that back and forth, indeed, I think, has informed my work thereafter. Um, mm, I don't know, in a very obvious sense, just, in, as just made me a, a, a better listener maybe, but also like the process by which I write from then on is very linked to sound recording, to sound, in fact, right now I'm working on a, a sound piece, a big sound piece, 24 hour sound piece, and you won't have to listen to, <laughs> you can listen to a little part of it, but it's, so yeah, I've been working with sound ever since actually. Hi, my name is Melanie, so actually, yeah, uh, my name is Melanie, so actually before coming here, I was living in New York City, and at my university in New York City, during one of my immigration literature classes, we read um, Tell Me How It Ends, mm. and so we analyzed that, like, the whole semester, we cried, like, all the time, <laughs> and so between having read that and now hearing this piece of work that you've done, I wanted to ask... Obviously, the experiences that undocumented migrants face in these detention centers are just complete direct examples of oppression, but what role do you think that these literal children, that their youth and them being minors sort of played in their experiences? Mm. So basically, I guess what I'm trying to ask is what role did them being children play 
that makes their experiences a little bit different from the adults and from what you've seen in translating their testimony and doing workshops like these? Damn, it's a really hard question. I don't know what to answer. I think I might need to, as they say in panels, get back to you on that one. Like when I write a book <laughs> about it maybe in five years, I don't know. Uh, it's a really, really good question. Um, I haven't worked with, with adults uh, directly so much. I, I tried to write about um, uh, obstetric violence against women in detention. And when I say try to write, it's more like I try to research, but it's a um, dead end street in terms of transparency of information. Um, there's just no way to understand what's going on inside a detention center in, in that sense, unless you, know, unless you speak to people that, that left, right? And, um, and that want to talk about it. But I'm often not interested in, um, in testimonies and reproducing testimonies and then just reproducing violence on the page, but rather in understanding the mechanisms behind, like the systemic uh, mechanisms that allow for that violence to take place in the first place. Um, so, but that's very difficult because, for example, you know, there's medical contractors that work in detention centers. Um, and if you go to the pages in detention centers, you, you, you'll see them listed, but then you call the companies. I've called numerous companies to, to ask very basic questions, like how they get contracts, how they choose doctors, who the doctors are, where are they, how, like, just how, just how does it work? You know, not, not, not even incriminating questions, just really how does the system work? And there's just, no one will answer. People will just um, hang up the phone. And so with detention centers for adults, my impression is that uh, find, like, finding a way into clear information is, is impossible. I'm not impossible. I mean, it has to be done. And I think if enough people are chipping away, eventually we will erode <laughs> enough that more will be known and then more can be done in terms of uh, contesting and pushing and asking for legislation changes. So I do think it's important to do it and to try, right? Um, and with children, the, the centers are, are not these pri uh, privately contracted centers. So there's supposedly less, um, less, uh, yeah, less carceral. The place where I ended up teaching was very low security. Otherwise, it wouldn't have let, let me in. Uh, but, but I know that there's a, there's a spectrum as well within the, within the system for children. Uh, and that is something that's very serious too. So anyway, as you can see, I'm not sure, I'm not sure or I don't know is my answer, but I think that you should devote many of years of your life to thinking about it. <laughs> Hi, Valeria. Oh, I'm right here, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for, for sharing that essay with us. I, I think I'm still thinking with or haunted by your prompt of a veces. And mm -hmm. it strikes me as something that um, you do a lot in your writing, which is embrace the fragment. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about that prompt and the fragment as a way of writing. Um, mm -hmm. To me, it seems like a way of interrupting the kind of authoritative um, language of the state, of like the, the complete or the fixed. And yeah, I'm just wondering if you can speak more about the fragment, the avesis, and like how that mode of writing is a way of interruption. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to st st starting to try to think about that uh, in this essay, you know, that, well, as I was writing this. Uh, um, and I think the direction of my thought is taking me toward just thinking that, that um, m more than the fragment, the, the kind of uh, temporal spirit of something like Aveses as opposed to suddenly, as opposed to de pronto or siempre, is, is one that, that kind of uh, allows a parenthetical moment, right? And a veces is something that doesn't happen always, right? So it allows us like a moment outside time uh, 
that is a, like an underscoring of a moment outside time, uh, outside the normal cor course of time. So, I mean, in the space, in the carceral space, or in the repetitive space of, of uh, being behind closed uh, doors, closed walls, uh, I thought that an aveses could be a space for for the moments in which the mind is outside outside of that, no? the moments that are um, outside doing time, outside time. Um, but I think that that extends to to other to other spaces that are not not necessarily carceral spaces, right? That that it's a, a mode. It's not that the writing has to begin with avesis, but it's more like the spirit in with which it is written, right? That what do we pay attention to? Thank you so much. That was I felt um, energized um, by your writing. Um, I was just curious about your writing process, and as you mentioned, that this was a non-fiction essay and that you typically do creative writing. So I was wondering if the pro what the process was like. Mm. You know, is the process similar? It sounds like you work a lot like a researcher, like an ethnographer. Mm. And I was wondering if that process is the same when you're doing creative writing versus, I mean, they're both creative, but you know what I mean? Not these two different, I guess, mm. genres. Yeah, I mean, I first of all think that all writing is creative. Um, it takes... No, I mean, maybe the result is not creative, but <laughs> not in the way we think of creative. But but the process is is um, is always deeply creative. I think um, <clears throat> some people enjoy that creative process, and some don't, and that shows also in the result. Um, and I don't think that there is a single. I don't. I don't experience a single uh, form of process. Um, and and every time I've written a new book, the process seems to to change, and that's why it takes me so lo long sometimes to uh, like I've been writing a novel for four years, and only last month was I able to understand like what the architecture is. Um, it was until last month, like an accumulation of notes that were dated, like. July 19th, 2019, until a month ago, just like that. And then one day, like, uh, there's a, a, a kind of a, a notion of architecture. But um, each, I think that each project for me has demanded a, a process that's unique to it, you know? And so I, it, takes me, it takes me some time to get there because the project needs to, have, to be mature enough to start showing me the way in terms of how to really do it if it requires interviewing or archival research or just introspection or, or whatever it is. And as I, as I was saying at the beginning of this talk, I, I, um, that creative writing workshop in, this, in the detention center in New York um, was something I did in 2019. I'd never sat down in these years to, to try to write about it, partly because I knew that I was going to go back to a dark, dark, difficult place. <laughs> And I didn't want to. Um, I just really didn't want to. And then also because there were a lot of res restrictions about what we were allowed to say, not allowed to say, and I wasn't comfortable with saying then anything. The only way we circulated work, uh, that's also a story I don't tell in, in this, this version of the essay, but because we weren't allowed to publish any of, or like make public any of the work that the girls produced, the, of the writing that they produced, uh, we thought, well, but if we don't have um, physical evidence that there is, so we don't publish, if we don't publish it in a physical space, then who's going to say anything to us? So one thing we did then was to um, memorize lines, or some, I don't remember if my niece might have taken a few pictures, but we gave those lines to a singer-songwriter, um, that we worked with, um, she's from California, and we were putting together a performance with a, a very dear friend of mine, a poet, Natalie Diaz, and we were going to do a performance in, in Nevada. And so the work that the girls had done circulated in the form of music in that performance. But then, of course, that those songs we took back to the detention center, and then they heard them. Uh, so it was a really nice way to circulate something that didn't involve a material evidence of anything, so we were, we were fine. 
Um, yeah, and I, 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 yeah, who knows, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I was really, I'm really kind of fascinated by the intense ambivalence um, within the detention center and within the state too, right? Of thinking it would be nice to bring creative writing, right, to these young people, but then being so intensely paranoid about what it means to unleash that, to give voice to the, to allow these children to have a kind of voice in writing right, um, so that you're not allowed to take anything out, you're not allowed to build the archive mm. of, of, in public of what it is they're writing about and saying and thinking and what their what they're sometimes are. Mm. And I, I often think of that in fiction as the, the sort of space of the suppositional, right, suppose this, and it has a, a, um, mm -hmm. a flexible temporality, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I was wondering if you could reflect more on your own practice and the, the, the space that writing occupies, right? Because on the one hand, there's this, you know, a utopian notion, not even utopian, that's a bad word to use, right? But there's this notion that, that you know, the aesthetic and writing is, is something that we need to um, encourage in young people, the writing, the thinking, the creativity, and then the fear, right, in terms of control on what can be unleashed when we give children pen and paper and a voice. So I'm wondering if you could talk about how you, I, the role yeah. you see yourself playing in relationship to all that. No, I mean, I think that, it, that, that writing in the long run for a generation of the, the diaspora is, is uh, the only thing that might bring some kind of historical clarity uh, later. And I do think that there will be many people in that generation that will end up being stand-up comedians and, I don't know, write, write, I don't know, Netflix series or poems or experimental, whatever. There will be. I mean, it's a big generation. Um, there will be people that will talk about it, as, as has been the case historically with, with waves of uh, uh, exodus and diasporas. Uh, what is, I think, tricky and uh, is uh, it's just very, very troubling is that the idea that anything that, that someone may write in, while in detention, when their trial is pending, may constitute a, f a form of um, evidence against them, even if it were fiction. That, that, that always troubled me enormously, right? So how, I mean, the only way we found around that was uh, pen names and collective writing, and I think it was a, it was a we, we solved to a degree that problem, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's best case scenario, a short hiatus in their lives. One that shouldn't have existed at all, that they should not have ever experienced. But in best case scenario, it, 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 it is a passage through something. You know? and like writing will continue, it, it, it was before and after especially. Uh, hi. Um, is it possible to situate your project within um, like a history of carceral literature? I, I'm assuming the concept exists. There is enormous, an enormous history, yeah, of carceral literature. Uh, but, um, but what do you mean? Well, I mean, I was thinking like, you know, a Gulang archipelago or, um, or the way Havel has to sort of invent a, a different way of writing because, mm -hmm. you know, he can't sort of come out and... and Criticize communism. Yeah, yeah. You made me think of this wonderful story that's not very well known uh, about um, a prison in Somalia, where um, prison a prisoner um, had with him uh, Anna Karina, Anna Karina, and were was in in a solitary cell next to another prisoner in a solitary cell, and they together over time, long stretches of time, developed first a, a, la like a, a language a communication through, through knocks on their wall, but eventually because they had created an alphabet or had tra translated the alphabet to knocks, uh, then they were able, one was able to read to the other and, uh, and read Anna Karenina once and again and again and again. And the, 
the one that was read to got out eventually and and told the story and and said that that really was uh, what saved him not only psychically in the time there but what was a what gave him moral instruments to to leave and 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 reconst reconstitute himself once once he had left no? I mean there's there's a so many wonderful prison stories or related to to literature and the role that literature has played or or writing that takes place in 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 prisons right I'm trying to think of um there's also Daniel Carms the the Russian writer that writes these very very short pieces called incidences if you haven't read him I really really uh, recommend him um he was he he was not allowed. He was banned from writing for for adults for a while and then imprisoned. And he was only allowed to write for children. It's a great strange punishment, right? And then uh, eventually he was not allowed to write at all. Yeah. Another hard question. <laughs> These young people. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I I do think that maybe like um, uh, a lot of us need to go back constantly to to childhood to 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 rearticulate you know, to understand. Um, and I think you know the the gaze of a child is uh, a very foreign gaze uh, in the best possible sense. Um, not 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 foreign as in tourist of a place, but but foreign as in as in far away enough uh, that it has a kind of curiosity uh, that it doesn't assume too much. Um, close enough, um, perhaps driven by that same curiosity. So that f foreignness of the gaze in in childhood is what has always really interested me as as the sp the, the distance from which to to write. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>